Welcome to the Full Story series, where we take some of our older videos and we compile them together to give you almost a cinematic experience. All of the ideas and stuff that we've put into a ton of videos, and today we're going to be covering the Ultimate Spider-Man line, going from his original origins all the way to the death of the Ultimate Spider-Man. I hope you guys enjoy. There is an alternate universe, one that was quite popular at its deception, but it eventually waned from the favor of its readers. This is the ultimate universe. Many things are familiar here, while many things are also very contrasting. While there are many things that people liked about this world, in the end, it was destroyed in the Secret Wars, and some of the best parts were then merged with the original Marvel Universe. But that is at the end of the story, and I'm jumping ahead of myself, because I'm here to tell you the magnificent tale of Spider-Man, and we need to go back to the beginning, in a lab. You see, in this universe, the tale is a bit different at the start. Osborne Industries, the company that belonged to Norman Osborne, was conducting experiments, which led to experimenting on a spider, which was accidentally let free from its container. And this brings us to our young 15-year-old Peter Parker, a bookworm with his mind on other things, like his studies and girls, such as Mary Jane. But while his life as a punching bag always took a toll on him, there was someone who gave him hope and helped him through it, his Uncle Ben. You see, his parents both died when he was young, and they left him in the care of his Aunt May and Uncle Ben. And Ben, well, he looked after the boy like any father would. Peter was also close friends with the wealthiest kid at school, Harry Osborne, son of Norman Osborne. So, that night after dinner, Harry came by the Parker pad as he called it to learn about biology. And that's when Peter explained that his parents were supposedly killed in a plane crash, and that on the board in front of both of the boys was a formula that his father came up with before he died. The next day, the whole school went on a field trip to Osborne Industries, where the fateful act happened. The weird spider from the start of our tale crawled out and bit Peter Parker on the hand. And with that, he hit the ground right away starting to feel weird. Now this part of the story remains much of the same. A young boy begins to slowly discover that he has powers, everything from strength, speed, and agility. And while this is going on, Norman Osborn had Peter followed. He knew of the spider that bit Peter, and he wanted to know what was happening. Was the boy going to live, or was he going to die? As things progressed, both Peter and Osborn began to see the growth of his abilities. But the problem is that with the growth of Peter's abilities, also grew his ego and eventually he grew cocky. You see, as one of the kids picked on him, he retaliated and he actually injured one of those kids. The parents demanded that Uncle Ben and Aunt May pay the $2,500 hospital bill for their child, which drove Peter further into his own head. He had these abilities now. Why shouldn't he use them? And why can't he make money from them? He decided to enroll in wrestling matches to win a little money, but of course he had to wear a mask, as they wouldn't let a 15-year-old kid enroll in these things. The story of Peter Parker kept progressing as he excelled at sports and continued to win these matches until eventually he made an actual Spider-Man suit. But back at Osborne Industries, Norman decided that if this kid can gain powers from his formula, why couldn't he? So he has an individual known as Dr. Octavius run various tests on Peter's blood, and they figured out the perfect formula that made Peter into a super-powered individual. Except when they tried to test it on Norman Osborn, Dr. Octavius changed something in the formula. Something that he wanted to do, something that he wanted to alter. And it went wrong, and the entire lab was destroyed, and Norman Osborn went missing. Back with Peter, he continued to win at each and every match as Spider-Man. And as it was all working out, Peter was walking home one night when a thug ran up on him after robbing a deli. That was it. The moment that Peter could alter his entire history. This universe could go a completely different path. So what did the Peter Parker of the Ultimate Universe do? He let the robber go. It's not his problem, he told the deli owner. After that, Uncle Ben and Aunt May confronted him at the door to ask about his grades and ask why he was slipping. An argument ensued and Peter ran off into the night. He ended up at a party with girls coming on to him and Mary Jane upset that she saw it. She did have feelings for Peter, though she didn't really know how to tell him and seeing him with that other girl, well, she left the party. Peter chased after her, but as he got to the door, Uncle Ben was standing there because his 15-year-old nephew was now at a party and he was there to bring him home. He took him outside to ask him why he was doing this. He's such a smart kid. Why waste away his potential on things like these parties. He told Peter various things about his father, things such as responsibility and what this means. He told Peter that his father believed that he was destined for great things, and with all of the great things that he was destined for, great responsibility would come. But that angered Peter more as he wanted to know if his father knew so much, why did he leave? And he ran off into the night, a confused kid. And by the time he got home, it was too late. You see, Uncle Ben and Aunt May, they were playing cards, when they heard a noise in the back of the house. Ben decided that he would go see what it was, and when he got there, he found a man with a gun pointed at him. The robber demanded money, and Ben laughed, telling him that the robber had more money than any of them. That was it. A gunshot, and Uncle Ben was gone. But Peter wasn't about to lie around while the police failed to find the murderer. 
and he ran out of the house changing into his costume. Many of you know where this story goes next, but Peter tracked the murderer down into a warehouse and the police cornered him. He crawled in and after pinning the man down, he realized that it was the same man, the one that he failed to stop after the Delhi robbery. If he had stood up and done the right thing at that moment, this never would have happened. So he strung the robber up, refusing to kill him. Peter thought back to the full conversation that Uncle Ben had with him about his father, and he remembered the words exactly. Great things are going to happen in your life, Peter. Great things. And with that, will come great responsibility. He looked at his mask with tears in his eyes, telling himself, I do now. He went off to become the hero that he was meant to be, saving kids from a burning building, beating up robbers and thugs, and stopping the crime of the city. And when he got home, he saw Mary Jane. She saw him and told him that Aunt May was staying at her house with her parents. He tried to talk to her, but he broke down crying. And she held him while he cried it out. But how was the rest of the city taking this turn of events? Well, J. Jonah Jameson wasn't exactly taking it lightly, because he saw a guy running around in his underwear and assumed that he had to be a menace. So he wants as much information as he can get on this Spider-Man. While this is happening, Spider-Man is off inventing some new technology to go with this whole Spider-Man image. Basically, he created some web shooters using his father's formula for a molecular adhesive. It's strong, it's sticky, and he can shoot it out of his wrist thanks to some web shooters. The next day at school, Harry finally returned to school after losing his father in a freak lab accident, and as Peter is checking in on him, his new spider sense begins to go off. And following that, there's a loud BOOM! Fire and smoke begin to spew out of the school as Peter runs through the hallways trying to figure out what's going on. And it's Harry who seems to know as he's shouting, HELP ME! HE'S HERE! Using that as his entrance, Spider-Man arrives and he bolts into the building to see what exactly is happening. And with the sprinklers above raining on his head, Spider-Man calls out to whoever did this, and a very large man in a torn cloak stands in front of him. As a hall monitor, I'm going to have to ask you for your hall pass. And the man's eyes glow. He begins to hurl fireballs at Spider-Man. He bounces off of the walls, alerting our villain to the fact that this is a fire hazard, and he throws the mysterious villain into the lockers. The villain gets up and begins to swing, continuing his silence as Spider-Man continues his jokes, until eventually the villain slams Spider-Man into a wall, launching him out of the school. He continues to squeeze Spider-Man, keeping him from breathing, and then he lands in a park and he jumps again! As they're leaping through the air, his cloak begins to come off and Spider-Man sees a big green goblin face, which growls the word, Parker. Spider-Man looks at him, who are you? And instead of responding, he throws Spider-Man down into the streets below. He begins to panic. How could I survive this? Is this the end already? Until it dawns on him. His webbing! He thwips it towards one building and then another building, begging for this to work. And then like a giant trampoline, it propels him back into the sky. He cheers out, excited that it actually worked. And then he thinks to himself, I wonder if my other idea will work. And he thwips onto a nearby building, swinging into action and landing square into the goblin's back. As he gets a couple of shots in, the goblin reaches up, grabbing his head, and he throws him back into the ground. He throws out two more thwips, but the goblin dodges, and it attaches to the nearby helicopter. While they both stand there staring at each other, another problem has presented itself, as the goblin now sees the looky-loos, who have joined the fight, and he begins to sprint off towards them. Spider-Man tries to attach his webbing to the goblin, but he has too much sheer strength, and he pulls Spider-Man right off of the wall. He then throws his cloak into the air, with Spider-Man still attached, and he leaps up to the level of the helicopters. His hands begin to burn brightly as he prepares to throw more fireballs at them. And as Spider-Man gets between the goblin and the helicopters, he shouts, STAND DOWN! I WON'T LET YOU HURT THESE PEOPLE! But that's the moment that the officers in the helicopter take their shots, peppering the goblin's chest with bullets. Spider-Man calls out to them to stop shooting as the goblin holds his chest all bloodied, and he looks at Spider-Man. Parker! He shouts as he leaps at him, but Spider-Man jumps over his head, dodging him, allowing the goblin to fall into the bay, where he falls deeper and deeper into the water. He turns to the police, telling them that they have to save the guy if they can, but instead, the police open fire on Spider-Man. He dodges and he rolls out of the way, getting out of sight, before changing back into Peter and going back to the school. He stumbles out of the school, claiming that he was under a chalkboard, and Mary Jane rushes over, giving him a huge hug. Harry decides to tell everyone who that was at that very moment, and he informs the group that it was his father. Norman Osborn did not die in the lab. He changed into that thing, and now he's after Harry to kill him. As the police bring Harry in for questioning, Peter can't help but wonder what's to come next. Our story begins as a man stands over a group of security guards telling them that he's pretty sure he didn't get paid enough to take another hit. So they should probably just give him the money. Panicking, one of the guards tells him, just take the money, take whatever you want. And our mysterious man tells him, no. 
I want you to crawl and bring it to me. And then a voice tells him, you're so... Peter swings by punching the man, asking, who are you supposed to be? The vibrator? The man lifts his arms up to try and shock Peter, but as he does, Peter whips out his web onto the man's device and he ends up shocking him. The security guards get up and Peter asks if they're okay. They might want to call the... But one of the guards stops him, assuming he's also a criminal. Just take the money! Confused, Peter tells them, what? No, just... Call the cops, will you? The next day at school, Peter overhears some of the students talking about Spider-Man showing up in Brooklyn. One of them mentions that the paper was offering money for pictures of Spider-Man, which gives Peter an idea. So after school, he heads home and sets his camera up to begin taking photos. And as he does, he asks himself if he's really doing this. He really needs money, but this is a bit much. The next day, J. Jonah Jameson is shouting to everyone that he doesn't care what they want, he wants pictures of Spider-Man. And that's when he meets Peter Parker, holding out a picture of Spider-Man. Everyone stops to look and Jonah takes the stack, asking, Where in good God's green earth did you get these? Peter tells him, I called in a little while ago about them. I got them when Spider-Man came to my school. Jonah looks at them and asks, Did you take these pictures? And Peter tells him, yeah. So he starts sifting through all the photos, telling him, Each one of these is crap, crap, crap. And from the bunch, there is one that he pulls out. Jonah eyeballs Peter up and down and he says, Old are you? I'm 16, sort of. And Jonah tells him, fine, I'll give you 50 for it. But before Peter can ask anything, Betty Brant begins to scream at her computer, shouting that she will light this whole place on fire. Jonah asks her what's wrong, and Betty tells him that she's an associate book editor, not a web designer, and she can't get this thing to work. It constantly freezes. Peter looks down at the screen and tells them that he sees the problem, and with a few clicks, he clears out the script error. Jonah begins signing over the payment of the pictures and asks Peter again, How old are you? You go to school or something? You need a job? After accepting the job, Peter heads home for the night, and as he sleeps, he begins to have the same nightmare that's been haunting him ever since Uncle Ben's death. He wakes up screaming that he couldn't stop it. He just couldn't stop it. So the next day, he decides he's going to go look up information on that robber. And as he enters in the information, two links pop up, one with an image. The image shows the man with other thugs. And through a link of all of the thugs, Peter realizes that the man at the top of the list is Wilson Fisk, the kingpin. After work, Peter spies on the three thugs that he saw in the photo with Uncle Ben's killer. As the men head into their hideout, Peter kicks the men in Inside, telling everyone that he's here to sign up for the wet t-shirt contest. Dan goes to grab his gun, but Peter whips his webs out, knocking the gun out of his hand. The bigger man, Ox, steps up, and Peter punches him with all he's got, and quickly realizes punching Ox may not have been the best idea. He swings, knocking Peter into Dan, and then Montana cracks her whip, wrapping it around Peter's neck. She tells everyone that this is just a fed trick. They need to throw this kid out and bolt the doors. Ox tells him that he's just being paranoid, but as Ox tries to swing again, Peter jumps up onto the wall. As he lands, he pulls on Montana's whip and he throws him into Ox. He then webs up the two of them and throws Dan into the group. Peter looks at them and tells them, I know you guys work for the Kingpin. I would like to know where he's at. So they go ahead and spill the beans and they tell him that Kingpin is holding a fundraiser at his office on Friday. A real MVP VIP sort of thing. Real legit. Peter then realizes that they're kind of spilling the beans on a lot of information and asks, why are you telling me all of this? The man says he works for Kingpin. Doesn't mean he has to like him. Seconds later, the front door is kicked in by two FBI agents bursting and telling everyone to freeze. The woman stops for a moment and then says, it's him! It's Spider-Man! Peter tells him that it's really not what it looks like and the agents tell him to put his hands in the air. Thinking quickly, he tells him, look at the time! I've really got to get going and he jumps over the agents and swings away. The next day, Peter stops by the newsstand to read the headline. Spider-Man. Mob menace. Later that night, as Peter heads over to the big VIP MVP thing that Kingpin's doing, he gets to the tower and he watches as Kingpin gives his speech. Peter tells himself that he's going to find a way to expose Kingpin. All of the drugs, thievery, and murder. All he does is write a check and suddenly he's a good guy? Ironic really. People think that Kingpin is a good guy and Spider-Man is the bad guy. As Peter climbs up through the window, he begins to search through Kingpin's office and then he suddenly notices a lens in the distance. Peter tells him that he's starting to get a funny feeling when things start to feel like they're about to go wrong again, almost like a spider sense kind of thing. And suddenly Kingpin appears reaching out, grabbing him. He asks if there's anything that he can do for him and Peter spins around punching him, realizing that he's got to stop punching giant guys. Kingpin grabs a hold of his arm, asking who sent him and through the pain of having his arm crotched, Peter tells him, ah, oh, Carson daily. He kicks himself away and Kingpin tells Electro to take care of this. He needs to get back down to his guests. Out of the group of men behind Peter, one man's eyes begin to glow and electricity begins to spark around him. Electro fires the bolt of electricity, zapping away at Peter. Kingpin tells Electro that this is his office, you know. 
and after a few more blasts, Electro finally hits him. He tells him that he's sorry about the room, but this really isn't an exact science or anything. And Kingpin tells him to just take off the mask. One of the men pulls Peter's mask off to see that he's a kid. He then tells the men to call for Mr. Big. His presence is required. And Electro asks, what are we gonna do about the kid? Toss him out the same way that he came in. And also find this Carson Daly person and destroy him. As Peter's body is thrown out the window, he slowly begins to wake up and tries to catch himself along the building. But as he does, he grabs onto a window by the ballroom and everyone watches as he slides down and falls off. A little while later, Peter heads home telling himself that he messed up bad. He got electrocuted, had his web shooters crushed, and his mask ripped off and then thrown out a skyscraper. Maybe he shouldn't have gone down there. The next day at Kingpin's Tower, Kingpin shows Mr. Big Peter's mask, telling him, I had a visitor last night. Come into the office. He came into the office and started a fight, almost ruining my dinner party. Mr. Big laughs, stating, he sounds like that's Gavoots, Martha Stewart. The entire room goes silent and Mr. Big says, it started to sound like you have elevated yourself above all of us here, common thugs, Mr. Kingpin. Rumor has it that you can't even get your hands dirty anymore. And Kingpin decides to respond to that. Finally, Mr. Big takes a stand. And then he looks at Ox and Montana, telling them, it's time to pick a side. Ox and Montana grab a hold of Mr. Big's arms, telling him, you have to understand. Kingpin takes off Mr. Big's hat and then slides Peter's mask onto him and begins to wrap his hands around his head. Kingpin's hands begin to come together and his grip begins to get tighter. And Mr. Big begins to scream out in pain. Until finally, he stops screaming. The next morning, Peter watches the news as reports of the body of Mr. Big floating down the river wearing the mask of Peter are being aired. He tells himself being demasked isn't the worst thing to happen to a superhero. This right here is the worst thing that can happen to a superhero. The next day in class, the teacher begins to review what type of man Richard Nixon was when he was president and why he had everything recorded. The class begins to shout out answers and one of them says that he was paranoid, to which the teacher tells him that that is correct. The teacher goes on asking, why would a paranoid man record all of the questionable dialogue? And Peter remembers back to when he saw the security footage in Kingpin's office. And he says, because he thought he was untouchable. After class, Peter begins searching a line for security systems and finds the company name rather quickly, so he has an idea. And he emails the company stating that he's interested in getting security for his business. And he would like information on some of the systems that they use for their larger businesses. After heading home for that day, he checks his computer to find the security company emailed him back and told him the exact model that all of the large companies use, as well as a link to the technical pages for how they work. After watching everything that they've given him, he realizes that they record everything on DVDs, and he needs to get those DVDs. Because not only will they have a video of him being demasked, but it also will allow him to find out what the Kingpin has been doing. Later that night, Peter sets out and sneaks into Kingpin's tower. And once he gets inside, he sneaks up on the security guard who's monitoring the security system, knocking him out. Meanwhile, back upstairs, Kingpin talks with a lecture on his men regarding the fact that they need to find that Spider-Man kid. Downstairs, Peter is fighting off the second security guard, and the guard fires a few shots, hitting the building's electrical panels. Suddenly, the whole building loses power. Now, with everyone knowing that someone is here, Peter runs over to the security server and rips the door off of the hinges. He cycles through a few discs and takes the ones with the date of him being there and a few of the extra ones. He then packs up and gets a funny feeling and a bolt of electricity shoots by. He barely dodges the strike and then a whip lashes out wrapping around his neck. As Peter looks back, he sees Electro and Electro tells him, don't worry, this will only hurt a lot. Peter manages to break free from the whip and begins fighting everyone and dodging their attacks. Dan starts shooting, but Peter asks him, how many times do I have to tell you? No guns! And he webs up his hands again. Before jumping away, Ox grabs a hold of Peter's leg and begins slamming him back and forth into the computers. Peter lays on the ground. Ox grabs him by the neck and tells him, we should go on and bring you to the kingpin. But as everyone looks at Peter, he shouts, acting, ta-da! And he kicks Montana and Electro away. Electro fires the bolt, but Peter dodges out of the way of that one, and the bolt ends up hitting Ox. Montana, in response to that, cracks her whip as Electro is apologizing. And as the end of the whip is getting closer, Peter grabs it and pulls it to bring Montana to him and then kicks him back down. With Ox and Montana down, Electro begins firing away, trying to hit Peter. So he jumps down, grabbing him by the wrist, telling him, I'm kind of curious as to how you got your powers. Are you a mutant? And Electro responds with, are you? Peter tells him that he asks first. So Electro tells him he's not a mutant. But why would you care anyway? Peter responds with, I'm a huge science geek, so I'm kind of sort of into this stuff. I will say this. After they take care of you, we're going to be going after your friends and your family. They're all going to be fried. And Peter tells him, if that's the case, then you can't be mad about me doing this. He kicks a water pipe and throws Electro into the pouring water. The water electrocutes him, and soon he begins to fall over. Looking down at everyone, Peter hears Ox trying to wake up. So he jumps down on him and tells him that if he wants to do the right thing, march that incredibly stupid butt over to the comp and confess what they did. And then he begins to run towards the exit, thinking to himself, he did it. He really did it. How cool is he? But before he can open the door, Kingpin's voice tells him, there is no way that you're going to leave here alive. So 
Who are you working for? Peter stops and tells him, I had something prepared for the next time we ever met. So, okay, here it goes. You're so fat that when you cut yourself shaving, marshmallow fluff comes out. Kingpin stares at him, and Peter goes on. You're so fat that your high school yearbook photo was taken from a helicopter. Kingpin starts to grind his teeth. And Peter goes on to say another. But Kingpin begins yelling and charges in after him. Peter jumps, telling him, hold on, I got one more. And just as the Kingpin reaches him, he dodges the rest of his attacks. For such an evil, arrogant guy, you think you can just walk all over everyone. Kingpin begins to punch away again. And as he does, Peter webs his arms to the wall, telling him that he really didn't come here for a fight. So he shouts, you're a dead man. And then Peter webs his face. As everything goes dark, Kingpin rips himself from the wall and tears away at the webbing on his face to find nothing. The next day at the Daily Bugle, writer Ben Urich sits at his desk watching a video of the murder of Mr. Big. He then reads a note left to him that enclosed all sorts of goodies on Kingpin. He yes, not for the squeamish. Elsewhere, Kingpin begins to read the headline, American Kingpin of Crime Caught on Tape, Whereabouts Unknown. His lawyer tells him not to worry, he'll get him out of this. But really, someone was murdered and it was caught on tape. Kingpin looks at him and he walks away. During all of this, Peter Parker and Mary Jane have been having an interesting relationship. He wants to go out with her, she seems to like him, but she's also seeing a bunch of other people. It's kind of confusing, but it's typical high school drama. But the next day after all of those events, happen after school, Peter sits nervously with Mary Jane sitting on his bed and tells her, so yeah, there's something I wanted to tell you. She stares at him, telling him okay. And he tells her, really, you can't tell anyone, like ever. And she tells him okay. And Peter tells her, you gotta promise. So she says she promises. And after a few awkward moments of silence, he tells her, I'm Spider-Man. She looks at him and asks, what did you say? Like the superhero Spider-Man? He tells her yes, and she bursts out laughing, so much so that she falls off the bed. She tells him to shut up. He's being such a goofball right now. And he says that he knew that he would have to do this. And he begins jumping from wall to wall. She watches and stares and Peter asks if she's going to be okay and then she begins to scream. Peter tells her to be quiet. Aunt May is home so you got up but then May's voice shouts, what's going on up there? Better not be any hanky panky. After finally controlling herself, Mary Jane asks, how did it happen? And Peter explains that it happened when he went to Harry's dad's work and the spider bit him. That's when she realizes that the spider almost bit her and she could have been Spider-Man too. And then the next part of the conversation goes on to what is he going to do because he's Spider-Man and can she see the costume? Over at the medical facility, two doctors begin to review their newest patient. They begin to try and decide whose turn it is to clean out Dr. Octopus's bedpan. When the man slowly begins to wake up, Otto Octavius asks, why would you call me that? My name is Otto. And a metal arm begins to rise as he shouts asking, why did you call me that? Meanwhile, over at Midtown High, Peter and the rest of his classmates head over to the school pep rally. Kong mentions that he's starting to think that their new assignment of making a report on which superhero they would like to be seems pretty dumb. And everyone tells him that maybe it's him who's dumb. But Kong says that he's not so sure. All of these superheroes and mutants popping up. Maybe it's a sign. Maybe they should be watching out. Peter asks, what do you mean by watch out? And Kong says that he's not sure. He just feels like there's gonna be some real trouble real soon. A voice then tells them that it's a meteor, and everyone looks over to see a blonde girl standing along the wall. She says that it's kind of like when the meteor wiped out the dinosaurs, except for them, they know it's coming. She goes on telling everyone that things will be fine, because in a sense, they all have superpowers in their own way, even if they're not superpowered or mutants. Kong asks, who are you? And the girl tells him, Gwen. Gwen Stacy. And it's her first day here, back over at the medical facility. Otto Octavius begins to wake up and Hank Pym sits on his bed telling him that it's good that he's awake, but it's time that they talked. He explains that there was an accident in Osborne Industries that left him in a coma for the last three months. Otto says that he doesn't really remember what happened, and as he tries to process it, he begins to feel the metal arms. He asks what have they done to him, and Hank goes on stating that during that accident, he suffered damage to his face and neck areas, but more notably, it seems that he was fused with his own mechanical harness. Though they're not sure as to how, the arms are locked into his central nervous system and they react and function like normal arms. Otto Octavius leans up and shouts at them to take off his bandages. And as they slowly comes off, he sees the arms. Hank tells them that it could be a breakthrough with exciting possibilities. Perhaps they could work together. And Otto says that they found him like this. They could have taken this off of him, but they chose not to. Who do they think they are? Hank says that they can't say, but they are the United States government, and they can't really tell him where he is. The metal arms begin flailing, and one shoots through the chest of one of the other doctors. Otto then looks back over to Hank, demanding to know where he is. The next day at school, Kong comes to a conclusion that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Flash Thompson tells him that he's absolutely crazy, like completely crazy. But Kong says that it makes sense. That day in the field trip, Peter Parker got bitten by a spider, so he's Spider-Man. Just think about it, he broke a desk, he's super good at basketball now, that means that he's Spider-Man. 
Spider-Man. Flash begins to laugh and Kong tells him, watch, he's gonna go kick Peter. And when he dodges it, that'll show everyone. Over at his locker, Peter's spider sense begins to go off, but instead of dodging it, he flat out takes the hit. In pain, Peter looks back asking, why would you do something like that? Through the crowd of students, a voice then asks, what's their problem? And Gwen walks up to Kong, telling him that if he ever does that again, then everyone notices that Gwen's holding a knife. A teacher comes by asking what's going on, and as he gets through, Gwen drops the knife, obviously, because she doesn't want to get caught with it. The teacher then grabs Gwen by the arm and tells her that it's a great way to start her second day of school. Later, after school in the city, a man begins to run off after grabbing a woman's purse. The man tells everyone to watch it as he runs, and then suddenly, the purse is webbed out of his hand. Peter then jumps in, kicking the man, stating that that feels better. He was looking for a big bald guy to knock out. The man tries to fight back, but Peter knocks him in the head and webs him to the ground. He then hops over telling the woman that he brought back her purse. It was his pleasure to help. But everyone, including the woman who was robbed, just stared at him. She grabs the purse and begins to run off. And Peter begins to say to everyone openly, Why can't a guy in his underwear just go around the city helping people without them thinking that he's crazy or something? Back as Peter looks around, he notices that he's in front of the Daily Bugle. J. Jonah Jameson is watching. He asks if he's the guy who's been printing all of that garbage about him just to sell papers. Because if so, he has one thing to say to him. He jumps up shouting, Love it! It's hysterical! And he leaves. J. Jonah Jameson looks around and says that he thought Spider-Man was going to hit him. Maybe they should get back inside where it's safe. But as Jonah begins to move, he falls flat on his face with webbing covering his feet. Once inside, writer Ben Ulrich says that he got a lead on a recent murder on a woman in her home. The previous owner of the home was Dr. Otto Octavius. He explains that Otto was one of the chief scientists at Osborne Industries, one of the individuals that was thought dead during the explosion where Norman Osborn went missing. But he was in fact not dead. Sources state that Otto was taken to a government hospital somewhere in South Jersey where he managed to escape. It's also said that Otto was being observed because of complications in his condition brought on by the explosion. J. Jonah Jameson asks what does he mean by complications and Ben tells him that he's unsure but after what happened with Norman Osborn turning into the goblin it's safe to say that something fishy is going on. Jonah tells him it's okay let's just assume that Otto killed the woman in her home so the next question is why? Ben says that no one would really know maybe he didn't expect her there when he went back to his old home or maybe something horrible happened to him and he's gone crazy. Then outside of the office, Peter sits listening as Jonah tells Ben to go on and see what the good doctor has to say. Later that night, Otto Octavius sits in an office talking to himself. He knows what happened. It's all his fault. He paid him to give him his secrets from Norman. And when he ran out of uses for him, he tried to get rid of him. The only problem is, Otto Octavius doesn't know who he is. Otto shouts that he should have made sure that he was dead because now he's going to make him pay for what he has done to him. The next day, Peter heads over to work, but while on his way there, he catches the TV showing off Craven the Hunter. Craven tells everyone that he and his TV show are coming from Australia all the way over to America to film his show. He has a big surprise for everyone, but he isn't going to be making the announcement of what it is until he reaches the States. A little while later, Peter overhears some of the workers talking about a breaking story about some man with mechanical arms climbing hammer towers and trying to break in. Peter begins to think about it for a moment and then he remembers back to when he was at Norman Osborne's facility and he met Otto Octavius, an individual who used a device that had mechanical arms attached to it. After getting off of work, Peter suits up and heads over to Hammer Towers to find out what's going on. And he finds Justin Hammer speaking with two S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. They ask Justin Hammer if he knows who Dr. Otto Octavius is, and Justin tells them no. But the agents look at him and Justin says that he just met him. Agent Carter then says that Colonel Fury would need a better answer than that. Carter then goes on to explain how Otto was fused with the machine that gave mechanical arms, but the explosion at Norman's plant left him with amnesia, and he seems to have come here for something. After they talk for a little while, Justin notices something in the window and he sees Spider-Man's head. The two agents spin around firing their blasters, barely missing Spider-Man, and Spider-Man figures that it might be as good a time as any to leave. The next morning, Craven the Hunter's plane touches down in New York while his fans and reporters gather around to find out what his big announcement is. One reporter runs up telling him the world wants to know what he's going to be hunting in New York of all places that he couldn't be hunting anywhere else. Craven smiles, stating, I'm here to hunt a very special kind of species. I'm here to hunt the one that they call Spider-Man. The reporter then asks, what's he going to do when he finds Spider-Man? And Craven tells him, I'm going to kill him with my bare hands. While Craven makes his announcement, Peter watches back home, trying to figure out what he's going to do now. He's at Craven the Hunter, a guy who's known for hunting down things and killing them, chasing him. A week later, he heads to school and begins his social studies class when Gwen Stacy is let back into the classroom. She tells everyone that she's sorry for pulling a knife and doesn't want anyone to think of her as a crazy girl. But one thing that she does want to say is that she doesn't like bullies. Gwen takes her seat and the teacher says that they're going to the school 
full assembly in about 10 minutes. But if they have any questions regarding their superhero project, now is the time to ask. One of the girls says that she feels like the assignment is a bad idea. This is supposed to be a social studies class, not a superhero dress-up class. Not long ago, the school was attacked by a mutant. Now they're supposed to dress up as one? The teacher says that the assignment is supposed to help them study the environment from a different perspective. And the girl responds with, it doesn't matter. She talked to her mother and she will be bringing it up in the next PTA meeting because mutant things shouldn't even be in a classroom. The teacher turns around asking if anyone else feels the same way and Gwen smiles and raises her hand. Meanwhile, over in New York City, Justin Hammer heads out of his press conference while speaking with one of the scientists from his New Jersey facility. Justin tells him that they're going to need some major firepower. He needs to back up right away. The scientist states that their experiments are going smoothly and on track, but currently their subject, Flint Marco, is still adjusting to the experiments. A screen then changes to a man squirming in sand and screaming. Justin asks what the hell was that, and the scientist says that that's Flint and the Sandman Project. The scientist then goes on to ask why he doesn't just accept the assistance of S.H.I.E.L.D., and Justin tells him that he will not, mainly because they're going to look around his facilities and they will find that he's in violation of the superhero test ban. That and how Otto Octavius was an industrial spy for him and that was sent over to Osborne Industries and now believes that this explosion was somehow Justin Hammer's fault. A short while later, Justin arrives at the conference where he's about to announce the Energy Dome Project, a power plant offering an abundance of affordable and alternative energy sources. As he takes the stage, he explains that they are currently unveiling a groundbreaking energy technology with a hybrid of solar, electric, and nuclear energies. But as the announcement goes on, the video feed from the dome shows the scientists being attacked by Otto Octavius. Back at the school, the students all gather around for the assembly where the principal announces that they've all been brought here today to be informed that the school has been chosen to be the filming site for the Craven the Hunter show. But as he goes on explaining the do's and the don'ts, he's told that there has been some trouble in the city and the school is currently being placed under a lockdown. While the students all begin to panic, Mary Jane looks at Peter and tells him to go. Over at the dome, the police begin to arrive by helicopter, but one of the pilots tells the other that he may have a stowaway. The second pilot asks, what does he mean? And they both realize that hanging from a web, Spider-Man says that this idea was so much better in theory. One of the officers attempts to shoot Spider-Man and he tells them to please stop and try to help. Then he swings, dodging the gunfire, and as he releases and crashes into the facility, he gets up yelling, ta-da! And then he sees Otto Octavius standing there with a dead scientist. After seeing the destruction caused by Otto Octavius, Peter goes to check on the surviving scientists that are crawling out of the debris. He tells the man to hang on and then his spider sense begins to go off. Metal arms begin to shoot past Peter, hitting him in the head and knocking him down. Otto picks up Peter's body asking, what is this ridiculousness? Peter mumbles out some words and Otto leans in asking, what? And Peter tells him, you're one to talk and he claps his hands on the side of Otto's head. As Doc Ock stumbles backwards, Peter kicks free by kicking him in the head and then knocking away his glasses. Otto goes to cover his eyes and Peter tells him that that's the least of his problems. First of all, why the green jumpsuit? Peter webs up the metal arms and as they flail around, the web stretches and then it snaps. And Peter realizes that this could be a problem. The arms begin whipping around and Peter blocks and dodges them. And then one of them shoots up, hitting him in the head. Doc Ock then picks up Peter's body and tries to hit him. But while Peter tries to defend himself, one of the arms begins to change and it shocks Peter. His body is flung from the facility to the outside where it bounces onto the pier. He then starts to wake back up and realizes that he can hear voices. And then his spider sense goes goes off again. He looks back to see the police SWAT team surrounding him, all pointing their guns at him. One of the officers shouts for him not to move, or they'll blow off his mutant freak head. The officers then get down and begin to play Spider-Man in handcuffs, but Agent Carter steps up stating that she'll take it from here. The officers all argue that this is their bust, but while Agent Carter and the officer go on, Peter points asking if Charlton Heston is over there. And of course, everyone looks. He jumps up from the grips of the S.H.I.E.L.D. officers and he begins to web up everyone before jumping off of the pier and into the water. Agent Carter shouts for everyone to go after him, but as the agents jump in after Peter, all they find is his torn suit. A little while later, he heads home to watch the news, and on it, Justin Hammer states that he's not sure who that Spider-Man guy was, but they all have their concerns if he is the one who attacked. Peter shouts, come on, and Mary Jane tells him to just ignore it. He says that he's just trying to help people, but instead he keeps getting his butt kicked every time he goes out. Mary Jane suggests that maybe he should learn some kung fu or something, but really she needs to get going anyway. He can work on that later. She then gives him a kiss and says that she'll be by tomorrow after school so they can patch up the costume. Once Mary Jane leaves, Peter Peter sits back down to watch the news, and all of the reporters begin to say how hopefully Craven will be around to teach that weasel Spider-Man a real lesson. But as Peter sits back down trying to figure out what his next move is, he hears Aunt May's voice asking if he's home. He begins to panic as he's still in half of his Spider-Man costume, and he jumps out of the basement and crawls up to the bathroom. As he stumbles through the window, May hears the thump from upstairs and asks what's going on. Peter says that he's having a stomach problems, but he'll be fine. She tells him okay, well she brought him
him dinner just in case he needs anything. And the next day at school, the camera crews begin to set up their scene with Craven when one of the workers explains to everyone that they need to try and act natural when Craven comes in. All of the students begin to gather around and Gwen sees Peter and asks what happened. Did those jerks beat him up again? Peter tells her no, he just fell is all. And Mary Jane says yeah down the stairs. But as Mary Jane gives Peter a glaring look, Gwen checks on his face, and Craven walks in. He heads over to the hole that was created in the fight between Spider-Man and Goblin, and he begins to sniff. Everyone watches as he examines the hole, and then he turns back. Peter looks as Craven begins to sniff through the crowds, and then he shoots a look right towards Peter Parker, and he keeps moving. Gwen asks if it's just her, or does that guy vaguely smell like kitty litter? Craven stops and glares at her. And Gwen waves back. Later, reports start to swarm around that Justin Hammer is trying to get a statement about what happened at the dome. Justin rushes by to get away, and as he heads up the elevator, he tells his assistant Judy that the whole thing is going rather poorly. But as the elevator opens, Spider-Man's voice asks him, How do you think I feel? Spider-Man is sitting at Justin Hammer's desk reading his address book, stating, You stink, and on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the stinkiest, you're totally like a 14. One of Justin's bodyguards reaches for his gun, but Peter webs up his arm, and then he webs up the second bodyguard. As Judith pulls out her phone, he webs her up too. And after seeing that it was just a phone, he tells her, My bad. Justin tells Spider-Man that he has some nerve, so he hops off the desk, stating, You've got some real nerd. In fact, I was trying to help the other day. I already have a bad enough rep with the public. I just wanted to stop by and state that whatever you and Doc Ock have going on, you can have at it, because I'm going home. Justin Hammer stops for a second and then asks, How much? Peter responds quickly with, What do you mean? And Justin tells him, the doctor, how much would it take for you to take care of him? How about 50000 Peter responds rather angrily. First, you slam me in the press, and now you're offering me money for something that I was going to do for free before I got slammed in the press? Spider-Man leaps out the window, stating, you're what people refer to as a piece of work. And he leaves. Justin says that it was worth a shot, and then Judas says that there's a call for him. It's the doctor from the Jersey facility. The screen comes on with the doctor, and he doesn't say anything. Justin asks if he can hear them, and then blood begins to drip from his lip, and his body is thrown to the side. Doc Ock, Otto Octavius, appears on the screen, and Justin asks, what is he doing? Otto tells him, This is something of a payback for making me like this. Justin tells him, If you have any issues with me, we need to talk face to face. And Doc Ock says, That's true. Come meet me at this facility. A short while later, Justin heads out and notices that everyone in their cars is honking at him. Judith asks what they're honking for, and it's because Peter is riding atop of the limo. As Justin pulls up on his facility, he starts to see the news trucks all gathering around, and then he sees him. Doc Ock. Otto tells Justin to come out and admit his sins. The press would like to hear all about about the things that are going on here. And then one of his metal arms begins to tap on the limo window. The driver says that he can get them out of here if they want to turn around. And Judith shouts for him to just do it then. So the driver floors it into reverse. As the limo begins to back out, a metal arm smashes through the window and others begin to pick up the limo. Otto Octavia shouts that he will not deny him again. And then he begins to shake the limo as his eyes are suddenly webbed up. Spider-Man says that he can't wash this anymore and he swings in kicking Doc Ock. He stares at the webbed up arms and then one of them points towards him and switches to a gun. The arm begins to blindly fire at him and shoots towards the crowds. Doc Ock rips the webbing off of his face and he asks Spider-Man, why does he keep showing up? Who are you? Another freak that Justin created? As Peter hangs onto one of the metal arms, he tells him, no, I'm a genetic freak all of my own, thank you. You should rent yourself out as a ride for children. And then Spider-Man is smacked into the side of a news van. Doc Ock keeps whipping around, hitting Spider-Man as the reporters all start to film the fight. Through the dodging, Doc Ock quickly manages to grab a hold of him and then another arm reaches out and begins to shock him. But as it gets close, Peter webs it up, sending the shock back towards Doc Ock. He's then flung from the grip and Doc Ock makes his way towards the limo calling out Justin. As he's getting ready to grab him, a web is shot hitting Doc Ock's pants and then he pulls him down. Doc Ock quickly pulls his pants back up but Peter jumps in punching him stating, I didn't take you for the tidy whities kind of guy. He then kicks Doc Ock and jumps onto him slamming him into the ground. He webs up his face and he grabs and rips off one of the metal arms. As the camera lights all focus on Spider-Man, he sits down exhausted and then another light shines as Craven steps out. Peter simply responds with, Come on, I have a curfew! Craven shouts, It is time to do battle! And Spider-Man asks him, How about we go help the lady in the crushed limo over there? Spider-Man jumps onto the limo and asks if everything's okay, and Judith says that Justin is dead from a heart attack. Spider-Man looks towards Craven and says that he's going to rip the door off, so could he grab the girl or... And Craven shouts, We will do battle! So Spider-Man tells him, No, we won't! Craven shows his teeth, and Spider-Man asks, You're kidding, right? But as Spider-Man asks that, Craven lunges forward. So Spider-Man steps out of the way, causing him to fall down. Craven continues to try and attack, and Spider-Man continues to tell him that he really needs to cut it out now. And after a few more swings, Spider-Man finally punches back, knocking Craven into a car, which knocks him out. Spider-Man then tells everyone, I did tell him to stop. You all saw that, right? And as the reporters continue
continue to film him, Spider-Man heads over to the limo and helps Judith out. Judith tells him thank you for saving her, and the crowds begin cheering and clapping. And then one of the reporters walks up and tells him, that was amazing! Spider-Man tells him, no, it wasn't. Two people died. As he begins to leave, the reporters ask if they can ask him a few questions. And he tells them, no, he'd rather not. The reporter continues to pester him, telling him that what he did was amazing. Surely he would want to. And Spider-Man stops her and telling her, you can return the favor by calling me a mutant freak or blaming the zombie or something. They try to stop him again because maybe he would want to talk to them. They're live right now. And he tells her, fine. So the reporter asks, what do you want the world to know, Spider-Man? And he says that he is from a planet. Many galaxies far, far away. The reporters follow up with, really? And Spider-Man says, no, I'm just like Otto Octavius. I fell backwards into some powers and just want to help people so that people like Otto Octavius can't hurt anyone. So the reporter asks, why wear a mask? And Spider-Man says that it's because he has friends and family that he doesn't want to put into the spotlight. So he protects them by wearing the mask. Even though wearing the mask might be corny and it even forces idiots like Craven to try and come after him or J. Jonah Jameson to trash him to sell papers, he really doesn't care. And the reporter asks, why don't you care? So Spider-Man says, it's because a guy a whole lot smarter than him told him that with great power comes great responsibility. But either way, the cops are coming. So if everyone's fine, it's time to go. He heads back home and as soon as he opens the door, Aunt May asks where he's been. He says that he was at work and May says that's funny because she called there and they said he hasn't been in all week. She gets up looking at his bruises and asks again, where was he? He says that he was fine. It was with Mary Jane. May sits back down stating, okay, she doesn't mind if he doesn't respect her, but he will respect the rules of this house. And Mary Jane was the first person that she called. May then tells him that until he can stop lying, he's grounded, which means no more bugle, no more Mary Jane giggles in the basement. It's only school and home. Peter smiles, stating, finally, he's a hero who's also grounded. But over in the shield holding cells, Otto Octavius, Doc Ock, is sitting in his cell muttering to himself, asking who Spider-Man is, who could Spider-Man be? And slowly, as he keeps asking himself, he begins to remember something from his past, when Norman Osborn had him following a little kid, a kid named Parker. Even returning home late the next morning, Peter heads out to school, where Mary Jane tells him that she watched him last night. All of the news channels are covering it. Peter tells her that he knows, but even though he saved the day, he got into a lot of trouble coming home so late. Mary Jane asks what happened, and Peter tells her that since he got caught sneaking in at 3 o'clock in the morning, he's grounded. Like, forever. As Peter sits on a bleacher with Mary Jane, he tells her about everything that's going on and how it might be best for them to lay low for a bit. Hang up the tights, focus back on school and reading, make sad faces to Aunt May until she finally gives in to this whole grounded thing. And as the two of them go on, Mary Jane's face suddenly begins to change as she sees Harry Osborne walking by. They both jump up, running over asking how he's been ever since the Green Goblin attack at the school a little while ago. Harry says that he's glad to be back, but he was just going through some rough stuff back then, but everything's going to be better now. As Mary Jane hugs him, Harry then says that he actually came by to tell Peter that his father wants him to come over for dinner tonight. Mary Jane says that she thought his father was, but Harry stops her and says, he's fine. Just with everything that's going on, he couldn't deal with it. But really, his father's fine. In fact, we're super close now. Peter says that he would love to go, but he's grounded. So, and Harry asks, since when does Peter Parker get grounded? But fine, and it'll just have to be some other time. After leaving school, Peter makes his way back home trying to figure out what's going on. Norman Osborn is back. He knows who Spider-Man is, so maybe he just wants to talk about it? Maybe help him use these powers? But the more he thinks about it, the more he realizes that this is Norman Osborn, a piece of garbage mutant goblin that tried to kill him. So at least he's grounded, which will give him some time to figure this whole thing out, and as he walks into his house, he sees a limo parked out front. Peter walks inside and Aunt May tells him that he should have told her that Harry was back in town, and he tells her that he just found out himself what's going on. The woman introduces herself as Miss Brooke, Norman's personal assistant, and May tells him that Harry's father sent over a limo so that they could all have dinner. Peter tries to state that he's grounded and that he really shouldn't go, but May stops him stating that they sent a limo. He can go to dinner with them. Miss Brooke then says this is great news. They'll have Peter back by 8 or 9. And a little while later, they pull up to the Osborne penthouse with Harry running outside asking who's grounded now, huh? Peter tells that he's nuts and Harry says that maybe they should just park a limo out in front of his house until May forgets that he was ever grounded. The two take the elevator up and Harry says that he still can't believe that him and MJ are an item now. Peter asks who told him that and he says that Mary Jane did. They talked on the phone for like an hour. The girl is totally in love. Peter then asks if she really said it like that, like using those exact words and Harry looks at him asking, what? Didn't she tell you already? As the two go on, the elevator door dings and Harry says that he's got to finish up with his therapy.
therapist, but his father is in the back, just go knock on the door. Before Peter can even ask why he would want to talk to him, Harry leaves and Miss Brooke directs Peter to the back room. Peter tries to figure out what Norman could want, but nothing bad should happen, right? There's too many people here. What could possibly go wrong? As he steps into the office, he sees a TV showing the news clip of his fight with Doc Ock. He then hears the laughing when he pulled down Otto's pants. Norman then steps out stating that he watched that clip so many times. And then he asks, how do I look? Better or worse than the last time? Peter says that he doesn't know what he's talking about. And then Norman changes the channel showing Peter being bitten by a spider and Peter asking what's going on. Norman responds by telling him, this whole Spider-Man crap, it's over. As of now, you belong to me and we've got bigger things to discuss. Peter looks around the room for a place to escape, but Norman goes on stating, You're wondering how I'm alive, right? Well, it's because I've evolved. He takes out a syringe and he stabs himself into the neck, injecting a fluid inside. Peter's spider sense begins to go off, and then he watches as Norman falls over in pain. He begins to hit his desk, ripping his shirt off, and then Peter sees Norman's arm begin to change. As the transformation completes, Norman looks at Peter and asks, So what was your question? Norman stands over Peter, telling him, I'm just trying to show you who's in charge here. Suddenly, the two of them hear Harry shouting, asking if everything's okay and Norman tells him it's fine they'll be right out he then turns back to Peter and tells him that Harry has no idea that everyone around him has a secret identity but thankfully he's receiving the best hypnosis that money can buy he takes out another syringe and injects himself and after a groan of pain Peter watches as Norman's arm slams back onto the desk and it claws its way as he falls behind it Peter runs to look behind it and he sees Norman and when Norman looks back he asks where were we he gets up and says oh that's right the whole spider-man thing as it turns out I now own your G Therefore, you belong to me. You will do work for me, and there may be things that you don't understand. You might not even agree with them, but if you don't, well, I'll start torturing dear Aunt May. And if that doesn't set in, maybe I can destroy your little girlfriend. Mary Jane, right? Harry calls out again, but Norman tells him that it's best that they go now. They have an understanding, right? Back in the main room, Harry says that he has a copy of the Dateline story about him and his father. He's totally gonna check it out. He begins to play the video and it shows Norman and Harry as Norman explains that the reason for him and his son's disappearance was due to the concerns of an attack at Oscorp. But as the video plays, Peter begins to panic, thinking about what Norman said he would do if he doesn't do what he says. He struggles and says that he's gotta go and he runs out of the room. Peter gets up to go after him, but Norman stops him, stating, just give him some time. He'll be back tomorrow. Later at home, Peter walks in and May asks how everything went and Peter hardly answers. Her. May says that if he didn't want to go, she shouldn't have forced him. Peter says about the other night, he didn't mean to lie about it. May tells him that Mary Jane is his first girlfriend. They'll just chalk it up to experience. Peter then hugs May and she asks if everything's okay and he tells her that it's been a long day. Later at school, he's called into the school therapist to discuss a few things. He tries to tell her that he actually is about to take a test, but Dr. Bradley tells him that it will only be a few minutes. The first thing that she understands is that the Osbournes are back in town. So did Norman reveal his new abilities? Peter asks, what is this? And Dr. Bradley goes on stating, did he threaten you? Did he mention that he's aware that you are Spider-Man? Peter begins looking around the room stating that there has to be someone else here, isn't there? And then as he looks out the window, his vision begins to blur and as it fades, Peter says, gotta get out of town. Over by the window, the image of Nick Fury starts to become clear and he tells Peter to just relax. They have a lot of important things to discuss and not much time to do it. Peter sits back down and he asks, how does S.H.I.E.L.D. even know about him? And Nick looks at him stating, there isn't much in the world that I don't know. Dr. Bradley begins to list off some of the recent events like viewing the Oscorp security footage and Otto's hypnosis transcripts. Peter gets up stating that he doesn't have time for this, but Nick tells him that he knows that Norman is going to ask him to kill him. And if he doesn't, he'll kill his aunt and whoever this Mary Jane is. Peter stops and Nick tells him to sit. They have much to discuss. He explains that Norman was working on something created for S.H.I.E.L.D. and after several years, S.H.I.E.L.D. has been in the market for a super soldier serum. There are several companies competing for S.H.I.E.L.D.'s attention. Oscorp made a good presentation, but they never came through after years of development. Norman then rushed to put out something for people to see, but it ended up premature and thus resulted in the accident and the spider bite. Since all of that, Norman has blamed him for what happened and he's been delusional with revenge ever since. Peter then asks if they know all of this stuff, why don't they just arrest Norman? And Nick says, legally, Norman is off limits. The American government isn't allowed to spy on Americans on American soil, so technically we don't know any of this. Peter then asks why come to him. If they're not going to do anything to stop him, what's the point? And Nick tells him, actually, he's come to tell him that he's going to be on his own, and they can't do anything until Norman does something wrong. Peter shouts, he threatened my family! He turned himself into a monster! You can't do anything? And Nick tells him again that technically they don't know anything. So if and when Norman makes a move on either of them, they're just gonna have to sit back and keep watching. Later after school, Peter heads home, and just like the day before, there's a 
another limo waiting in front of the house. As he walks up, he sees Miss Brooks walking out with May, and Peter asks what's going on. May tells him that Norman has invited them all over for dinner. So Peter pulls her aside, stating, you can't go. Norman isn't a nice man. He might be a criminal. And as they talk, May looks back and quotes, never met a man with money who hasn't stepped on someone to get it. Peter asks, what was that? And May says that it was something that Ben used to state. Miss Brooke then walks up, asking if everything's all right, and May tells her yes. But sadly, they'll have to make it to the dinner another time. Miss Brooks tells her that it's too bad. Mr. Osborne is looking forward to meeting them, and May just says that another time is all. Later that night, Peter heads back to try and find information on Norman, and he begins to think that maybe he should just take off the mask. Expose Norman, take the hit publicly, and see what happens. Maybe go to jail, maybe not. But as he swings away, he sees a set of teeth grinning at him from the top of a building. Norman says, I thought I told you to throw away the costume. And Peter stops and asks, what did I ever do to you? Why bother me now? Norman laughs. <laughs> What did you do? Peter stops him, stating, No, this whole thing was brought on by yourself. The spider biting me? Totally your fault. In fact, I should sue the crap out of you. Norman just tells him, Soon, you will learn. And you will learn that you owe me. And he takes off. Peter watches as Norman escapes, and as he looks down towards the streets, he sees Harry helping Mary Jane out of the limo that just pulled up. But as Mary Jane steps out, Norman leaps down, snatching her, and he jumps away. However, just before he jumped off on the conversation, Norman was looking at the conversation that he had with Peter a bit differently. The voices were telling him that this is all Parker's fault. They should kill him right now. And then the voice tells him that there's a girl. Go get the girl! And that's when Norman made his move. Peter quickly chases after, shouting for someone to help. Nick, shield anyone! But as Norman lands on a bridge, Mary Jane calls out to Peter, and Peter tells Norman that he'll do whatever he wants, just let her go. So Norman throws Mary Jane over the ledge, and without a second thought, Peter follows. Back up top, though, a shield helicopter flies in, opening fire. Peter tries to catch Mary Jane before she can hit the water, and he webs onto her foot. He then webs back up, pulling Mary Jane towards him, and the two whip back and swing onto the bridge. Once they land, Peter says he did it. He caught her, and then he realizes Mary Jane isn't responding. Meanwhile, over at Triskelon Shield headquarters, Nick watches as Norman throws Mary Jane, and he gives the order to take the shot. Over on the bridge, two helicopters begin firing down a Norman until he falls to his knees. He looks up and he tells Nick that it's going to take a lot more than that to keep him down. Back down below, Peter tells her that she's got to wake up and slowly her eyes begin to open. Mary Jane begins to ask what's going on, where is she? But before Peter can respond, the explosions from the helicopters can be heard above. Peter stomps by one of the passing cabs telling him that he needs to get her out of here. She'll tell him where to go and the cab driver hops out telling Peter, you're the man, you can do anything you need. Up top, Norman starts firing blasts at the helicopters but as the blast is deflected by a shield, he says he didn't know that plasma shields were ready for combat. Peter tells him that that's the least of his problems, and he jumps in, cracking Norman across the head. Norman shouts, I'll dare you! I will have your head! And then Peter jumps in, kicking up and knocking Norman back down. He jumps onto Norman and starts punching over and over and over, telling him, you will never hurt anyone again! And just as Peter is getting ready to take the last hit, Norman reaches up, grabbing him by the throat, and he begins to squeeze, trying to pop him. Suddenly, Peter's body is thrown to the side, and then the shield helicopters go back to firing. Through the bullets, Norman Norman gets up and begins to escape. Meanwhile, Peter manages to catch himself before hitting the water. Peter then watches as Norman escapes, realizing that he's about to head back to his penthouse. Norman crashes into his office and he runs over to where he keeps the Oz serum. But just before he can inject himself, he hears Harry asking if that's him. Harry sees Norman and he asks, what did you do to my dad? Just as Harry realizes that that is his dad. And Norman tells him, sell the door. Within seconds, Harry falls asleep and he falls to the ground. And then Norman goes back to the serum and he starts injecting multiple syringes until his body begins to change and grow even bigger. Peter says that he really hopes he doesn't plan on driving like that. Or can he even hear him anymore over all that crap he just put into himself? Norman charges at Peter and Peter steps in, punching Norman back down. He then leaps up to get away as Norman gets up, but as he does, Norman manages to catch him by the leg. Norman then throws Peter through the fish tank, spraying water everywhere. And as Peter lands, some of the water splashes onto Harry and he slowly begins to wake back up. Norman gets up, grabbing Peter again. And as the light from the shield helicopter shines in, Harry sees his dad strangling Spider-Man. Norman begins to bend Spider-Man so that he can break his back. And he manages to kick upwards, freeing himself. Peter then webs up Norman, and then using his strength, Norman rips through it. He then sees Harry staring at him, and with that moment, Peter quickly grabs the desk and he throws it at Norman. The desk crashes onto him, and then Norman grabs it, throwing it out the window. Peter jumps to catch the desk from falling on the people down below, but as he does, Norman gets back up, squeezing down on Peter's head. Norman suddenly hears Harry calling out to him, and then he turns back, and Harry grabs a pile of rubble, and he stabs it into Norman's back. Norman turns back around to try and attack, but the serum begins to wear off and Norman falls to the ground. Harry then looks at Spider-Man asking why he did this but before Spider-Man can answer, Harry faints. The shield soldiers all storm in and one of them checks Norman's pulse. Nick asks how he is and the soldiers give him a thumbs up tell him to take Norman away. Peter then asks if they're going to arrest Harry but Nick tells him that they don't do that sort of thing. They will have to deprogram the hypnotherapy and get him back to normal.
normal. Nick then tells Peter he knows this is a lot to take in, but the best thing for him to do now is keep this secret. No telling his family or girlfriend about what happened. Every time that he may want to confide in them, he inadvertently puts their lives at risk. Just relax and enjoy the youth while it's there. Peter snaps at him, telling him he doesn't want anything to do with their big boy world of theirs. And Nick tells him that he hardly has a choice. Even though right now he's a minor, the day that he turns 18, well, just try and enjoy your youth while it lasts. Peter turns to run out of the building and a soldier asks if he should go after him, but Nick just watches and tells them no, let the kid go. Peter tracks down where he told the cab to go and as he enters into the warehouse, he asks if she's still there. Mary Jane runs down hugging Peter asking what happened, what happened to Harry? And Peter sits down telling her, he's gone, again. She asks what happened to him, but Peter doesn't want to tell her because he doesn't want to talk about it right now. With everything that's been going on, Peter decided that it was time to focus on his schoolwork. But while sitting around in the library studying, Mary Jane runs in asking Peter if he's got his costume today. Peter asks her what's going on, so Mary Jane turns on the news and tells him that there's a giant rhino destroying things downtown. Peter runs back to suit up, and Mary Jane turns back to the TV, singing, My boyfriend's gonna kick your butt. As Peter runs over to his locker to grab his backpack, he turns the corner and sees Aunt May. He asks what she's doing here, and May tells him that she's here for a teacher-parent meeting. Peter tells her, actually, he's really busy right now, but that's when Peter's math teacher, Mr. Del Palma, opens the door, stating that it's just about time. Why don't you both come in? As they enter and see, it, Mr. Del Palma tells May that Peter is a rather exceptional student, but lately he's been rather distracted. She looks over at Peter, who's looking out the window, and then Peter turns back, asking, What? Peter tells them both sorry, but he's actually supposed to be helping an exchange student right now, and he feels kind of bad not being there. May tells him to go on ahead then. They'll talk more tonight during dinner. So he jumps up, telling them thank you, and he runs out of the room. As he runs outside, he begins to hear someone sobbing over a pile of trash. He looks over to see Gwen sitting there in the trash, and he asks her if everything's okay. Through through her sobs, she tells him no, she's fine. Loving life, in fact. Peter stops for a moment and tells her, okay, he's gotta get going. But Gwen shouts, fine, go ahead and leave her, just like your mother did. Peter turns asking, what are you talking about? And Gwen says that she overheard her mother talking to someone. She's planning on leaving her father and saying how her life at home is terrible. Peter tries to tell her that maybe she's just trying to blow off some steam, but Gwen shouts, no! Her exact words were, my life in this house sickens me. I hate the people life stuck me with. She goes back to crying and Peter realizes he really has to go. So he tries to tell her that he would love to stay, really, but he has something to do. Gwen tells him fine, but Peter tells her he'll be back and find her after school, he promises. After finally managing to get away, he suits up and swings downtown, and just as he arrives, he sees that everything has already been handled by Iron Man. And as he sits on the light post, Peter then hears a man shouting to him, asking, Where were you ten minutes ago? With no real answer, Peter swings back, thinking, at least he tried. A short while later, over at the First National Bank, Ben Urich stops by due to some issues that he's having with his ATM card, but as him and the teller talk, there's a sudden crash behind them and someone shouts, don't anyone move. He turns back, he sees Spider-Man holding one of the guards, telling everyone that this is a robbery. After Spider-Man robbed the bank, Ben hurried over to the Daily Bugle, where Jonah was more than happy to get that press rolling. While Jonah tells everyone to start getting to work on a new Spider-Man story, Peter walks by asking why everyone's running around. But before anyone can answer him, Peter overhears the others having concerns about Spider-Man now being a bad guy. Ben begins to argue that the Spider-Man that he saw didn't seem like the normal Spider-Man. This one beat people. But Jonah shouts, telling him, it doesn't matter! We're gonna post this story and that's that! So as the day went on, the front page of the Bugle began to report, Spider-Man, criminal! As Peter takes the subway home, he thanks whoever that was that robbed the bank using his costume. Fight Doc Ock, Kingpin, heck, even the Green Goblin was bad enough, but this, this beat it's all by far. That and the only person that he can even tell this all to would be Mary Jane, but even telling her about his powers is starting to seem like a mistake. Just as Peter begins to think to himself that he's going to find out whoever that is is posing as him, he notices a police car in front of his house. He runs in asking if everything's alright, and then he sees Gwen sleeping on the couch. He then hears May speaking with Gwen's father, George, in the kitchen about Gwen's mother leaving them. As the two talk, May hears a creak and sees Peter standing there. She tells him that Captain Stacy here is going to be out of town for a bit, so she offered to let Gwen stay with them until he gets back. Not much longer later, Mary Jane stops by and Peter explains the situation with Gwen staying with them. Mary Jane then asks, why is she here though? And Peter says, because her mother up and left and her father is going out of town and... But then he stops asking, you know, the way you said that was kind of angry. Are you angry? She begins to shout, what is she supposed to think with Gwen sleeping here in her pajamas? Peter tries to calm her down and then he asks, wait, wait, do you not trust me? 
And Mary Jane tells him, I don't trust her. I see what's going on with her. Did you tell her that you're Spider-Man yet? Peter begins to ask, what are you even talking about? Then Mary Jane doesn't answer and she leaves. Afterwards, Peter heads upstairs to study and Gwen says that she thought Mary Jane was supposed to join them. He tells her that he's not sure what happened with them, but then the news comes on the TV and the reports announce that there is currently a standoff with Spider-Man and the police. Peter looks at the TV and tells May that he has to run over to Mary Jane's for a second. He rushes back downtown to see the police surrounding a jewelry store, shouting for that fake Spider-Man to come out. Peter swings by and tells them to allow him. He's dying to talk to this guy himself. As Peter jumps onto the building, the police all shout for him to get down and put his hands up. He shouts, hey, I'm not the one robbing anything here. Heck, I don't even have pockets in this thing. One of the officers shouts to take him down and they all begin to open fire on Spider-Man. Most of the bullets fly past, but one hits Peter in the shoulder and he begins to fall. The officers all rush in to handcuff Peter and Peter shouts to them to just listen for a second. The officers don't and they pick him up, slamming him back onto their car and they begin to pull his mask off. But as they do, Peter kicks back, knocking the officers away and he jumps. As he begins to run, the officers open fire again, but this time Peter manages to dodge them all and run. He tells them that he needs to hurry. He has to fix his mask and he also needs to get out of here. Using all of the strength that he has, he pulls the cuffs apart and then a spotlight begins to shine down on him. The police helicopter begins to fly overhead and one of the men hangs out shooting a rifle down at him. After a short sprint, Peter manages to jump back down towards the ground and hide away in a dumpster. But over at Mary Jane's room, she's sitting writing in her journal about how lately she's been having nightmares, which is not normal for her. As she writes, she begins to hear her phone go off and an operator tell her that there's a collect call coming from Peter Parker. She tells him that she'll accept and Soon the line connects and he says that his aunt just called looking for him. She's said to be home in 45 minutes in, but as she stops, she asks, what is he doing there? And all she can hear Peter saying is, help me. After a cab ride later, Mary Jane rushes to the dumpster that Peter told her to meet him at and finds him holding a gunshot wound. She tells him that they need to hurry and get him to a hospital, but Peter says they can't. They'll just arrest him there. Mary Jane tells him no, they're going to the hospital. She knows just how to do it. So a short while later, she takes Peter to the hospital. Without saying anything, Peter stumbles in and collapses onto a doctor. One of the doctors looks at Mary Jane and asks if he's with her. And she tells him no. And then he shouts for the others that they need to hurry and get him to the operating room. After surgery, Peter slowly begins to wake back up and then he overhears Here's the doctors speaking with some of the officers that they have a kid who just came in from a gunshot wound. The officer says that they're going to need to go and see and get a name out of him. But as they pull back the curtains, Peter is already gone. Back in the waiting room, Mary Jane waits to hear from Peter when the woman next to her looks at her. She looks down and sees her bag and notices the costume in it. Mary Jane just closes it. An officer comes out of the back stating that they need to lock this place down. The person in question has fled. So Mary Jane gets up and leaves and as the doctor from before points at her telling her to wait, Mary Jane begins to run. After getting away, Peter and Mary Jane meet back up in a nearby building and Mary Jane says that that was so cool. Could you swing us home now? Peter tells her no. He's hopped up on painkillers and he doesn't even know how to find home right now. So not long after, May begins to wake up from sleeping on the couch since Peter hasn't come home. As she gets up, she checks on his room to see he's already fast asleep and decides to let him be for now. But as soon as the door shuts, Peter gets back up in pain and decides to just put on the news for a bit. As the TV comes on, the reporters interview Sergeant Bullet regarding the recent rumor that the man known as Spider-Man has now attempted to rob another bank. Bullet tells the camera that he wants to make things perfectly clear. Vigilante behavior will not be tolerated in this city, masked or not. As for Spider-Man, he is a coward and a thief and he will pay for what he has done. The next day at school, Peter heads over to his locker to find a letter addressed to him in it. He opens it and it reads, Black van in the parking lot. I'll take care of the shoulder. Peter checks around to see if anyone was looking when he read it, and when he sees there wasn't, he decides to check out the van. He goes out there to find it, and the door suddenly slides open. A woman leans out telling him that her name is Janet Van Dyne, Nick Fury Center. Peter tells her that he doesn't need Nick Fury's help, and she tells him yes, yes he does. So Peter winces, stating, fine, maybe I do. Once they get inside, Peter looks at Janet and asks if she is, and she tells him yes, she's the one. Wasp, card-carrying member of the Ultimates. If you're curious as to who the Ultimates are, they're this universe's Avengers. But as she looks at the wound, she says, actually, you're already healing pretty well. Do you have an increased healing factor? And Peter tells her he's not sure, maybe. He hasn't been able to do much research on it. Janna tells him that's all right. She has something here that it was a chemical in chickens that helps increase the healing of humans. So with a little playing around, she whipped up a little cocktail from his own blood samples. As she injects Peter with the medicine, he asks how do they get a blood sample? And she tells him that Nick got one from him. He should just consider himself lucky that they happen to be watching the news. Peter then asks if Nick mentioned anything about the guy who's running around robbing banks posing as him. And Janet tells him no, and no offense, they don't really focus on the small things. But she will say if someone was running around in her costume, she would go and beat the holy snot out of them. After school, Peter, Mary Jane, and Gwen all head back to Peter's house where they are suddenly stopped as they see several police cars lining in front of the house. Peter runs inside shouting what's going on, but as the girls walk in, the two officers stand up. Gwen looks at them as they look at her and they hand her George Stacy's badge. The officers explain that while 
while they were at a police conference. Spider-Man was robbing an armored truck. They opened fire with their guns at him and they hit his backpack and it began to smoke. Spider-Man took the backpack off and threw it towards a small child. George ran in, grabbing the child, throwing him to safety, but as the bag landed in his lap, it exploded. Later that night, Peter and Mary Jane went to sit with Gwen on the roof as Peter tells her that her father was a hero. The only thing that she can say is, this is all because of Spider-Man. Spider-Man's fault. Peter tries to tell her that they don't know that. The more it's explained, it sounds like someone is posing as him, but Gwen stops him, stating she just wants to be alone for now. The next day, there are news reports about another robbery, and Peter waits no time heading out to the scene. As he crashes through the window, he sees the imposter holding a woman hostage, staring right back at him. The fake Spider-Man shouts that he'll do it. He'll kill this woman right here, right now. So you better back away. The room fills with silence, and Peter shoots a web blast, knocking the taser out of the man's hand. As it goes flying, the man tries to jump away, but Peter smacks him down, stating, you just murdered a cop. The man tries to get back up, but Peter grabs him by the back of the neck, and he punches him into a teller desk. The man fires a weak web shot, but Peter catches it. He then gets up, stating, if it's money you want, you can have it. It's right over there. Peter webs the man's chest and swings him towards him, asking, why me? Why use my costume? As he rips the man's mask off, the man says that it was nothing personal. Honest, he's just some guy. Peter throws the man, shouting, some guy? The world thinks Spider-Man is now a murderer, and it's all because of some guy who decided to put on my costume. He grabs the man by the throat, asking, what stops me from murdering? Murdering you then. The gripper on the man's throat tightens as Peter stares into his eyes, and then he lets go. He looks at himself for what he has just done, but as the police storm inside, they see the man hanging with a note. The man says, Please, get me out of here! It was all me! I acted alone! And the officers take the note off as it reads, from the real Spider-Man. He heads off and stops back at home, telling himself he almost lost it. He could have killed that man. And then what would he be? But later, as Peter heads home, May finds Peter out front and tells him that they need to talk. Inside, Peter and May head into the room where Gwen Stacy is staying, and they tell her due to her situation with her mother, they were hoping that she may consider staying with them. The next day at school, Peter tells Mary Jane that they're going to be finishing up moving the rest of Gwen's stuff in and see what happens. And as he says that, Mary Jane turns away. She says that this isn't it. She thought it was, but this isn't it. Peter asks what she's talking about and she shouts us this isn't what she thought it was gonna be like but now every night she has nightmares horrible nightmares where he dies or she dies every night ever since that day in the bridge she thought she could handle having a superhero boyfriend but no she can't and the worst part is she can't even tell him to stop because he won't it's going to kill him one day then this Gwen staying over she's totally in love with you Peter tries to tell her no, but Mary Jane just shouts, No, I'm not stupid. I just can't do this anymore. I love you, and I can't do this anymore. We're officially done, Peter Parker. So he went home after school, and all he could do was think about Mary Jane. With everything that's going on in his life, she's the only person that he could talk to. And now, she's gone. Peter thinks that maybe he should just call her. If she hears his voice, maybe she'll come around. She was supposed to love him. But just as Peter gets the courage to dial, he throws the phone aside, stating, No, it's a stupid idea. As the phone flies through the air and crashes into the wall, Peter goes to pick it back up and then notices a door behind a box where the phone landed. He pushes open the small wooden door and finds boxes, all of them marked Parker. After going through a few of them, he finds old pictures of himself and his father, and among them a videotape. He runs up to his room to play the video and sees that it was from when he was a small child. His family was having a picnic with Aunt May and Uncle Ben and another family. As Peter continues to watch though, May walks up behind him asking where did he find this. He tells her that he found a bunch of old boxes in the basement and... But May stops him, telling him that her and Ben were waiting until he was old enough to see this. It seems that now he's old enough. Peter kind of remembers that other family, the Brocks. He was his father's partner, and May tells him that that's right. He used to play with Eddie Jr. even though he was a bit older. And after the accident of both of their parents, Eddie moved away. May then suggests that maybe he should try and find Eddie. Maybe he can tell him what he found. So Peter does just that, and after a quick internet search, he manages to find Eddie's address and even a phone number. So Peter calls and actually gets a hold of Eddie Jr. The two of them talk for a while, and Eddie says that they should meet up, catch up at old times. And the next day, Peter stops by Eddie's dorm room to head out for some coffee. As they sit, Eddie says that he's actually going to college for astrophysics. And Peter tells him that that's actually what his major is going to be as well. Eddie laughs, telling him that it would just be like them, trying to impress their fathers. Peter tells him, Actually, that's what he wanted to come by for. While going through his father's old things, there was a videotape of all of them having a picnic. Eddie thinks back to that day and he's just amazed. And then he says that since they're on this topic, he has something for Peter as well. A little while later, Eddie takes Peter over to a lab that he's been using for school to show him something. As Eddie opens up a small locker, Peter sees a small beaker full of black liquid and he asks what it is. Eddie grins and tells him that is their inheritance. He goes on to state that this is what their fathers were working on. This is their life's work, or rather, what it would have been if they were given a 
chance to continue their life's work. Peter asks what's it supposed to be, and Eddie says that currently it's just a pile of protoplasmic goo, but what it's supposed to be is a cure for cancer. Though he wasn't able to make much sense of it, his professor has been helping him get through some of it when they happened to come across this. He takes out another small container and pulls out a sheet of paper labeled The Suit. He explains that the suit was supposed to attach itself to a person tailored to their specific DNA, and what it would do is help the body produce its own natural toxins to fight off the cancer. The current work has brought them to phase two, which was supposed to enhance the physical strengths and natural abilities of the patient. But with them running out of their funding, their fathers took up jobs with Trask Industries to try and support it. However, because they were work for hire, it meant that everything that they were working on was technically owned by that company, which meant the suit as well. Eddie then hands Peter a journal left by Eddie Sr., stating that he was the one who pushed Ray into working for this company when Ray said that they shouldn't. Because of it, now they're going through lawsuits to try and finish the project that they spent their lives working on. As Peter flips through the paperwork, Eddie tells him that that's the last part was just two before, but under his breath, Peter tells him no. And Eddie says that it all happened just as they were coming back from their meeting with the lawyers. So Peter then asks if that's the case, what's with the black stuff? And Eddie says that it was something that they were working on behind Trask's back. It was supposed to be used as proof of ownership of the suit, but they didn't get far enough with it. Eddie begins to pack up everything, saying how their fathers were really onto something, but they may have been several years ahead of their time. Professor Connors said that even if the suit didn't work, it would still create some new and interesting questions. Peter thinks back and tells Eddie that he mentioned something about the suit being made for someone's specific DNA, just who did they use to test it on? Eddie begins to place the beaker back into the locker and he tells him that they used Ray's DNA. The following night, Peter goes over the tapes more and more watching how his father would talk about this project. But as the videos went on, it showed Ray dealing with the lawsuits and talking about how all he wanted to do was just help people. Now their work will just be taken over and there's nothing they can even do. As Peter heard that, he decided no, there's always some company trying to take someone else's work and make profit on it, but not this time. He will finish what his father started. All he needs to do is get a small sample of the stuff that Eddie has kept locked away. So he sneaks back into the labs and pulls out a sample from the beaker, but he spills it onto his hands. His spider sense begins to go crazy and the liquid begins to spread, covering his hands. It doesn't stop and it continues covering the rest of his arm as soon as his entire body. Peter tries to pull it off, but soon all that's left is a smoldering black blob. As the outer crust hardens, Peter bursts out of it. But what he finds is that the suit has completely covered him. Elsewhere in the city, a pop singer has finished her concert, and she's getting ready to leave when she's suddenly taken hostage. As her limo speeds off, the men inside wearing masks tell her that she made more than enough money to pay for a ransom, right? However, as the men drive off, they hear a loud thump on the roof of the limo. Seconds later, Peter opens up the roof, jumping into the passenger seat, asking if it's prom season already. Everyone stares at him, and he asks, what, prom season? Limo? Still with no answer, Peter punches the driver, stating, tough crowd. One of the men in the back fires, hitting Peter in the soldier, but the new suit takes the hit and just repairs itself. Peter then quickly shoots a web back, covering up the gun, and then another web at the second man. The men begin to scream, and Peter shouts that they need to settle down, or he will pull this car over right now. The singer, too, begins to scream, so Peter webs up her mouth, telling her that he's sorry, but he already has a little bit of a headache, so... And finally, after stopping the limo, Peter gets out and lets the singer out, and tells everyone that, for the record, they're just friends. An officer pulls up, telling Peter to put his hands in the air, and as he does, he fires a web and swings away. He tells himself that this suit is amazing. Whatever his dad invented is just amazing. First taking that bullet, and he's also stronger and faster. All he has to do is think, and a web appears. Over at the coin laundry, a man fires a gun, running out, telling people that he told them not to move. Peter chases down the man and corners him in a dark alley. But as he crawls down towards him, the man begins to fire, and Peter just knocks the gun out of his hand and throws him into a pile of boxes. He grabs the man, telling him that there's nowhere that he can hide, and as he looks, he sees a flashback to the shooter who shot Ben. Peter mutters that he was the one. He was the one who killed Uncle Ben. The man says that he didn't know that the man that he shot was his uncle, and then Peter screams. The suit begins to grow fangs and a long whip-like tongue. His voice changes as he screams to the man that he doesn't deserve to live! He doesn't deserve life! Peter begins to strangle him, and the man tries to tell him to stop, but suddenly Peter starts to pull the suit away, throwing the man, asking, what's happening? As he struggles, the suit and him struggle to gain control over his body, and Peter runs through the city. After leaping off of a building, he lands on a set of power lines, frying both him and the suit. Back over at Eddie's dorm, he turns on the TV to see a news report on Spider-Man, showing off the new black suit. As Eddie watches, he begins to think that it couldn't be, and then he starts to head over to the lab. Once he gets inside, he sees Peter standing there holding the beaker, and he asks if 
that's him, and then he looks up to see the window opened and a set of handed footprints crawling in. Eddie shouts, what have you done? And Peter tells him it's not what he thinks. Something horrible has happened. The thing that their father's created is uncontrollable and must be destroyed. Eddie grabs for the beaker and Peter lifts Eddie by his shirt and the two stare at each other. After realizing it, Peter sets Eddie back down and Eddie tells him, you're, you're Spider-Man. Peter tells him that that doesn't matter right now. What they need to do is destroy this. He'll explain everything after that is done. A few minutes pass and Eddie tells him that is all that's left of his father. And Peter tells him he knows exactly how he feels, but this, this caused him to almost kill a man. This is a cancer. Even with only spilling a drop, it took over and without his powers, there would have been no way that he could have survived it. There are people out there who would go to extreme lengths to have this and that's why they have to destroy it. Eddie sighs, telling him, it's not like he can stop him anyway. Peter says, look, right now he's the only one who knows about him and his powers. That's how important this is. This stuff is way too dangerous. Eddie takes a seat and he says that he's amazing. He looks 12, but look at what he's accomplished. The two smile and Eddie gets back up telling him that he just needs to go and digest all of this for a bit. He'll be fine. So after Eddie leaves, Peter makes his way over to the power plant to drop the beaker onto a smokestack to incinerate the liquid. But a short while after Peter left to go do that, Eddie returned to the lab. He checks the locker where he keeps the beakers and he sees that it's empty and he says that he really did it. The little jerk took it. He then opens a second locker, stating how if they're going to experiment, they need to keep the specimens separate. And he pulls out a second beaker filled with more black liquid, and he drips it on his hand. A janitor stops by the lab to clean when she suddenly hears a man groaning. She steps into the room to see where the sounds are coming from, and then she finds a smoldering blob, and Eddie's voice all distorted as he says, I'm cold! The woman asks if someone is in there and reaches out to it. The blob lashes out, grabbing the woman, and then shows its fangs as it stuffs her into its mouth. The room falls silent, and Eddie pulls himself up, saying to the room, oh, I'm hungry, but I can't feel anything. I can't even feel my legs. This is all Peter's fault. I need to kill him. I need to kill Spider-Man. The suit begins to wrap itself around Eddie's body and he shouts, I can do this. I can hold it together. But why can't I feel my heart beating? After a bit of struggling, Eddie stands back up. Now with the suit completely covering him and he tells himself, okay. The suit tries to take back over, but then two guards appear asking what's going on. But when they look in, they see a creature standing before them, screaming. One of the guards radios to call the cops, but Eddie grabs the two of them and devours them. The next day at school, Peter sits in class as the rain begins to beat down on the window when he suddenly feels his spidey sense going off. He looks around and when he looks outside, he sees lightning striking and then the image of the suit outside screaming. He asks how the suit shouldn't be there, he destroyed it, but now it's here and he needs to end this. He leaves class, heading outside into the rain to face off against the suit that caused him so many problems earlier. But then it tells him that he shouldn't have lied. Peter watches as he sees a face try to push itself out, and then he asks, Is that? And Eddie pulls himself out, shouting, Our fathers died to create this! Now you will too! Peter tells him, please tell me you didn't do this to yourself on purpose. But without answering, Eddie throws a barbed tendril into attack. Peter grabs it, shouting, this isn't you! This is just the suit! Let me help you! And Eddie shouts, you will die! And he lunges forward. The tendrils wrap around Peter's neck and they slam him into the ground. Peter screams out in pain, trying to free himself, all the while telling Eddie, you can fight this, you have to! Suddenly, Eddie stops and he screams. But as Peter reaches out, Eddie lashes again, knocking him to the ground. Peter tells him, fine, I've had enough of this. He jumps, leading Eddie away from the school, and once they're clear of it, they jump at each other swinging. Eddie quickly overpowers Peter and pushes them off of the building. But as they fall, they break through the power lines, shocking the both of them. They fall onto a passing car, causing the car to crash into the side of a building. Peter gets back up, seeing Eddie knocked out, and as he gets closer, his spidey sense begins to go off, and the suit grabs him. As it begins to pull him into the blob, Eddie asks, How does it feel? How does it feel to be a thief and a liar? But to survive, the suit needs you. It needs to absorb you. Everything begins to fade to black and Peter jumps out of the blob shouting no! But Eddie screams, we need you! Before Eddie can get back up and attack, Peter runs back in with a tire cracking and shattering Eddie's face. As Eddie's body flies over the power lines, the sounds of sirens can be heard and then officers begin to shout for them to stop what they're doing. Peter tells Eddie that he needs to listen, but as the officer sees Eddie in the suit, they open fire on him. Eddie screams out in pain as the officers unload into him, but as he stumbles back, he steps on a live electrical wire. The electricity shoots through Eddie's body and in a blinding flash, he's turned into a burning puddle. The officers all call out to Peter, but he climbs up the building and escapes. 
Elsewhere in the city, Nick Fury sits to enjoy his evening dinner when he receives a notification on his watch. He pays the waiter and he walks over to a nearby alley, and as he stands there, he flashes a light. And across from him, someone falls into the dumpster. Nick asks Peter why he's following him, and Peter pulls himself out and asks, What the hell is that? Nick tells him that it's something that temporarily paralyzes a person. So how long has he been following him? Peter tells him he's not sure since he left their headquarters. Nick laughs, telling him he just followed the leader of the top espionage organization on the entire planet for over an hour. Not bad. So that leads them back to the first question, what do you want? Peter shouts that he doesn't want his powers anymore. Take them, do whatever they need to do to get rid of them. He just wants his life back. Nick looks at him and plainly tells him, no. Now explain what happened. Through his staggered breathing, Peter tries to explain what happened to Eddie and how he tried to stop him, but Nick then asks, where is he now or was he killed? Peter says he doesn't know if he was. And Nick asks, you're not sure if you killed someone? Peter tells him he thinks he did kill him, but the body disappeared. Nick then says that there's not many actual rules in this game, but one big one is that if there's no corpse, then the guy's alive. Peter stops him shouting, look, I don't want this. Do the right thing and end this. So Nick places his hand on Peter's shoulder, telling him, you've had a rough day. The important thing to ask yourself is if doing what you did today made someone's life better. The answer is yes. Stop whining. Once you're older, you're going to be a part of one of the finest organizations in the world. You'll be working alongside Tony Stark, Bruce Banner, and Captain America. While Nick goes on, Peter hardly listens and asks, What about my parents? How do they die? It was 10 years ago. Nick tells him no idea. 10 years ago, he was in college in India. He then tells him, Look, my parents died when I was young too and it sucks. Just go home and watch one of those videos with the girls doing that booty shaking thing. As he leaves, Nick shakes Peter's hand and tells him, Next time he wants to talk, make an appointment or he'll shoot him. Afterwards, Peter decides that he should probably follow back up with the lab to see if he can find some information on Eddie. But what he finds is Eddie's professor, Kurt Connors, drunk at his desk. He tells Peter that it didn't take much to suspect that he was Spider-Man after seeing him on TV wearing the suit, so good on him for that. Kurt then goes on to say they have met before, haven't they? Back when he saved his life when he turned into that thing. Did he happen to tell anyone about it? Peter tells him no, but what exactly happened here? Kurt pours himself another drink, saying how all of everything is gone. The suit, the files, the samples, everything. For a moment, he thought Spider-Man had taken it, but it seems that him and Eddie need to have a talk. Peter explains how Eddie wore the suit too, and then he was, well, he's not sure if he survived. Kurt goes on asking, why is it that people are so hell-bent on wanting to change themselves into monsters, even Ray Parker? He was a genius and an admirable man of science, but really, he was the one who started this whole decade of genetic nightmares. Peter shouts that his father was trying to cure cancer. Everyone, including him, purposely turned themselves into monsters. But Kurt brushes off the comment, telling him, yeah, well, Einstein wasn't trying to invent the atomic bomb. Just worked out that way. As Kurt talks, his speech begins to slur, and he begins to pass out from the drinks. Frustrated, Peter jumps out the window, calling out to Eddie. But even with his spider sense going off, Peter finds nothing. He's left all alone. As class begins for Peter, he sits in his chair, wondering just how is it he's going to get a new costume? With his run-in with Eddie, he's now left costumeless. But since he got his original original costume from wrestling, maybe he can go get another. All of these thoughts begin to pass through his head and Mary Jane stares at him and she scribbles in her notebook, what's the matter, and she nudges Peter. After reading it, Peter scowls, writing back, what do you care? The two go back and forth until finally Peter writes, if you really cared, why are we not together? But before Mary Jane can respond, the teacher grabs her and Peter's notebooks and starts to read the conversation to the class. Everyone begins to laugh at them and Gwen whispers to Peter, Oh, dude. Once class is over, Peter heads out, but before he can leave, Flash stops him, asking if he has a minute. Peter looks around and doesn't see anyone in the hallways and asks for what? Is he just gonna try to pull some prank so that everyone can laugh at him? Flash tells him no, he uh, needs to talk to him outside for a sec. Peter thinks about it for a moment and then says, you know what, no. Everyone's probably outside waiting to see what happens, so no. And he walks off. Kong steps out of class and sees Flash and asks what's going on. And Flash quietly tells him nothing. Later that day, a group of thugs begin to chase down a woman that they're trying to rob. The woman mistakenly turns down a dead-end alley and the thugs start to surround her. As one pulls out a knife, his hand gets webbed up and Peter calls out from the shadows that they must be real happy being walking cliches. Not even a care in the world! Peter jumps out wearing a sweater and jeans and the thugs just stare at him. With no one moving, Peter asks, what? And the leader of the group asks, who are you supposed to be, Spider-Man? Where's the costume? Peter tells him that his mom is washing it for him and the leader lunges forward. Everyone follows behind him, so Peter grabs and knocks the group out while throwing them all into a corner. After webbing the group up, Peter goes back to check on the woman and she just points at his eye. 
He notices that one of his lenses fell out of his mask and he tells everyone not to move. It's a white sliver of glass. A short while later, after trying to fix his makeshift costume, Gwen comes downstairs asking Peter if he wants to go to a party. He tells her that they're both losers, everyone hates him, and she hates everyone, so what's the point? Gwen says they should at least try it and see if anybody else there is having fun at all. Under his breath, Peter says it's only because they're miserable, loner orphans. But Gwen stops him, telling him, screw it, we're going to that party! So as they go to the house party, it's just as Peter said, neither of them are having fun. And just as Peter gets ready to leave, he sees Liz and Mary Jane, but different. She has a haircut and it's dyed black and she's wearing skimpy little clothes. Mary Jane isn't the same girl as before. So as she walks through, she sees Peter out of the corner of her eye, but she doesn't stop. He sighs, telling himself that it's time to go now. And Gwen tells him, absolutely. But no sooner does Gwen say that than a loud boom comes from outside. All of the teenagers run out of the house chanting, Jadolf! When Peter and Gwen get outside, they see a young boy standing on a smoking car, and then he begins to hold his hand up. Light begins to shine from his palm, and then suddenly another car explodes, and all of the kids begin chanting Jadolf's name. But as the teenagers call out for him to do it again, sirens begin to blare down the street. The teenagers start to scatter, and Peter and Gwen run out the back, and that's when they spot Mary Jane and Liz. Peter helps Mary Jane from being knocked over, and the four start running through the crowds. A little while later, though, everyone meets up at the bus stop, and Gwen asks what exactly happened back there. Two other girls say that the kid's name is Jadolf or something, but he goes to their school. While the girls gossip about him, Gwen spots the public bus coming their way and tells everyone to come on. As everyone gets on the bus, Peter and Mary Jane catch each other looking at one another. Mary Jane smirks, patting the seat next to her, and Peter asks, what's so funny? She leans in, whispering that it's funny that he could be home in like two seconds if he wanted, but instead he's riding the bus like the rest of them. He says about that, he may have lost his costume. But as they go on and laugh, Mary Jane reaches into her purse and pulls out a letter. When everyone gets off of their stomps, Mary Jane pulls pulls Peter aside and tells him that she's going to give him this letter that she's been holding for a while. She just wants him to read it when he gets home not before. Peter tells her fine, and she nervously hands the letter over and leaves with Liz. Afterwards, Peter rushes home to read the letter, and it's a letter telling Peter how much she loves him, and that she's just so scared about everything that happened around them. But she wants to find ways to communicate herself better so that they can actually make a relationship work, so she'll be waiting for him to come over if he wants. As soon as he finishes reading, he runs out of the basement and down the street to Mary Jane's house. He climbs into the window and he asks Mary Jane if she means it, and she says yes. She's just so scared. Promise no one else is gonna throw her off of a high building? Peter tells her that he promises, and the two begin to kiss. The next day at school, Peter sees some of the kids spray painting Jadolf rules across the lockers, and he asks himself, how exactly does he rule anyway? As he goes on thinking, Mary Jane kisses Peter on the cheek and asks if everything's all right now. He tells her, of course. But while they talk, Flash asks Peter if he has a second to talk. Peter snaps at him, telling him that he really doesn't have anything to say to him, and Mary Jane adds, shouting that he should just grow up. Flash tries to continue talking, but tells them, fine, it's nothing. And as he walks away, Liz runs up shouting what's going on. She holds out her phone and says that it's her cousin who invited them to that party, and it sounds like that guy, Jadolf, is blowing up more things again. Mary Jane leans into Peter, telling him, you gotta go. But don't worry, I have at least half a costume done for you. Peter asks, what does she mean by half? And Mary Jane says that she needs exact measurements, but it's better than no costume, right? So he changes, and as he steps out, he appears to be wearing a rather loose shirt and sweatpants. And he says it is kind of embarrassing. After leaving the school, Peter swings his way through the city, following the smoke coming from Public School 44. And that's where he finds Jadolf, blowing up more cars in the school parking lot. He lands in front of him, and Jadolf stares at him for a moment and asks, what's this? Peter webs Jadolf's hands, telling him, I'm Spider-Man, and I'm about to stop you from doing something really dumb. Jadolf looks at his hands, and he begins to electrify them, burning the webbing away, telling him, you look better on TV. The cops begin to arrive, and Peter tells him, you know, totally not sticking around to have one of those trademark misunderstandings of the police, so it's time for us to get out of here. Before swinging away, Jadolf grabs Peter, asking him to take him too. They can't arrest him, he'll be sent back home. Peter tells him that's nice, and he shoots a web and starts to lift off. But before he can get very far, Jadolf grabs him by the shirt, throwing Peter off balance. The two fling into the air, and Jadolf loses his grip, and he begins to fall. Peter begins to shout, you're such an idiot, and he webs down grabbing him and flinging him onto a nearby building. As they land and tumble onto the roof, Peter asks, what the hell were you thinking? People already blame me for a bunch of stuff, I don't really need this too. Jadolf starts to get up, telling Peter that he was just trying to teach the principal something about suspending half the football team for going to a party. And Peter asks him, um, what party? Jadolf explains that there was a party the other night, and when the principal found out what happened, he suspended half the football team. So to protest,
test, he blew up the principal's car. And then he got carried away and blew up another one. Peter scratches his head, trying to think of a better word than idiot. Why can't he just fight Doc Ock or something? He then asks what kind of powers does he have, and Shadolf holds out his hand, telling him that he can make things explode. He just says to think, focus, and point. He then points at a barrel, and it explodes! And Peter asks, so you're a mutant? Jadolf shouts that he's not a mutant. You hear me? I'm not a mutant. They are the devil's children! Peter steps back, trying to logically think about how such a power is even possible, and then he tells Jadolf to look. He may want to consider how he's using his powers, or maybe be more responsible with them? Jadolf asks why would he do that, and Peter shouts, what do you mean? Help people! Do something good with those powers! But before the two of them can go on, they hear gunshots and screams coming from down below. They see a store being robbed, and Peter tells Jadolf to just hold on. And as he gets ready to jump off, Jadolf says that he wants to come too. He can help! And Peter tells him no. You will be right here, so just watch. He walks into the store as the robbers are demanding money, and he tells them that they should probably just drop the money and lose the stupid masks. The man in the Captain America mask turns back shouting that he's one to talk and he fires his gunshots. The bullet shoots through, hitting the window, and one of the robbers says, man, he sucks. Peter webs the shooter, telling him, yeah, he really does suck, like, standing right there. After punching out the shooter, the other robbers say that they would like to not be punched, so they just put their guns down. And then Peter says, that's kind of thugs he likes, the kind who just lay down. But before he can finish his sentence, there's an explosion, knocking everyone in the building to the ground. Peter jumps up to check and make sure that everyone's still alive, and then he runs back up to the rooftop. Jadolf asks, you like? And Peter answers by smacking him across the face, asking him what's wrong with him. He could have killed people down there. Jadolf then gets back up, telling Peter that he better step off. But while the two begin to argue again, a female voice asks them if they wouldn't mind. They would like to talk to them. The two turn back to see Jean Grey telling them that they would like to speak with them. They are the X-Men. And Kitty Pride adds, the cute ones. And Storm continues, as seen on TV. Peter whispers to Jadolf, told you that you were a mutant. As the girls continue to introduce themselves, Jean says that she's sorry if they freaked them out or anything like that, but they just needed to talk, and Peter asks why. So Jean goes on explaining that they and the other X-Men are mutant peacekeepers, and their focus is to bring peace between man and mutant, which is why they wanted to speak with Jadolf. Jadolf stares at her, trying to form words, but through his stuttering, he ends up fainting. Kitty leans down, asking if he really just fainted after being told that he was a mutant, and Peter says that he's pretty much in denial of that fact. While Storm and Kitty tend to Jadolf, Jean psychically tells Peter that he did a good job trying to talk to him. Peter shouts, what the hell was that? And Jean continues telling him that they're speaking telepathically. Just think and she can read it. Peter tells Jean that he's not sure he's very comfortable with her in his head. And she says, try not to be uncomfortable. It's really not a big deal. In fact, he's the first guy who hasn't mentally pictured her naked in six months. Peter remains quiet and Jean says, until now. Still being quiet, Peter tells her sorry, and Jean asks if he's done yet. The two go back and forth looking at each other, and Peter says, okay, done. And Jean doesn't say anything. Peter says, okay, now I'm done. And then Jadal starts to wake back up, asking what's going on. He looks up, and Jean telepathically asks if he's okay, so he screams and passes back out. And Jean tells everyone, okay, that one was her fault. Kitty asks, what are they supposed to do? And Storm says that they're not sure if he's even a mutant yet. Peter asks, what? But as he does, Jean psychically calls Professor Xavier. Suddenly, the giant head of Charles appears, and he tells everyone that normally they would go through the proper authorities for this, but it's a special case. However, with him passed out, it is technically kidnapping. While Jean decides to bring him in, Peter asks if that was really Professor Charles Xavier, and Storm tells him that he's already gone. Peter then asks, how does she know? Maybe he's pretend hanging up and staying on the line. As the girls bring Jadolf onto their aircraft, they ask Peter if he'd like to come, and he tells them, you know what? Sure. The jet soars into the sky, and Peter asks Jean if she actually knows how to fly a plane, to which she tells him, legally no. He then asks if she's making a funny, and she tells him yes. But while everyone talks, Shadolf slowly begins to wake back up, and he looks around. Jean senses his movement and shouts that he's awake, and everyone turns back to tell him to relax, but Jadolf shouts for everyone to stay back, and he creates another explosion in the ship. The back of the airship begins to open up, and everyone gets pulled out. Storm flies out, trying to help glide the ship, but with the speed of the aircraft, everyone starts to get sucked out of it. A little while later, Peter begins to wake up and find himself in a bed. He looks around to see Charles, and he introduces Peter to his X-Men, and Beast quietly says, Uncanny. Peter shouts, wait, what? Storm quickly explains what happened. It was that she helped Kitty guide the plane before crashing. Jean then flew out, grabbing Jadolf and saving him just at the last second before he splattered on the ground. Peter blankly stares, and Storm shouts, and you're welcome. As Peter processes everything, he realizes that he's not wearing his mask. Why did they take his mask off? He was trying to keep his identity secret, and no one seems to be respecting that. Now everyone knows that he's just plain old Peter Parker. Kitty smiles and says, actually, we didn't know your name until now. 
After getting dressed and putting back on his mask, Peter heads over to the medical room to see Jadolf to make sure that he's okay. When he does, Jadolf tells Peter that he should totally check out what they did to his nipple. Peter says that he looks uh, a lot happier than last time, and Charles says that he gave him a happy thought. Peter asks Charles if that's even ethical, and Charles tells him honestly no, but he did just lose an aircraft because of this kid. Charles then goes on to tell him that the reason that they wanted to speak with him is because that through Cerebro they can track mutants, but with Jadolf they couldn't, which has never happened before. In fact, it didn't even register to him as human, which leads one to believe that he may have been subjected to some undeserving genetic experiment. So with that being the case, what they need to do is find out who did this and more importantly why. Peter then says, alright, so what are you gonna do with him? Charles tells him that they'll present him to a couple of scientific organizations and they'll present their findings to the UN so that they can basically finally stop the countries that are turning a blind eye to inhumane mutilations. This is really a smoking gun. And Peter corrects him, he. Charles asks what, and Peter points at Jadolf saying, he. We're talking about a human. Peter then goes on to ask if Jajolf doesn't want to be a part of their agenda. He's already a mutant phobic. Charles tells him that at this point, it's not up to him. There are much bigger considerations. Peter says that he's going to try and say that this guy deserves a shot at normal life. And Beast leans in asking, define normal. So after thinking about it, Peter turns around shouting, DEFINE THIS! And he punches Beast! Peter then grabs Jadolf, kicking Cyclops in the head, and he runs out of the lab! Colossus tries to stop him, but Peter just tackles through him and out the window! As he lands, Peter sees Charles standing there asking, What good would that do? Peter then snaps back to reality, back in the lab, saying, What? Well, that would... I... Just a thought. Charles then tells Peter that he's sure that he just read about his work. He knows what him and the X-Men stand for, so he can promise that Jadolf will be treated with respect. Kitty asks Peter if he's going to be okay with all of this, and he tells her that he gets she then asks if he needs a ride back to Queens, and Peter shouts, Oh God, what time is it? A short while later, Peter walks across his lawn into his basement, thinking about how he really needs to stop meeting people that he looks up to. They're all starting to seem kind of crazy. Actually, he probably shouldn't be thinking that. What if Charles Xavier's listening? Before he can wonder any further, May stops him, telling him they really need to talk. It's late into the night in New York when a woman with long silver hair stands atop a building, waiting. Across the way, she watches a man and a woman enter an office until they finally turn out the lights and leave. With a smile on her face, she fires a grappling hook over to the building and begins to slide down the wire over to it. As she gets closer, the woman sneaks into the building when a guard walks out on patrol. Once inside, she then leans over to the locked office where she saw the man and the woman earlier. She pulls out a small device to put into the door lock to override the lock, and after a few seconds, the door unlocks and swings open. Once inside, the woman makes her way to the back where the painting hangs, but before touching it. She uses a spray to create a layer of smoke. The cloud hovers in front of the picture, revealing a laser security line covering the entire wall. She then pulls out a small set of mirrors and after positioning them, creates an opening for the painting. She pulls the painting off the wall and finds a metal safe with no handle and no way to open it from the outside. After searching the desk contents, she finds an out of place folder and pulls on it. The folder lifts and it pulls a string and there's a sudden click. When she looks back to the safe door, it pops open and she reaches in to pull out a wrapped object. After pulling back the cloth, she finds an old stone tablet and smiles. She then sneaks back outside, but before she can leave, Peter Parker asks, Um, what exactly are you doing? The woman turns back, and as Peter sees her figure, he tells her, Wow, you're, um, you're not like the usual riffraff I find sneaking around the rooftops. But without saying a word, the woman jumps off the ledge of the roof, and Peter quickly follows. However, as he leaps, he notices the woman grab onto the wall, and then hops back up onto the roof. As he falls, he tries to fire his web shooters, and nothing comes out. Back on the roof, the woman starts to run as Peter jumps back up, telling her that she would not believe what almost happened. There he was, midair, almost about to die, and then he remembered he had spider powers, and he saved himself. The woman continues to run, and Peter jumps in her way, telling her to hang on. He's not done with his verbal anxiety attack yet. She jumps over him, and Peter jumps again in her way, and with no other choice, she begins to kick and fight off Peter. As the two of them struggle, the woman flips Peter onto his back, telling him that he just crossed the black cat. That's seven years of bad luck. She continues to run on, stepping on Peter's head, and as Peter gets up to chase her, he trips and falls. He looks at the woman, and she just smiles before jumping and disappearing. A short while later, Peter heads back home while Mary Jane tries to fix the web shooters. After playing them for a little bit, Mary Jane fires a web shot and says they seem to be working fine. But then the two of them begin to kiss and flirt, and suddenly they hear Aunt May tell Telling them to come upstairs. Peter asks what's going on, and May says that Mary Jane's father is here. The two run into the kitchen, and Mary Jane sees her father, Craig, holding her diary. She shouts that she can't believe that he would go through her things, and she runs out crying. 
Craig says that he found an interesting story and he begins to read off, I almost died tonight. If Peter hadn't been at the bridge, I don't know what I would have done. What if no one found my body? Craig stares at Peter asking, what did Mary Jane mean by that? Peter stands there not answering and Craig shouts, that's fine. He came here to tell him that he will never see Mary Jane again. They are through. While Craig continues to yell, May steps in stopping him, telling him that it's time for him to leave. He storms out and May turns back to Peter asking what was that all about? He says that it was nothing. They were just at the park and Mary Jane slipped and he caught her. That's all. May then asks, why not just tell him that? And Peter shouts because he's a jerk. He heads up to his room and he notices the news and they seem to be talking about Spider-Man. The screen cuts away to images of him running after the woman earlier and the reporter stating that they have pictures of Spider-Man escaping the scene of a crime with a burglar known as Black Cat. Peter watches and begins to think that this seven years of bad luck seems to be starting right about now. Meanwhile, over at the Fisk Corporation building, William Fisk's lawyer, Walter Dinney, stand with the man who was just robbed, asking where is the tablet? The man says that apparently from the news, Spider-Man has it, and Walter asks, what is he gonna do with it? The man says that he's not sure, but he has a slight feeling that Kingpin took it. Him and his criminal organization were the only ones who even knew about the tablet. Walter tells him that that would be pointless, he was supposed to just give it to them, they have no reason to actually steal it. Walter pulls out a business business card telling him that he's going to give him a number to call. No one will answer but leave a message and someone will call him back with a place, time, and how much money to bring. When they meet, don't talk about anything other than the task of getting back their item. The man says that he's not so sure about this, but Walter stops him telling him that he made a promise to Mr. Fisk. It's best that he does not back out on their deal. The next day at school, Peter sees Mary Jane in the halls and tells her that there was something about him last night and something involving a cat burglar. Mary Jane quietly says that they shouldn't be talking. Her dad was already looking into private schools this morning if they continued to talk. Peter says that her father's bluffing. She can't possibly think that he would do something like that and he goes on to tell her that he can't believe that she is letting him get between them after everything that they've been through. She shouts, what does he want her to do? And Peter shouts, asking what does she want him to do? But rather than say anything, Mary Jane turns to cover her face and leaves. Later at work, Robertson tells Peter that he needs him to enter some personal ads into the database to be posted. So Peter starts opening up letters stating that there's money in some of these. Robertson says that people like to be anonymous when they do these sort of things. And as Peter goes through opening the letters, he finds one with a rather large sum of money in it. Robertson tells him to let's see that for a second and he begins to read off the letter. Spider, spider, I was intrigued by our last meeting. Were you? We should explore this. Meet me over on the roof from last time. The cat. He hands back the letter stating that he doesn't know what that's supposed to mean, but just put it in with the rest anyways. As the night begins to fall, Peter knows what this letter meant. It was meant for Spider-Man, aka him. So he sneaks out to meet with the woman where they met last night. Once he gets there, he sees Black Cat sitting on the roof with two glasses of wine, and he tells her that this is something you don't see every day. Black Cat turns back stating that she's surprised he actually came. She called them out so that they could talk. He seemed rather interesting. He says that she robbed that man last night and then beat the snot out of him. And she tells him that that guy wasn't a nice guy. Beating him up was just kind of a knee-jerk reaction. Black Cat then pulls her mask down and smiles, handing Peter a glass. And Peter tells her that he, perhaps, that he can stay a minute. They both sit down and Peter's spidey sense goes off and a sigh flies through the air. Peter managed to push Black Cat to the ground, narrowly avoiding the sigh. But before Peter and Black Cat have a chance to react, Electra jumps out, throwing shurikens at them. The two scramble to dodge the attack, but one of them flies by cutting through Peter's costume. He shouts, come on, not another costume. And then he stumbles backwards, hitting his head. Black Cat jumps up, blocking Electra's attack, and the two begin to exchange blows. Peter watches the girls fight and asks himself what he's supposed to do. Black Cat is a burglar and the other one, well, who knows what she's doing here? As Electra rips part of Black Cat's costume away, she shouts that she should give back what she stole. Black Cat manages to smack the other side out of Electra's hands, and she shouts that she's not her father. Tell her master that she is not him. Electra tells her that she really shouldn't have done that and kicks upwards, pushing Black Cat away, and then she kicks her in the stomach. Black Cat's body goes flying into Peter, but then she gets right back up and charges into the fight when she's suddenly pulled back. She looks back and sees that her back is wed to the roof, and Peter says that he's gonna take care of this. He then asks Electra, what can they do to, like, make her go away? And would she at least tell them who sent her and exactly what she wants? She kicks at Peter, and he asks if this is going to be a no then. She continues attacking with her sigh, and Peter snatches it from her hand, telling her to come on! However, even without the sigh, Electra keeps swinging, and as Peter jumps away, she kicks him in the leg, sending him to the ground. He grabs his knee, asking what's wrong with her, and Electra grabs him by the arm and flips him over and kicks him off the side of the roof. Peter's body begins to fall down to the streets, and he fires a web and slingshots himself back upwards. But as he climbs, he misfires the web, and he slams into the side of the building. After falling into an awning, he looks up, stating that at least he's not dead. So that's something. He quickly rushes back up the building, and when he gets there, he looks all over the roof and sees that both Black Cat and Electra are gone. He lays down and says, this is nice. And what a Black Cat say? 
say she's not her father? Suddenly the door swings open and a guard steps out shouting, oh my god! Peter tells him to be quiet, he's trying to think here, and back home, the home phone begins to ring. Just waking up, May grabs it mumbling, hello? And the woman's voice asks if it's May. So May asks, who is it? The panicked woman says that her name is Mary Watson. Mary Jane's mother. Mary Jane. She's, she's gone. She packed a bag and she ran away. Is Peter there? She doesn't know what to do. May jumps out of bed and runs over to Peter's room, but doesn't see him in bed. She then rushes over to Gwen's room, frantically shouting and asking, where's Peter? Gwen says that she doesn't know, but suddenly May hears a thump in the kitchen. She hurries downstairs, flipping on the light switch, shouting, Peter! Peter spits up some milk that he was just drinking, stating that she scared the crap out of him. And May then asks, what is he doing? Why is he not in bed? Where's Mary Jane? Peter says that he was just up studying for his midterm. What happened to Mary Jane? May says that Mary Jane's mother called them in a frenzy. She took a bag and now she's gone. Peter runs outside and down the street to Mary Jane's house, but before he can knock, Craig steps out asking, where is she? Peter tries to state that he's here to check on that, but Craig grabs Peter by the shirt, demanding to know where his daughter is. Peter grabs Craig's arm, telling him don't. She ran away because he was making her miserable. Not because of, but Mary breaks them both apart and asks Peter to just please go find her. Peter begins to think back to when Nick Fury told him that he shouldn't tell people who he is, because clearly Mary Jane cannot handle it. He tries to think where Mary Jane could have gone and then it clicks. He rushes over to the old warehouse where he told Mary Jane to go when he rescued her from Norman and he hurries inside. Once in, Peter finds a person laying on the floor and he reaches down to see who it is and as he touches her, Mary Jane flips over screaming asking what time is it. Peter grabs her asking what she's doing. It's the middle of the night and she shouts that she couldn't stand it anymore in the house. She couldn't breathe. She just had to get out of there. The entire night her father just sat there threatening to ship her away and not let her see See him. Peter hugs her, telling her that she needs to go home. And Mary Jane asks if they can just run away and get married. Peter holds her face, telling her not yet. And she tells him that she's going to be grounded forever now. So he hugs her again, telling her that's fine. He's not going anywhere. The next morning at work, Peter dozes at his desk, thinking about what Black Cat said about not being her father. And then an image of Kingpin flashes by. He snaps back awake and he begins to search the company logs for cat burglars. And one name hits, Jack Hardy. Peter reads the article about Black Cat Jack being arrested for being caught and sees him walking into court with his daughter. After a quick Google search, Peter sees the girl's name is Felicia Hardy, and her current employer is Fisk Enterprises. Over at Felicia's apartment, Wilson grabs Felicia by the neck, slamming her into a wall, telling her that she wanted his attention, she's got it now. As Electra holds the side of Felicia's face, Wilson goes on to say to just give back what she stole because Electra is dying to stick many, many holes into her. Peter's voice calls out to Wilson, telling him, boy, I haven't seen you this angry since the Colonel wouldn't tell you his recipe to his secret. Secret Spices. While Wilson and Electra are looking back, Felicia kicks Electra and kicks Wilson in the stomach to break free. Wilson's massive body begins to fall down, so Peter struggles with Electra as she tries to cut at him. He shouts, not the costume! Seriously, I really don't have a spare this time! And then he webs up Electra's face. Wilson starts to pick himself back up and he shouts to Peter that he doesn't know why he's involved in this. He needs to stop interfering with his life. This is too important for you two. But Wilson's words are stopped as Peter webs his face up, telling him to put an extra large sock in it. Peter then jumps at the window, climbing to the rooftop shouting to Felicia that she needs to stop this. They're actually going to kill her or even worse, they're going to kill him. Felicia looks over the ledge and says that he was the one who killed her father. Wilson betrayed him and left him in prison and that is why she needs to destroy him. Everything that he says he wants she will take away from him. This stone tablet is just the first. Peter looks at the tablet stating that he doesn't even know what that is and it's very noble of her wanting to stick it to Fisk but she is stealing. Felicia shouts that he doesn't know her but before she can go on Wilson bursts through the rooftop doorway screaming for her to give it back now. She smiles and throws the tablet off the roof down into the waters below. She laughs, stating that now it's just another rock at the bottom of the river, and she's very glad that he got to see her do it. Then a sigh is thrown, hitting Felicia right in the chest. Electra turns her attack towards Peter, and he jumps off the roof to try and catch Felicia, but she's already gone. Peter hops onto the roof, shouting to stop where, but Wilson, Fisk, and Electra are gone. Later that night, Wilson sits in a hospital bed, saying how he's going to spend every dollar they had for them. He wanted to find the ancient text so that they could find a way to open her eyes again. And on the bed lays Wilson's wife, unresponsive, Responsive. He goes on saying that no matter what, he will punish those who try to stop him. But please, wake up. While everything for Peter seems to have remained calm, S.H.I.E.L.D. wasted no time in gathering up the villains who have taken part in the unauthorized genetic mutations. In their custody is now Otto Octavius, also known as Doc Ock, Max Dillon, also known as Electro, Flint Marco, known as the Sandman, and Norman Osborn, known as the Green Goblin. Since their capture, Hank Pym has been working on these four in an attempt to rehabilitate them, allowing them to try and do some good for once. Outside, though, Agent Sharon Carter escorts Craven the Hunter to containment, explain 
explaining to him that the device around his neck will stabilize genetics if he tries to do anything. Not smart. Craven shouts asking if they know who he is. He is Craven. His face begins to change and he yells as his teeth start to form fangs and Sharon tells the guards to hit the collar. Suddenly the collar around Craven's neck starts to emit electricity, stunning and forcing him to the ground. Sharon goes on telling him, like she was saying, the collar will forcibly stabilize his genetic structure and as he can see, it's not a pleasant experience. One thing he should know though is that the collar does match his strength, so the harder that he resists it, it is possible that it will fry his brain. Back in the holding cells, the guards toss Craven in and Max says that he knows that guy. Is he really a mutant? Sharon tells him no, they keep the mutant terrorists on a whole nother slice of heaven. This is the place for those cute little genetic anomalies, so sleep tight. As Sharon leaves, Craven slowly starts to wake back up and Max calls out that, by the way, his show is really sucky. Craven screams as he runs towards the barrier and he's electrocuted and Max just sits in his cell laughing. Down the hall, Norman sits in his cell asking, why would they bring all six of them together? Otto asks him, what does he mean by six? There's only five of them here. And Norman leans back, telling him, no, there will be six. The next day, the captives are all brought out, and Hank tries to speak with them all again, mainly Norman, since he's been the most silent out of all of them. Hank asks, what is it that made him do all of this? He had everything that he could ever want. A wife, a child, millions of dollars, his own business, legendary scientific acumen. And Norman laughs, telling him, I was just doing what Nick Fury tells me to do. They wanted the Oz formula, the miracle that made me and Otto the way that we are. Hank says, actually, we already have the formula. That and everything that you own was seized the day that you were taken into custody. As Hank goes on, Norman gets angry, and his skin starts to change, and Norman changes into the Green Goblin, breaking out of his restraints. But seconds later, Hank's giant hand grabs him and slams him down to the ground. Hank looks back at the other captives and tells them that at least they know the system works. Six weeks later, Sharon escorts Norman back to his cell after being released from medical and asks everyone to guess who's back and better than ever. And by better, she means completely sedated out of his mind. Max shouts that he doesn't feel very comfortable having Norman around them. And Sharon Sharon tells him to be quiet or she'll stick them both in the same cell. Max tells her, fine, at least take her top off for them. Sharon smiles, telling him sure, and she starts to unbutton her shirt as Max's eyes light up. Sharon stops telling him, psych, and Max grits his teeth, telling her that she will be the first. Otto looks over at Norman's cell, and as the two lock eyes, Otto calls out that he would like to talk to Hank, please. He wants to talk. A short while later, Otto stands before Hank and his team telling him that he just wants to help after seeing what Norman has done to himself. He wants to contribute. He's a man of science, not some monster, so please let him help. Hank stares at him for a moment and says that he'll get back to him on that. And a few days later, Hank walks Otto into their research facility and Otto asks what is the overall focus that they are trying to achieve here. Hank tells him that he may know. The next war will most likely be fought genetically, so they're working on ways to stay ahead of that. Otto looks around and says that it's really good to be back in the lab. And another researcher says that she knows that this might be a bit too soon, but they have a surprise for him. Otto sees the table with his mechanical arms, and the researcher says that those arms have revolutionized high-risk lab working. But as Otto stares at him, he says that it's strange being a man of science, but he wonders if his connection to them is more of a mental connection, like a connection, not just physical. Maybe the explosion that grafted it to him was in fact a method of mentally unlocking his control over them. Otto continues to talk, but soon no one responds. He then looks around telling them that they'll just have to take his word for it. But the arms are already out, stabbing everyone in the chest. Back over in the holding cells, the lights go out and everyone starts to walk out of their cells, wondering what's going on. Flint Marco asks if this means that they can use their powers, and Max sparks his finger, telling him, there's only one way to find out. He starts to emit electricity and he fires a blast, hitting Norman's collar. Norman falls to his knees, groaning. And a moment later, he starts to change into the Green Goblin. Once everyone's collars are disabled, Otto knocks down the door and Norman asks him if he's the one who did this. Otto tells him that it's called telling them what they want to hear, and what he's become is truly magnificent. Norman tells him that they are now even, so it's time for him to get his boy and destroy Nick Fury. And Otto asks, where do they keep your son Harry? Norman asks him, what is he talking about? His boy's name is Peter. All at once, the Ultimates hear their communicators going off, and everyone rushes over to the now-destroyed containment facility. Tony arrives in the Iron Man suit and begins to scan the place for signs of life. After a quick glance, Tony says that there are three signals, and then he asks how many people were in the facility. Nick's eyes go wide as he tells him that there were 38 people here. Tony hurries over to the three signals and says that he found Hank. He's alive, but barely. A short while later, Nick gathers everyone at the shield base of Tristan.
Escalon and begins to go over the footage of the outbreak. He explains to everyone that at the present moment, they are unable to locate any of the captives. The only way to pinpoint them is if they power up again. Dramatically changing their genetic structure would set off an alarm. Nick goes on telling everyone that it's possible that they need to watch out for any past relationships that these people had, or past grudges. And as Nick thinks about it, he realizes that Norman did have a grudge against Peter Parker. Not long after that, Peter sits in his school when a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent pulls him out of class. As the two walk down the hallway, Peter asks him who he is, and he explains that he is Agent Clay Quartermain from S.H.I.E.L.D. Nick Fury had orders to bring him in. Peter then asks, how does he know that he's with S.H.I.E.L.D.? Does he have some kind of identification? Clay holds out his watch, and on the screen, Nick tells him to get his tights and get his butt over there. A short while later, over at the base, Nick brings Peter into the control room and tells everyone that this is Spider-Man. Tony looks at him asking, did he pull him out of time or something? He's kind of young. And Nick shouts, no, this is really him. Before they can get all high and mighty, he would like to point out that he has single-handedly beaten the crap out of everyone who has escaped, and the entire S.H.I.E.L.D. organization couldn't do that. Peter then asks, wait, escaped? Who? And Nick tells him, all of them. Peter shouts that he's got to warn Aunt May, but Nick tells him that he's got that covered. He has agents watching over both May and a Mary Jane. While everyone begins to prepare themselves, Peter says that he needs to call Mary Jane. Norman threatened her, so Nick grabs the phone from Peter and shouts that he just lost 35 people today. That's more than he's ever lost since he took this job. Now, if he won't listen to them, he will ship his butt back to Queens and let him fend for himself. The room falls silent as everyone looks, and Peter says that he doesn't understand. What do they think they're going to do? As Nick looks at the monitor with Norman on it, he says that they'll find out sooner enough. Over in the White House, Mr. Stone, the chief of staff, receives word from his secretary that Norman Osborne is on the line for him. Stone grabs the phone and says that this is Stone, and then he hangs up the phone. He walks into the president's office and says that they have a serious situation with Nick Fury. A few hours later, Nick sits in the Oval Office while the president yells, asking how is it that criminals that he didn't even know about ended up calling the White House. Not only does Norman Osborne want $100 million, but he also wants his company back, his son, an amnesty for himself and a few others, along with the arrest of of Nick Fury or else. Nick Fury asks him what is the what else. And the president goes back to shouting that he's threatening to expose the highly confidential organization for illegally detaining or they will release that information worldwide. He goes on stating how there was a little concentration camp for supervillains behind his back. And now that they were all locked up without any sort of trial or due process, they've also escaped. Nick tries to explain, but the president cuts him off shouting that he has until tonight to get this fixed. Now get out. As Nick Fury walks out of the office, his phone goes off, and when he answers, Norma says that he hopes that he will enjoy prison more than he did. A little while later, Nick heads back over to the base to get everyone ready to move out, and as he suits up, one of the operators shouts that they're currently being hacked. Everyone runs over to the computers, and Nick shouts for everyone to shut down the systems, and then the power goes out. Everyone stands still, and Peter begins to feel his spider sense going off. Just then, all of the lights begin to pop, and electricity shoots out, shocking most of the people. Max then floats down, telling everyone that he hopes they all like it like that. Any remaining agents open fire on Max, but the bullets face through him, and he says that isn't going to work as well as they'd hoped. Suddenly, a rush of wind shoots by as sand begins to cloud everyone's vision. Peter tries to web up Max, but Flint forms a hammer of sand and cracks Peter on the head as he falls. Norman rips off the roof and jumps down, pinning Peter to the ground, and he smiles, telling him, My boy! A little while later, Peter sits in a chair, beginning to hear the voices of Norman and Otto talking. When he opens his eyes, Norman looks down at him, telling him, There's my boy! Peter begins to look around and sees Craven changing shape, and he punches him, shouting, He's just a kid! Otto grabs Craven by the neck with a mechanical arm and slams him into a wall, and Otto tells him to be still. Norman then says, Obviously, Craven is the weakest of us, so he'll do best to keep quiet and behave. Craven wipes the blood from his mouth, telling him, Yeah, okay. Otto then picks Peter back up and sits him down, and Peter asks, Why do you keep calling me your boy? Norman leans down, telling him that it's because he is his greatest creation. If it wasn't for him and Otto, he wouldn't be Spider-Man. Norman then goes on, telling him that together they are all victims of Nick Fury here. And now you are one of us, so let's all make history. Peter breaks free from the chair, shouting for him to shut up, and he jumps onto the wall. He then says that if he thinks for a second that he's going to help him. But Norman then holds out his arm, stopping him, telling him, Aunt May will die tonight. And if you still can't behave, then it will be Mary Jane, and then her family. As Norman keeps listing off things, Peter tells him, fine, okay, just leave Aunt May alone. Back over at the White House, Stone gets another call from Norman, and he asks, how's everything working out? Stone says that he's sorry, but the White House just doesn't work like that. He can't cough up $100 million. Norman cuts him off, telling him, well, that's really too bad. And then he hangs up. 
The president then asks everyone if they got a hit on his location and the lights go out. Suddenly electricity shoots out of all of the electrical devices and then there's a loud boom coming from outside. Soldiers stationed outside begin firing towards the explosion and then another wave of electricity shoots out frying them all. From the smoke and the fire, Norman along with Peter steps out stating that this will do. As everyone walks towards the White House, they all start to hear a loud humming. When they look up, they see the shield helicarrier flying by. Captain America steps up and points to Norman, telling him, You're trespassing. Without even responding, Norman and the rest of them clash with the Ultimates, and all Peter can do is stand there and watch. Norman grabs him and puts him in front of Captain, telling him to do something useful. As Peter nervously pulls his arm back to swing, Captain America asks, What are you doing? Peter stutters, telling him that he has to... Ron May's going to... Peter then grabs onto Captain America and he tells him, Norman won't. We have her up in the helicarrier. While the two of them struggle, pushing each other back, Peter asks, You promise? You swear you have her? And Captain America looks at him and says, Kid. Peter lets go and he looks back to Norman calling him out. Norman shouts that he told him to! But before he can finish, Peter cracks him across his goblin face. He then jumps on top of him, shouting that he's sick of having him in his life. And then one of Otto's mechanical arms grabs and throws him. Peter's body shoots through the field, crashing into the White House. As Peter gets back up, he says, So this is the Oval Office, huh? Back outside, while the fighting continues, Janet flies towards Otto and straight into his mouth. A few seconds later, Otto begins to gag and he falls to the ground. Janet then crawls out, stating that this will make her the first person in history to be totally covered in gingivitis. Elsewhere, Flint Marco beats down on Tony and the Iron Man suit while Tony radios in that he can really use the genetic sequence for Sandman right about now so he can actually fight back. A few moments later, the radio says that the file is sent and Tony gives a blast shooting Flint's head off. Across the field, Captain America bashes Norman, telling him to just give it up. But after pushing him back, Norman shouts, Where is Nick Fury? I'll kill him right here. And as he yells, he suddenly hears Harry's voice call out, Dad! Norman turns around and Harry stands there telling him that he needs to stop. Norman stops and he stands up, saying, Nick has sunk to a new low using my own child. And Harry tells him no. He came on his own, so please just stop all of this. While they talk, Tony watches and tells the helicarrier to go ahead. Load Osborne's genetic sequence. He has a clear shot. Harry then looks back at the White House and sees Peter. Norman stands still and then slowly begins to revert back. When suddenly there's a flash and a bright blue blast hits Norman in the back. And as he falls, he shouts, I'll kill you all! Everyone on the ground begins to focus their attacks on Norman, and Nick walks up to Harry and tells him, This wasn't a part of the plan. Peter rushes down to see Harry, and then there's another explosion in the sky. Everyone looks up to see a giant ball of electricity and then a person fall from it. One of the soldiers asks, Who just won? And as him and Tony aim, they see Thor float back to the ground asking if they're done yet. Peter turns back to Harry, hugging him, telling him that he didn't deserve any of this. And through his sobs, Harry says, all of you. I'll kill all of you for this. Another soldier starts to walk Harry away, and Nick walks up to Peter, telling him that for a number of reasons, he needs to get out of here. They will get him back to New York within the hour. They've got Harry under control. A little while later, Peter heads over to the helicarrier and is told to tell Aunt May that he was also being held. Because of security, he was kept separate from her. She asks if she's like mad or anything, like on a scale of 1 to 10. As Peter and the agent walk into the next room, May screams that she will sue all of them if she doesn't see her nephew right now, right this instant. Peter runs over to hug her, and she tells the agents that she would very much like them to bring her home now. Elsewhere, in another lab loading bay, a cryogenic chamber is activated with the body of Norman Osborn. Captain America says they should just put a bullet in the back of his head. And Nick tells them that they can't, not until they get everything they need from his DNA. As the rain pours down, Captain America tells him that's right, because the next war will be a genetic one. And Nick Fury tells him, yeah, that's right. As the cab driver loads up Aunt May's luggage, May stands by Peter and Gwen's side, explaining that she's going to be gone in Florida for a week. She doesn't want any hanky-panky going on. And as Peter asks, what the heck is that? May tells him that he knows what she means. After the two of them wave goodbye, Peter goes back inside to have breakfast, and he begins to think about how this is a first. For once, there's no earth-shattering drama, no news about some villain attacking New York. Heck, even Jonah is being somewhat reasonable. And while Gwen makes herself breakfast, she has the news playing. The reporter says that they have an interview with Sam Raimi, the man who will be directing the new Spider-Man movie. Peter watches and Sam says that there isn't much known about Spider-Man, but he wants to capture his perception of him. Just imagine that this man was struck by tragedy and he grows up to be a loser and that he puts on a mask and everything changes. As Peter listens to Sam, for the most part, accurately describe his life, he doesn't realize until after that he just ripped the door off the hinges. Meanwhile, over at Rikers Island Maximum Security Penitentiary, Otto Octavius sits in his cell, alone. One of the guards leans in on the cell, showing him a paper stating that there is a Spider-Man movie coming out, and his ex-wife is helping as a consultant to give it a little authenticity. Apparently, she's an expert on deluded, self-important murderers like him, and leave it to ex-wives to cash in on the man's work, right? The guard throws the paper in, saying that he would feel bad if he wasn't a cop killer. And who knows? Maybe you could even go to the premiere! Later, as Otto lies in his bed, he feels a faded thunk-thunk, and he smiles. 
Not far off at the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, two scientists begin to hear a thunk coming from a locker. And they go to check it out. As soon as the locker is unlocked, Otto's mechanical arms shoot out and they begin crawling up into the air vents. The next day at the set of the new Spider-Man movie, actor Tobey Maguire pulls off the Spider-Man mask, shouting that he can't see a thing with this thing on. Just as Sam and the others go out to respond, their words trail off. And Toby looks around to see Peter, the actual Spider-Man, telling him, You suck! And then he points at everyone else, stating, You all suck and you should feel bad! He then jumps around the set, shouting that the movie is totally going to tank, because they're all fake, and their actors can't do this. Peter then stops and asks Sam, How could you do this to me? You're making a movie without my permission, I'm Spider-Man! Sam smiles, telling him, Actually, we don't need it. You're a public figure, so you're public domain. And the producer adds that he even got the rights of Octavius from his ex-wife. The producer then begins asking, What are these men like? What kind of men are Otto and Norman Osborn. Peter begins to feel frustrated that no one is listening to him. He's Spider-Man! He's here in the suit and no one's listening to him! And he shouts, You people just suck! And he webs off. Back on Rikers Island, Otto sits up in his bed and he smiles as he hears the explosions going off and the guards shouting for help. As the mechanical arm slips into the cell, he says, Yes, I missed you too. Now it's time for us to leave. A short while later, in another part of town, Otto knocks on a door that happens to be a man's house and when the man asks what does he want, Otto tells him that he has a really nice house. The man asks, do I know you or something? And then suddenly there's a crash from behind and the mechanical arms begin to crawl in. Otto tells the man, I really like your house. Meanwhile, at school, Kong tells everyone that he just got a part in the Spider-Man movie as an extra! While the students all gather around to listen, Gwen overhears and asks if there's a part in the movie where Spider-Man kills her dad. Everyone just looks at her, and Gwen mutters, This is so stupid! Under her breath that she storms off. Peter and Mary Jane watch, and they chase after her, and Peter tells her that they know it wasn't Spider-Man that killed her father, it was... But Gwen cuts him off, Yeah, it was some guy in a Spider-Man costume, that doesn't matter, it's all Spider-Man. A guy dressed as Spider-Man killed my dad, and now they want to make a movie? about him? Gwen turns and walks up shouting, Yeah! Make a hero out of him! Make a movie! And dolls! Yippee! Peter tells Mary Jane that he could really use a crazy villain to beat the crap out of right now. Back at Otto's newly acquired house, he talks to the mechanical arms as they flip through the channels on the TV and stop in the news. The reports begin to talk about the new Spider-Man movie and how they're lucky enough to speak with Rosalita Octavius, the estranged wife of Dr. Otto Octavius. The camera then switches to Rosalita talking about Otto and how he's a tragic failure. And as the news plays, the mechanical arms rip the TV off the wall and they smash it on the ground. And Otto says, ah, This is perplexing. Up in one of the buildings is Peter, watching as they film, and as the actors start to get ready for a break, there's a loud crash and people screaming. When everyone looks over, they see Otto making his way through, destroying everything in his path. He calls out for Rosalita, telling her how disappointed that we are for what you've done. One of the mechanical arms begins to reach out, but is stomped as Peter webs it up, saying, you can't do this. How could you be out and about doing this to me again? And Otto just looks back and says, Mr. Parker. The mechanical arms begin to grab Peter, and Peter shouts, all of the sucky things you've made me do. Now you're making me fight you so that you don't trash the movie set that I already hate? As the arms flail about, one manages to knock Peter down, and Otto screams at him to just die. The arms then shoot out, and just before it hits Peter, he quickly catches it. And Otto asks, why is it that everywhere I go, Spider-Man is always there? Peter then struggles to push the arm back and says, Because I love you! And then Otto whips Peter into the air, and Peter asks, How is it that you keep escaping? I'm no expert or anything, but I'm starting to really think that there needs to be a security upgrade of these prisons. As Peter tries to fight back against Otto, Otto manages to knock him back into the ground, and then he wraps an arm around Peter's neck. As he's lifted up into the air, Peter says, You've become a much better fighter! Otto then electrifies an arm and smacks Peter with it, stating, We have had a great deal of time to consider how to fight you if we ever met again. Peter asks who this we stuff is that he's already talking about because he's already a whacked out wackety whack job. And one of the actors runs in screaming, Oh God, don't kill me! And both Peter and Otto just stare at him. So then Otto keeps Peter in the air and one of the Spider-Man stuntmen grab a camera and they bash it into the side of Otto's head. Peter asks, Who are you? And the man says that his name is Leroy and this guy has gone and shut down the project. Peter says, Oh, I thought I was getting a revamp or something. Otto then gets swinging his arm, knocking Leroy away. And then Peter catches one of the arms and swings Otto into a production van. Just as he swings again to throw Otto aside, Peter's grabbed by another arm and he's tossed out into the street. Meanwhile, back at Peter's home, the doorbell rings and when Gwen goes to check it, she sees Mary Jane. Gwen opens the door and Mary dances in, telling her that her mother finally kicked her father out. She's not forever grounded from the whole running away thing. She then calls out for Peter and Gwen tells her that he's not really here, he's at work or something. And Gwen says that she'll hang out until he gets back. She needs to relax anyway. But just before before they sit on the couch, they both see the news, and they see that Spider-Man is fighting Otto again, and how Spider-Man's defending everyone. Gwen watches it angrily, and Mary Jane watches, stating that she's gotta go, uh, she forgot something, and she runs out the door. 
However, Gwen notices that there was something strange about that. Back on the set, the fighting brought Peter and Otto into the tunnels where Otto throws Peter against a wall and a mechanical arm quickly grabs him again and throws him into a car. And just as the spider sense goes off, Otto hits him again, slamming him into another car. Peter looks up and then his vision begins to fade. And when he opens his eyes, he tries to move and then he sees that he's duct taped to a chair in a plane that has already taken off. That's when he hears a voice telling him, ah, good, you're awake. Otto walks out of the cockpit telling him that it's a lovely night to be flying, Mr. Parker. I actually thought that you would be grounded for being out this late on a school night. He then pulls off Peter's mask and Peter asks, what kind of goofy goofball thing are you going to do to me now? So Otto hits him with a mechanical arm and Peter shouts, God, you knocked a tooth loose. Otto tells him, I'm sorry about that, but let's take a look. I am a doctor after all. The mechanical arms hold Peter's head in place while another one reaches in, grabbing the wiggling tooth and rips it out of his head. Peter screams and then with another arm, Otto webs up Peter's mouth telling him, this is a cute toy that you have. And I thought that the webbing came out of your body organically. Peter tries to break free, but Otto tells him, You're only here for one purpose, and that's currency. A break glass in case of emergency situation. He sits down telling him, The way I see it, I need something in case I run into any trouble when we land. I have you to be used. But there's one thing that I want to tell you. I hate everything about you. The biggest though is this whole wanting to do good thing. Deep down, you're just a pathetic, immature glory hound. In fact, I'm truly disgusted by you, Mr. Parker. There's always someone standing in my way. Whether it be you, Rosalita, Norman, there's always someone. Someone. Why can't you people just leave me alone so that I can live a decent life? Why is that so hard? Otto leans back and he tells him, Just so you know, you will be killed tonight. They will kill you. And as Otto goes on, Peter passes out from the pain, and the pilot says that they'll be arriving shortly. Otto walks back up to the cockpit, and he hears the pilot speaking to the control tower about the landing. And then there's a sudden BOOM! Otto runs back out to see the door open, and Peter gone from his chair. And he looks outside, screaming, PARKER! Meanwhile, back at home, Gwen doesn't feel quite so right that Mary Jane just up and left at news of Spider-Man, so she decides to go into Peter's basement. While she looks around, she sees Peter's locked chest and breaks the lock with a hammer. As it opens, her eyes widen as she sees the Spider-Man costume sitting inside. Once the plane touches down in Brazil, Otto says that he knows little Parker is out there. He pulls the pilot out, telling him that he did an exceptional job flying under what he is sure was not ideal flying conditions. But they have a little Spider-Man to deal with. The pilot says that he promised that he could live, so... But Otto steps off the plane, and then Peter jumps out of a closet and kicks him onto the runway. Otto scrambles to get up, but Peter punches him down, telling him, You had this coming! He then and jumps onto Otto, smacking him down with his own mechanical arm, asking, Are you gonna whip out yet? And then one arm crawls up from behind, throwing Peter into the air, and he lands on one of the plane's wings. When Peter gets up, he looks at the airport sign, and now that he's able to read it, he says, Oh, man, I'm not in America, am I? I am so gonna be grounded. Otto gets back up, and he starts to swing at the airport personnel. And so Peter jumps in, punching him back to the ground, telling him to just stay calm. Suddenly, Peter hears the sounds of guns cocking, and soldiers start running at him, yelling in Portuguese. He tells them that he swears that he'll do whatever they want if they just say it in English. And then from the crowd, a woman steps forward asking if he's really the American Spider-Man, and if so, what is he doing here? Peter points to Otto, telling them that it was this guy's fault he kidnapped me to go wherever the heck this place is. And the woman tells him he's actually in Brazil. Peter then turns to the pilot, stating that he knows that he's had a bit of a rough night, but could you help me out and bring me back to New York? That'd be great. The female captain says they're not going anywhere. They still have reports to fill out. So Peter shouts, no, you don't understand. I have to get home or I'm going to be in so much trouble. But before they can be taken away, a passing plane gets ready to take off. Just before lifting up, Peter hops onto it and sticks to the plane. And then from hopping from plane to plane, he finally gets back to Queens. Peter rushes home before Aunt May is supposed to get back, and he sneaks into the basement. And just as he pulls his mask off, he sees Gwen standing there crying, holding a gun at him. And through her crying, she says that it was him. Wasn't it? He's the one that killed her father. Peter asks, where did she even get the gun? And she shouts that it was her father's. She goes out screaming that it was Spider-Man. Spider-Man killed her father. He shouts that it wasn't him. It was the other guy in the Spider-Man costume. And then the two hear the front door open as Aunt May gets back from her trip. Peter quickly snatches the gun, and he tells Gwen that she needs to listen to him. He didn't kill her father. Yes, he's Spider-Man, but he would never kill anyone. Plus, he was with her the day that it happened. Her dad was in Atlantic City. They were here. There's no way that he could have been there. And he tells her that she needs to please believe him. No one knows about this, and Aunt May cannot handle this sort of thing. As May continues calling, asking who's home, Peter slowly removes his hand from Gwen's mouth. She doesn't say anything, and then she turns to leave, slamming the basement door shut. May calls out asking if anyone is down there, and Peter comes up stating that he just fell asleep at his computer. He's sorry for not coming up right away. May tells him it's all right, and then she sees the bruise on Peter's cheek. She asks what happened, and Peter says, oh, he got hurt at the gym. A tooth even popped out, but it's fine. May tells him it's 
is not okay. They're gonna set up an appointment to have the dentist look at that tomorrow. The next day, Peter laid in bed as Mary Jane comes home from school. She tries to gently wake him, but he jumps up shouting, don't! And he spits out bandages from his mouth. Both scream, falling back, and Peter says, oh, hey. She hugs him, telling him that she was so worried. Everyone's been talking at school about the whole fight. And then he says, actually, was Gwen at school? Mary Jane says, no, why? Peter tells Mary Jane that Gwen found out, and Mary Jane quietly says that she may have looked a little suspicious, running out of the house when the news was showing him fighting Doc Ock. Peter sighs, asking what is he supposed to do now, and a voice says that she was gonna find out sooner or later. Peter sees Gwen and asks, where did she go? She tells him that at first, just to the backyard for like an hour, then to the movies and the library. Mary Jane asks what she's doing there, and Gwen says she was just reading up stuff on Spider-Man and her father. Peter asks that she knows that he didn't kill her father, right? And Gwen says, yes, yeah, sorry, she kind of wigged out on him like that. Peter brushes it off, telling her not to worry. They're all kind of spazzing out. So Gwen jumps on the bed, stating that this all makes so much more sense now. The reason Peter Parker is a total flake. And Mary Jane says that he was a flake before this whole thing happened. Gwen then says that he knows that she wasn't going to shoot, right? And Peter says, yeah. He has spider sense that lets him know when something dangerous is about to happen. Just don't tell anyone. So as everything for Peter is wrapping up, later the night at Stark Industries, Shield soldiers begin to gather, and a van pulls up. And from it, Otto is escorted to where Nick Fury is standing. Nick introduces himself to Otto and tells him that one of the decisions that he made was to keep the mechanical arms intact while their scientists examined how they worked. But as of now, they know that that was a mistake. They have misjudged how strong the connection he had to them was. So that is why he's being brought here and sedated enough not to control them. But not so much as to pass out. Nick then gives an order. The mechanical arms are dropped into the vat of molten metals. And Otto shouts, No, it was all him! They had nothing to do with this! And Nick tells the guards to go ahead and take him away. But before leaving, Nick looks into the fire and tells the guards to just keep an eye on those things, just in case. It was a rainy night in New York as Peter swings through the city following a group of police cars that are responding to a hostage situation. He says that he's collecting water in places that he didn't even know he had. Actually, that's not true. He did fight a man made out of sand, and then he had sand in the very same places. As Peter and the police arrive on the scene at the museum, Captain Jean DeWolf calls over the speaker that it is very important that he does not hurt anyone in Inside, and if he does, their deal is off. The voice of the gladiator shouts, Free Nurhachi, or the blood will fill the streets! And Jean asks, Who? Gladiator shouts that Nurhachi will be given freedom or everyone who hears him will die! And he crushes the phone. Peter appears behind him telling him that he should really pick on some of his own size. And as Gladiator turns back towering over him, Peter says, Stay right here. I will, uh, go get someone that is your size. Gladiator then pops blades out of his gauntlet stating that the Emperor has given the signal. They shall battle for Nurhachi! Peter asks how many voices are rattling around in there. And then his spider sense goes off. The blades from Gladiator's gauntlets shoot out and Peter jumps out of the way onto Gladiator's shoulder, bashing him in the head. Before Peter can even do more damage though, the blades spring out of Gladiator's shoulders, and before Peter can jump away, Gladiator grabs him by the leg. With a powerful swing, he slams Peter down into a display, and he pops on more blades. The blades start slicing at Peter's stomach and leg, and just as Gladiator moves into attack, Peter webs up Gladiator's face and cracks a metal stand across his head. He then continues to bash the stand down on Gladiator when the police charge in, shouting for everyone to get down. Peter looks up, stating, look, I'm kind of leaking here from the rain so I'm just gonna go. But one of the officers shouts, you're not going anywhere. As Gene steps in telling everyone to lower their guns, Peter says that he's real sorry, cop person lady. He's allergic to jail and he's gonna be on his way. He quickly jumps over the police, still suffering from his wounds, and he turns to the only doctor that he knows, Curtis Connors. As Dr. Kurt Connors enters his lab from a night of not being able to sleep well, he sees Peter's shadow and he asks what he's doing here. Peter tells him that he once said he owes him, right? Well, he is a doctor and he just needs to borrow the doctor part. Curtis tells him that he's not that type of doctor and that he he should really go to an actual hospital, but Peter tells him, sure, just let me go get my insurance and that's my other costume. But as he says that, he begins to cough. So Curtis starts stitching up Peter and he continues to cough. So Kurt says that he really needs to not be running around in the rain in his underwear. He doesn't look so good. Peter coughs, telling him, yeah, I don't look, you don't look so great either. And Kurt says, well, yeah, I couldn't sleep. I was just going through some adult stuff. Peter jokes, telling him, at least you're not the lizard, right? But after seeing Kurt's scowl, he says it was a joke. Once Kurt is finished, he tells Peter that he should probably drive home, but Peter says, it's all right, he can get there much faster by web. So he hands him a sweatshirt, telling him to at least take this. He then asks if there's anything that he can do to help with whatever is going on. Any miracle scientific breakthroughs on him? Peter looks back and smiles and says that he is the scientific miracle. But adios, muchachos! As Peter heads out, Kurt begins cleaning up the examination table, stating that he's just going to rip those stitches out again. And then he notices
notices the blood on the table. Being a man of science, Kurt takes a sample of Peter's blood and he examines it. And he smiles. The next day at Kurt's lab, Kurt's assistant Ben Riley arrives in the lab to find Kurt sleeping at his desk. Seeing that Kurt had some experiments going on, Ben goes to look in the microscope and he sees Peter's sample. His eyes wide and stating, wow. And then Kurt jumps up shouting gibberish. Ben calms him down, telling him that he just fell asleep at his desk again. He really needs to stop doing that. And then Ben asks, what is on that slide that he was looking at? It's amazing. Kurt jumps up shouting, well, that was nothing, but it's just the beginning of something. But please, don't ask me about it. It's not ready to be shown. Meanwhile, back at the Parker home, Peter is staying home recovering from his recent wounds, and now he's got a cold. As he flips through the morning TV shows, he asks, is this really what people... Oh, Bikini Girl. And then he lays there, and the phone rings. Kurt asks if they can talk. It's really important. And Peter tells him, actually, he stayed home from school because he isn't feeling well. And Kurt says that's fine. He can come there, but they really need to meet. It's really important. So Peter sighs, telling him, no, I'll just meet you. A short while later, over at the coffee shop, Peter tells Kurt that he's like four minutes away from a coma, so whatever it is better be important. Kurt says that now he doesn't want him to be mad or anything, but the other night there was some blood left. And Peter stares at him. What did you do? Kurt assures him he did nothing. All he did was look at it. And then Peter asks, oh god, am I gonna be okay then? Am I gonna die? And Kurt laughs, telling him, no, actually what I saw was amazing. He holds out a notebook with a diagram of a normal person's DNA compared to Peter's, and he says that whatever made him become him is an amazing scientific find. That's why he wanted to ask him that with his permission, could he run some experiments on the sample? Kurt goes on saying that something happened on a genetic level and it's possible to use that sample to help others. Things like gene therapy, stem cell research, cures to illnesses, fight diseases, and Peter adds, cancer. He then says that his father, before he died, was dedicated to finding a way to cure cancer. So maybe that could be inside of him. Kurt tells him that it's possible that it could be nothing, but he's not a stupid man. He knows something when he sees it. For a long time, he's been at the end of his rope. But this, there's hope. And that's why he's here, asking for permission and running the experiments. Peter thinks about it and Kurt continues saying that they might find nothing. And maybe that's it. But it's almost like they have a responsibility to try. Hearing those words, Peter says, okay, you can run the experiments. Two months later, Peter heads out to stop Punisher Frank Castle from killing a robber. And he ends up cutting himself in the process. Peter heads over to Kurt's lab to get patched up and he says that he's looking real good today. Kurt laughs, telling him that they finally got their funding for the year and things have been going well. Peter tells him that's awesome. So about what we talked about before, can I see it? Kurt tells him, yeah, but can we do it tomorrow? He's actually on his way to see his kid for dinner. Peter tells him, sure, it's fine. He goes on stating that, you know how science nerds get. They get into it and they'll be there for an hour. Peter tells him, yeah, he's actually late himself, so he'll stop by again. As Peter leaves, Kurt heads into the next room and tells Ben that he's going to head out and then he asks how everything's going. Ben says that everything's going smooth, though he thinks that it should be up to 86 degrees. He's a bit worried about the next incubation stage. Ben then gets up, telling him that he's gonna go out for a walk. He needs to get something to eat. And as the two leave, over in the incubation container, a red hand forms, and through the murky liquid, a figure begins to take shape. A little while later, Ben returns back to the lab to see that the test sample has disappeared. He looks around quickly and frantically, and he finds the cap to the container has been removed. He quickly calls up Kurt, asking if he's taken a little Ben. And after being told no, he says that they may have been robbed, though he didn't tell anyone about it. Before the two can go on, there's a scream from the lobby, and Ben runs outside. Everyone gathers around, looking at something. And then when it reaches them, he sees one of the security guards look as if his insides have been sucked out. Later that night, a couple begins to walk home after seeing a movie, and they notice something hiding in an alley as they're passing it. The man says that whatever it is, it looks hurt, and the woman asks if they should help. The red figure shuffles out, and then it holds out its hand, shooting a red tendril in the man's face. Suddenly, the man's body is forcibly pulled into the alleyway, and as the woman screams, she too is grabbed. She screams for someone to help, but the tendril pulls and drags her into the shadows, and then there's a loud chunk. A few seconds later, after absorbing the nutrients, from the couple, the red figure stands up more like a human figure and it screams! And then the red figure falls to its knees looking at its hands. Suddenly the vision of its hands starts to change into Peter's hands. And then the memories begin to play. The memories of Peter and all of the things that he's seen and done. The figure screams and starts to mimic itself as Peter when he's in costume, webbing and swinging throughout the city. But there's one flash that stood out, and that was Peter's house. Over at Peter's house, Gwen returns after a day at the mall and realizes that she's forgotten her keys. She heads around the back to see if Peter's in the basement, but as she gets there, she finds that it is also locked. And that's when she hears something behind her. She asks if it's Peter, but without answering, the red figure comes out of the bushes. Gwen says no while trying to back up, but the figure opens its mouth and it grabs a hold of her. Gwen struggles to get free and then a tendril shoots into her mouth and begins to drain her. Just as Gwen's vision begins to fade, she sees the creature's face begin to form and take Peter's face. The tendril then pulls out of Gwen's stomach and the figure vanishes, leaving Gwen's body in the grass. A short while later, Aunt Meg returns home from work and begins calling out asking if anyone's there. With no answer, she figures that she'll just make some food for Peter and Gwen when they get home. And as she looks out at the window into the backyard, she sees Gwen's body. Over the Daily Bugle, Peter finishes reading the article that Jonah posted that Spider-Man has actually done some good 
because he stopped the Punisher, and then the phone rings. Peter answers it and tells Aunt May hello, and she tells him what she found. Peter hangs up the phone, and he rushes home to see the cops and the EMTs on the scene, and he starts to push his way through the crowd. As he gets to the backyard, he sees Gwen's body covered, and he overhears Aunt May talking to some of the police. As Jean arrives, she speaks with some of the other detectives and says that it's a shame. The same thing happened earlier today at the Empire State University lab. Once all of the police leave, Aunt May tries to get a hold of Gwen's mother, but she isn't having much luck. Mary Jane's mother offers to let Peter and Aunt May stay with the Watsons for the night, and Peter says that that might actually be a good idea. Later, as he sits on a fold-out couch, Mary Jane comes down with a pillow asking if he knows who did this. Peter says that he's not sure. He's not even sure if this could be related to him being Spider-Man. Mary Jane leans back, telling him it's awful. She may be the last person to have talked to her. Earlier at the mall, they ran into each other, and they had a totally cool talk, like they were really becoming friends. Peter then asks her what's the point of all of this if he can't stop the people around him from getting hurt. As Peter begins to cry, Mary Jane hugs him until he falls asleep. However, a short while later, Peter sits back up, thinking about all of the possibilities of who could have done this. The detectives mentioned that it could have been a mutant. So was it Wolverine? Otto Octavius? Norman? And then he remembers something that Jean mentioned. The same thing happened at Empire Stacy University. And then an image of Kurt Connors as the lizard crosses his mind. He gets up and he looks at the window towards his house and he sees Kurt standing there. He grits his teeth and he heads outside, punching Kurt, calling him a monster. He jumps on top of him, hitting him, shouting, what did you do? What did you do to my life? And as the rage begins to take over, Peter picks Kurt up and Kurt tries to explain that there was an accident at the lab. Peter sets him down, asking, what accident? And Kurt goes on telling him that they inadvertently created a rejuvenating organism and it escaped. Peter shouts asking him, what did you do? And Kurt explains that they were running tests and splicing the DNA with things and none of it was working. So they dug through some of his father's old notes until they found something about cell reconstruction. Peter looks at Kurt stating, you spliced my altered DNA using my father's stolen work just to see what would happen? Kurt remains silent and Peter tells him, that is the most disgusting thing I could have ever imagined. And then there's a rustle from the bushes. Peter's spider sense begins to go crazy and then out of the bushes walks the red creature. As it walks forward, its face begins to change, and as its face starts to look like Peter's, it tries to talk. Peter stumbles back shouting, and the creature starts to change back and screams as it shoots a tendril forward. Peter narrowly dodges it, and then he jumps back trying to fight off the creature. He shouts for Kurt to get back to his lab and find a way to kill this thing. But once he's done, if he hasn't found a way to kill it, he's gonna lock the two of them into a room together. Peter grabs a hold of one of the tendrils, and he pulls the creature up to a roof to get it away from the people, while Kurt speeds off. As the two of them struggle, the fighting brings them into the city, where they both crash into different buildings. Peter gets up looking down asking what has Spider-Man brought into this world? That thing has his face and it's killing people. He's failed at what he's supposed to be doing and that's help people. As the creature gets up it looks at Peter and it starts to escape. So he chases after it and just as the creature lands on a police car, Peter follows shortly after slamming it back down. The creature throws Peter away and the two officers of the car belonged to open fire. The bullets shoot through the creature and then it throws two of its tendrils at the officers. Peter gets up and he watches the creature absorbing them and then it changes again, this time into a much more fully formed body. Back over at the lab, Kurt rushes inside and as the doors open, he sees Peter's shadow standing there. He asks what happened and Peter stares at him telling him, it's done. The creature grew and formed and we fought. The more that we fought, I started to see its face and it was my face. It was my father's face. And then there was a moment of hesitation, but deep down I knew what I had to do. So I brought the fight to the smokestacks and threw the creature's body inside. After falling into the fire, the creature tried to pull itself out, but in the end it let go. As Peter finishes the story, Kurt says that he's sorry that he had to. And then Peter grabs him shouting, Sorry? He pulls his fist back shouting, You murdered these people! You killed Gwen! But before Peter can hit Kurt, he lets go and silently says, You killed Gwen! A little while later, down at the police station, Kurt walks in and tells the detectives that his name is Kurt Connors, and he thinks he may have accidentally murdered people. Back over at Mary Jane's house, the alarm clock shows 7.42, and Mary Jane wakes up to see Peter just sitting there. She asks if he got any sleep, and then sees his face covered in dirt and scratches. She then asks if he caught the guy who did this, and he tells her yeah. She says that she could have gotten him his costume, and he tells her no. No no more costume, he's done. She then says, done with what? And he says, with Spider-Man, no more. However, back at the lab, Ben arrives for work when he sees the officers going through Kurt's research and he asks what's going on. The dean of the school says they're shutting down the lab. The experiments that Kurt was working on is what killed those people. She also regrets to inform him that as of now, he's currently out of a job, so go get his things. Ben heads over and begins to pack and then he opens up a fridge of test tubes. He pulls one out and it has a label, Parker sample number two. He tucks it away in his coat and he closes the container. As the sun rises over the Parker home, Peter can hear Aunt May shouting for him to get up or he's gonna be late. He finally comes downstairs and he looks around asking what the hell is going on and May tells him that she knows that they're not moving yet, but getting a head start on packing is a bit more relaxing. As May goes on talking, Peter doesn't respond to her and she tells him that someone's awfully grumpy. Peter heads downstairs and starts to look around sniffing things. 
Before he can go anywhere though, Mary Jane flips on the light stating that the whole point of having a boyfriend is to have someone to walk to school with, so hurry up and get ready. Peter looks around asking, school? And Mary Jane says that it's not her most ideal place for a date, but that's the best that they can do for the day, and she kisses Peter. As she hugs him, Peter just smiles awkwardly. Meanwhile, in a dirty motel room, Logan, the man known as Wolverine, begins to wake up asking, what the heck is that smell? Logan looks around at his arm asking, what is this? Why am I so hairy? He jumps out of bed, running to the bathroom, asking himself, what is going on? And then he looks at his arm as his claws pop out, stabbing through it. Back over at the Parker home, Mary Jane asks Peter, what does he mean by he's not going to school? Is something going on? Is that a Spider-Man thing? Peter asks, what? And then tells her, yeah, go get the costume and leave it here. As Peter closes the door to the basement, Aunt May shouts to Peter that he needs to answer her when she calls for him. There's someone on the phone from the Daily Bugle. He grabs the phone and Logan shouts, What the heck did you do? What mutant freak thing did you do to put me in the hairy beast of a body? And why are you stinky like a dog? Now that we've figured it all out, Logan is in Peter's body and Peter's in Logan's body. Logan, in Peter's body, says, Look, kid, I really don't know what's going on either. And Peter, in Logan's body, says, Whatever is happening, you need to go to school for me. Now, to keep things less confusing at this point forward, we are going to be referring to Peter as Peter, and we'll be referring to Logan as Logan, but regardless of the body that they are in, that is how we're going to be referring to them. So when I say Logan, I mean Logan in Peter's body. So just so you know what's going on. Logan tells him, no. And Peter shouts, I've already missed too many days. Just go to school. I'll meet you there. As Peter yells, he mistakenly pops the claws out, cutting the payphone in half, as well as cutting off his own pinky. Peter shouts for someone to help him, and then he sees the pinky growing back, and he says, uh, well, never mind. And he runs off. A little while later, Logan walks around looking at the cheerleaders, and Mary Jane tells him to wipe the drool off. Logan asks if they're really allowed to wear those sort of things. And Mary Jane shoves him in the back, asking, what the hell is your problem? And she storms off. Logan takes a look at the costume and says, that isn't happening. As he wanders around the school, a security guard tries to stop him, asking why he's in class. Logan turns the corner, and the guard chases after him. And when he does, he doesn't see Peter, because Logan is hanging off of the wall, waiting. But not knowing how to control Peter's powers, they end up failing on him. He gets up after hitting the guard, and Peter runs in, shouting, stop it! What are you gonna do, kill him? As Peter stares at him, he says, oh god, you are are in my body. What kind of mutant? And Logan stops him, telling him, how do I know it wasn't you that did this? Peter points and shouts, and a claw pops out, hitting Logan. And Logan asks, the hell is that buzzing? Peter then explains that it's his spider sense, but look, we can figure this out. Right now, we just need to go to class. And Logan tells him, fine, and he heads in. As Peter waits for Logan to come back out, he sees a group of men driving by the school, shooting at the police. Peter, still thinking that he's in his body, runs in to try and stop the men, but he ends up jumping and bouncing off of the thug's car and landing on the police car, which then causes it to plow into the thug's car. He looks up seeing the thug's car flying towards him and he says, this is gonna hurt. And back inside of the class, all of the students watch the accident. And Logan quietly says, idiot kid. As the cops surround Peter, they tell him to freeze and he tries to tell him I'm totally cooperating and stuff. And another cop shouts for him to put his hands up. So Peter does and he accidentally pops the claws out again. The cops tell him to put those away and they retract, but then they pop out again. And Peter says, oh nuts. He looks at the cops. I'm really sorry, but I have to go. And he starts to run and then the cops taser him. A short while later in the jail cell, the cops hand Peter the phone telling him that he gets to make one call but no sudden moves. Peter takes the phone and he calls over to the only place that he knows that might be able to help, Charles Xavier's school. Kitty answers the phone and Peter asks who is this and Kitty says, who's this, Logan? Peter says, look, I'm the guy you met before, it's me Spider-Man. And Kitty says, right, say hi to the Hulk for me. Peter shouts, I'm serious, I'm stuck in the body of your teammate. I just woke up and suddenly I was like this, we switched bodies or something. Kitty listens and then bursts out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Handing the phone to Storm, stating that she just can't. As Storm answers, Peter gets frustrated and pops the claws, cutting the phone in half. He then looks up and sees the cops all pointing their tasers, and they shock him again. A little while later, Peter sits up in his cell, stating that, all things considered, it's nice here. And then the sounds of guns going off rings throughout the jail cell. Peter sees Logan fighting all of the cops, and as the gun goes off, Peter watches and gets caught in the crossfire, and it hits him in the head. Peter shouts, what did you just do? And Logan tells him, look, pop out a claw and jam it into the lock so that we can get out of here. Peter asks, how? I can't even control these things. And Logan says, just think about it and flick. Suddenly, a single claw pops out and Logan says, there, now punch the lock. Once the two of them get outside, Logan tells Peter to hang on a second and he pulls the bullet out of Peter's skull. He goes on saying, look, bub, you're taking really bad care of my body. Peter ignores him asking, where's the rest of my costume? And Logan says, I am not wearing your stupid costume. I'm done wearing this mask. It's smelly. You want to talk about smelly? You need to do a full body shampoo and wash everywhere. As the two begin to argue again, an explosion goes off and the sounds of people screaming can be heard. Peter says that they need to stop this and Logan shouts, no, we're in the middle of something here. Peter leaves up to the ledge of the building telling him, I'm sorry, come with me or not, I gotta go. 
go. Down on the streets, the bank robber destroys the car, shouting that he'll do it again, but this time in their faces. So Peter jumps down, and the robber sees Logan, and he says, oh no, not again. As Peter tries to be nice to the guy, Logan tells him, hey, I got an image to keep over here. The two begin to bicker yet again, and Logan webs up the robber and then flings him towards them. Peter cracks the man in the face, and before they can get back to each other's throats, Peter and Logan see Gene and the rest of the X-Men appear. Gene walks over to Peter, saying that she told him to stop hitting on her. And Peter asks, what? Gene, realizing what's happened, turns back to Logan, shouting that she told him that the next time that she would do something mean with her incredibly powerful psychic powers. And Logan asks, you did this? We'll put us back together. And Peter shouts, you guys have totally ruined my life. Jean puts her hands on Peter and Logan's heads, and she puts the two of them back in their original bodies. And Peter shouts, God, you know why people hate you guys? It's not because you're mutants. It's because of, insert long string of censored insults. As Peter jumps away, Colossus asks, why did I get called that? I was just standing here. And a little while later, Peter heads back home to find Mary Jane waiting for him, and he tells her that he's sorry. Kind of wasn't himself today. She hugs him, telling him it's okay. It's just the thing that he tried to do this morning. He should probably wait until they're a bit older to do that. Now, now, the only real significant thing that you need to know about over the last four volumes is the fact that Peter broke up with MJ. And as Peter struggles to breathe, having three metal rings constricting around him, he says that it's going to take a lot more than that to embarrass him in public. Actually, maybe not a lot more. Ringer shouts, did you really not think you were ready for me? Straight up, I'm from Waldorf, Maryland. He starts to throw more rings, and Peter dodges them, asking, what does that even mean? Says, when did being from Maryland ever be cool? Ringer then tells him, that's right, chuckle it up, mutie. I'm gonna be walking out there with all of these diamonds and Kitty Pride then floats down behind Ringer telling him you really need to knock it off with the whole racist thing. Ringer turns back firing his rings at her and as they face through Kitty Pride because her power is the ability to face through walls, solid objects, and just about anything else, she tells him that as he can tell, his whole shtick won't really work for her. She grabs and starts phasing through Ringer looking to short circuit his suit but Peter calls out telling her that he's actually having a bit of a problem trying to breathe here. Kitty runs back over to Peter telling him him that this might feel a bit weird so a few seconds later she takes Peter by the shoulders and phases him through the rings and Peter says thanks now I have no shirt Kitty laughs telling him that's a bonus for her then and now their hula hoop guy is getting away so he should probably web the crap out of him up ahead Ringer starts running but before getting away a wall of web is sprayed all in front of him Ringer turns back to attack and Peter webs up his hands but rather than stopping Ringer continues to try and generate more rings as he does Kitty sees that she couldn't short him out because of the device on his back. However, as Ringer boosts his power, he ends up blowing up the pack as it's aimed towards Kitty. Peter shouts for her to get back, but after the explosion, Kitty says that he really needs to remember that her phasing power lets her not get hurt and stuff. Peter tells her, sorry, just a uh, knee-jerk reaction. He puts back on his shirt and Kitty says that she notices something on Ringer's butt. She pulls out his wallet and asks what kind of a supervillain brings this to a robbery, and then she proceeds to flip through it. She starts to laugh when she says the guy's name is Anthony Davis. He's from Medina County, Iowa. The officers start to arrive on the scene, and Peter says that this is probably where they should, like, get the heck out of here. And a short while later, in Peter and Kitty's abandoned warehouse hideaway, Kitty asks Peter if something's wrong. It seems like he had a bit on his mind today. Peter tells her, yeah, it's his aunt. He really doesn't want to have to tell her that he's Spider-Man. It would really just be too much for her. Kitty tells him that, like, 80% of the things that happen, happen because he's Spider-Man. All she wants to do is be able to go to the movies and, like, hold hands. She then says that he should start to think of it this way. If his aunt knew that he had a girlfriend, it would give him more excuses to not be home and off doing superhero stuff. Peter asks if they would hide that she's a mutant, and Kitty tells him no. She doesn't hide the fact that she's an X-Men. But before the two of them can go any further, the remote-controlled X-Plane arrives to take Kitty back home. Peter says that he really needs to get a robot-controlled plane sometime. And as the two of them say their goodbyes, Kitty asks if he still likes her, to which Peter simply kisses her. But before that could go any further, Kitty phases through, stating... Uh, didn't know how to break up the kiss, so hopefully that wasn't too freaky. A short while later, as Kitty arrives back at the X-Mansion, she notices that there's no one home. After setting down her bag in the kitchen, she sees Logan appear, and she happily says, You came back! Without saying a word, Logan pulls out a knife, and he lunges at her! She quickly phases through, and then she runs into the next room, where she's shot with a bolt of electricity. She then asks if that's Aurora, and Storm asks, What's that? Is that even a word? Whatever. And then she shoots another bolt of electricity. Kitty phases down to the lower levels and runs into the control room accidentally shorting out the control panel. The doors to the room start to open and that's when Kitty looks back to see the automated controls are still active and she pushes a button. Back at the Parker household, Aunt May tells Peter that she's going out for a bit. So the group of friends from work, so Peter smiles, telling her, have a good time. And after she leaves, he notices the X-plane hovering over the warehouse. 
He suits up and makes his way over, and when he boards it, he finds no one there. But before he can get back out of it, though, the hatch door slams shut, and the jet rockets off to the Westchester Mansion. As the jet is landing, Peter walks up to the front door of the mansion, asking if anyone's there. Specifically, Kitty Pride. Kitty opens the door, and Peter says that he's pretty sure the jet's broken. It dragged him all the way out here, but why is my spider suit going crazy? Is Logan here? Without saying anything, Kitty hits Peter with a stun gun. Once he hits the ground, he looks up to see Kitty's face start to change, and her is saying, Far out! It's Spider-Man! There's something we didn't expect. Deadpool steps back to his group of cyborgs, stating, BONUS! A little while later, Peter begins to open up his eyes, and when he sees him and the other X-Men bound up and chained, he looks around asking, Where am I? And a voice shouts, One of them is awake! Deadpool says, Man, you're such a tough cookie! And the cyborg asks, can I hit him again? To which Deadpool says, HELL YEAH! The cyborg shocks Peter and his vision fades, and he hears another cyborg stating that they're reaching the drop point. He then asks, Are you just gonna drop us? And Deadpool says, You've all got wacky mutant powers. You can handle it. Besides, you're all gonna be dead by nightfall anyway. That's the show. But if you want, wake them all up before you kick them off of the ship. Actually, it would be fun hearing them scream. The first cyborg says that he really wants to take the mask off of Spider-Man, but Deadpool stops him, telling him, Hey, show some respect to the mask. Masks mean something. Respect that. He then leans over to Peter, telling him, Time to rise and shine. And Peter asks, Who are you? Deadpool then says not to push them out. And seconds later, Peter is thrown out of the helicopter. He falls from the sky and he quickly positions himself to fire a web up to catch himself, which then throws him back into the air. Before crashing back into the ground, though, he sees the other X-Men pushing out, all wearing the same metal cuffs. And as he hits the ground, he asks, Where the heck am I? Did I really just fall out of a plane? I did, didn't I? And now I've lost my boot. Even better. As he starts to pull the the cuffs off of the front side, his spider sense begins to go crazy, so he quickly jumps over the flying cyborg body. The cyborg keeps jumping up shouting, and he fires at Peter, and Peter shouts, I was trying to have an inner monologue here. Peter webs up the cyborg's face, and then he runs up, bashing him in the head. And then after that, he realizes that the guy's head is partially metal, so he should probably aim for the fleshy parts. After webbing up the rest of that cyborg, he shouts that he's already passed his curfew. Even though most superheroes would be embarrassed to run away, he shall do that now. He runs off, but after running through the bushes, he runs into another metal man. He shouts, why can't I just run through the jungle without one of you? But as he goes on, Colossus grabs him, telling him, please don't say that. And Peter shouts, oh, you're the giant Russian metal man. He then starts shouting for Kitty. And Colossus tells him that he needs to calm down and not yell. And Peter tells him, of course I do. We have to fight Kitty. She attacked me. Colossus tells him, no, she did not. And it wasn't Aurora who attacked me. What we are looking at are shapeshifters. And Peter tells him, or maybe the women decided to take over. Colossus then says that they need to hurry and find the others. And as they head off, Scott's optic blast shoots through the forest. The two of them run over to find Scott being taken down by a group of cyborgs and they quickly jump in to help him. After kicking one of the men away, Scott asks, where are we? And Peter tells them that he's not sure. Maybe Six Flags Crazy Town. Also, you're welcome. As one of the last cyborgs are taken out, Colossus breaks the comps off of Scott and Colossus begins to hear something. Peter tells him that it's either his gentle sobbing or that's when a cyborg with the lower half of a snake slithers out shouting, am I on? Okay. Yo, mutants! My name is Bone Breaker, and I'm here to break your bones. Bonebreaker starts to fire into Colossus, and Peter grabs Scott to avoid the hit. As the blast lays into Colossus, Bonebreaker shouts that this is what he wants. He wants to kill them, and have everyone see him do it. Scott starts firing back, and Peter asks, what does he mean by everyone? Bonebreaker shouts that they're ready for him. They sacrificed themselves for this. The mutants may have been born with powers, but they willingly gave up their bodies to allow them to hunt them. But before he can go any further, a bolt of lightning cracks down from the sky, shocking him. And Storm floats down asking, is everyone else really angry about this whole thing? Peter quietly says, whoa. And Scott asks Storm if she knows where they are. She tells him, yes. And creating a whirlwind to lift everyone up, she tells them all to look around. Scott says, Krakoa, they brought us to Krakoa. And Peter then asks, where's that? Hopefully I'll the coast of Long Island, right? Scott tells him no, it's off the coast of Genosha and the South Pacific. And before he could go on, Colossus shouts, over there. The sounds of helicopters begin to get louder and they begin to fire on the group. Storm releases the whirlwind, dropping everyone and then the helicopter starts to fall from the sky. As it crashes, a figure starts to walk out of the fire and Kitty asks if everyone's okay. She runs up to Peter telling him, thank God you're okay. And Peter grabs her telling her, wait, you could be a shapeshifter. 
She leans in whispering something and Peter says, yeah, yeah, that's, that's really you, yeah. Nightcrawler bamps in, holding a cyborg arm, telling them all that it's time for payback. He does believe that they are the stars of the show. Angel then flies down, holding Jean's body, saying that he found her hanging from a tree. He didn't know what to do. Scott grabs her, shouting for her to wake up, and after a few shakes, she shouts, everyone, shout! She then asks where they are, and Scott tells her Krakoa Island, and she shouts, are you kidding me? Peter then says, hang on, what the heck is Krakoa Island? And Kitty explains that it is an island prison for mutants. The nation of Genosha imprisons them and hunts them for sport and then broadcasts it on TV. They were here last month and they may have stuck their noses in when the professor told them not to. Peter then says that sounds rather inhumane and a voice tells him that's one way of looking at it. Deadpool jumps out with his reavers telling them that the other side of it is that you are sickening unholy genetic freaks who have no business being alive in the first place. Plus you're international terrorists. By the way my name is Deadpool and I'm about to show you why. So smile, you're about to make television history. As the two teams begin to clash, Deadpool shouts that the one who collects the most mutant carcasses gets a case of the cold skis. Peter then yells, I'm not a mutant! Not that there's anything wrong with that, and Scott tells everyone that they need to hurry and find high ground. The X-Men turn and fight their way back, while Scott shouts that they can't take this fight head on. They're just simply outmanned and outgunned here. Nightcrawler teleports behind Deadpool swinging, and Deadpool spins back, grabbing him by the throat, telling him, you must be the blue smelly one. You really should have listened to your captain and ran like hell. Peter swings in, kicking Deadpool off and tells him, Oops! I was running the wrong way. A short while up ahead, Peter and Kitty begin to look through the bushes and Peter tells them that they need to call someone, maybe Nick Fury. Kitty tells him, remember, Nick Fury hates you, but for what it's worth, she's really sorry about getting you mixed up into all of this. Please don't break up with her. Peter tells her, well, duh. And Kitty asks if he's mad and Peter shouts, of course I'm mad, but you didn't do this. Besides, I'm pretty sure that you'd be breaking up with me after I'm gratted for like seven years because I didn't come home. And then Kitty thinks about it. What about Professor Xavier? What did they do with him? Before anyone else can ask that question, Spider-Man's spider sense goes off and he webs away from an explosion and Kitty tells him that he is so good to break up with her. A little ways back, Scott tries to hold down the line, but Deadpool and the Reavers manage to knock off Scott's visor, knocking him to the ground. Up in the sky, Storm starts to take out the helicopters, giving the rest of them time to fight back. And as Peter punches Deadpool, he says, you know, if I was a lesser superhero, I would say something lame like, your show's been canceled, but that's totally not me. And Kitty tells him that the fact that he thought of it is a cause for concern. Peter grabs Deadpool and rips his mask off to reveal Xavier. Xavier? And Xavier shouts to everyone, run, I beg you all to run. Everyone asks what is going on and Peter shouts, wait a second, and he clocks Xavier. Kitty yells, what the heck are you doing? And Peter says, he's the dude with the thing. And Xavier shouts to hurry up and kill Spider-Man. He's one of them. And in the confusion, Deadpool posing as Xavier starts to fire into the crowd. As everyone tries to dodge, Peter says that he does have spider sense. They need to learn to trust the spider sense. The group begins to run up ahead and when the coast is clear, Nightcrawler then asks where Scott. Back on the battlefield, Deadpool putting back on his mask, telling everyone that they need to hurry and pull the legs off of Spider-Man. This isn't going so smoothly because we didn't plan for him. Meanwhile, up ahead, Peter and the rest of them press on, and Storm spots the studio where they're broadcasting from. But before they can move, an electrical blast shoots Peter in the back. His body bounces across the ground, and Kitty turns back with a face full of rage. Deadpool says that it's time for them to wrap this all up and Kitty charges through them, phasing in and out of all of the cyborgs. She tells them, a funny thing happens when you phase through machinery, seeing as you're all half machine. And Deadpool says, yeah, yeah, just do that thing and die. And then he hits her in the back with a stun gun. As he aims the gun at Kitty's head, he tells her, you have spunk. But before the trigger is pulled, Nightcrawler teleports in, grabbing the gun. All of the remaining cyborgs turn to fire, and Deadpool shouts, don't do it! But it's too late as everyone shoots, hitting Deadpool. Kitty and Nightcrawler begin taking out the rest of them, and Angel swoops down, grabbing Deadpool. And as they get high into the air, Angel releases him, letting him crash back into the ground. He starts to get back up, telling everyone, all right, no more fun! And Peter jumps in, punching him. He jumps on top of him, laying into him, and then he rips his mask off again, asking, what does it take for you to go night-night? Everyone stops fighting to look, and they see the Deadpool's face, as it is a skinless skull encased in plastic. And Deadpool shouts, God, I told you not to do that! And he kicks Peter off of him. He then opens fire, yelling, you don't have what it takes to win! They gave up everything to put you all down! Deadpool begins chasing down Peter specifically, and Kitty tells Colossus to throw her. Deadpool pins down Peter, asking if he understands it. Peter tells him, Yeah, you smell like a KFC dumpster on a hot day. And as Deadpool pushes his gun into Peter's head, Kitty shoots through him, phasing through Deadpool's body. He falls back screaming, and he begins to explode. But before
Before he can go off, Kitty grabs Peter, phasing the two of them away from the blast. The smoke starts to clear and a group of cyborgs shout, Let's get him for Wadey! But as the group steps forward, a giant optic blast shoots by them all, and Scott and Jean step out of the woods. As the two of them meet back up, Peter and the X-Men rip through the island until they finally make their way to the studio. Jean telepathically asks Xavier where is he, and in the room that he's being held in, Mojo tells the guards to just kill him. But when the guards don't move, he asks what's wrong, and then he turns back to see Xavier's collar has been released. Back in the main room, everyone begins to scream, and as they run, Xavier wheels himself out, saying that they really should just leave this horrid place. He holds his hand out, shaking Peter, telling him that he really came to their rescue. He fears what may have happened if he wasn't there. And he tells him that's great, so can he move in with them when his aunt kicks him out for being so late? A little while later, Peter and the X-Men take one of the planes to leave the island, but watching them is the smoldering body of Deadpool. Much later in the night, Peter and Kitty walk over to Peter's house, and Peter says that it's 4.30 in the morning, and there's no way out of this. He has to tell Aunt May that he's Spider-Man. Kitty says that maybe they can get the professor or Jean to make her forget that he was missing in the first place. Peter tells her no. That would just be wrong. Peter and Kitty hold hands as Peter pushes the door open and finds an empty house. He checks Aunt May's room and sees that she isn't there, so Kitty phases back out, stating that the car isn't there either. She then looks at the phone to see that there's a message, and Peter hits play. Aunt May's voice says that she's sorry for not being home, but don't freak out. She isn't, uh, coming home tonight. Today it's going well, and she's gonna be staying out for the night. Kitty laughs, saying that it looks like her aunt got her groove on, and it looks like he really dodged a bullet. As class ends and the students head home, Mary Jane stops Peter, telling him that she knows that he's been through a lot lately, and he's going to have to come with her and take a break. A short while later at the mall food court, Peter says that he appreciates her trying to be friends with him again, even though he's currently dating Kitty Pride. Mary Jane says, speaking of, she hasn't noticed her sulking around the school in a while. Peter tells her that Kitty is kind of grounded because of who Krakoa is. But before the two of them can go further into that subject, there's a loud crash as one of the food stands is thrown across the food court. Everyone begins to run outside from the stand's path, and as everyone pushes their way through, someone in the crowd shoves a mother and their child. The child is flung from the mother's grasp, and just before the child can hit the ground, a web shoots out, grabbing him. Peter shouts, ta-da! And the mother screams at Peter to get away from her baby. He sighs, telling her, yeah, should've seen that coming. Guess we will go see what's going on now. He leaves over to where the stand crashed, and he finds a man in a scorpion suit staring right back at him. The man in the suit shouts that he's not falling for any of his tricks. He's so much smarter than him that he's not even funny. He's the scorpion, and he's so much better than him. Peter tells him, well, if you are so much smarter, why don't you just lay down and take it while I beat the crap out of you since you know what's gonna happen next. Scorpion shouts, I knew you were there. But before Peter can even ask what he's talking about, another voice calls out for them all to get on the ground. The two look back and see the police beginning to surround them, and Scorpion spins back, spraying the officers with his acid. As Peter jumps in to stop him, Scorpion backhands Peter, launching him into another stand. Peter quickly gets back up, and he webs Scorpion, and then he flings him into a pillar, and then he jumps on him, telling him, not so fast! I already get enough trouble from the cops! I don't need your help with that! The two start fighting back and forth, and Peter jumps on top, punching down onto Scorpion's head. But as the mask starts to break away, Peter stops when he sees Scorpion's face. And Scorpion's face is... his face? And meanwhile, back at the Watson house, Mary Jane rushes home to tell her mother that no matter what she's hurt, she's fine. She's okay. Her mother hugs her, telling her that the city used to be so nice. But as Mary Jane heads back to her room, she smiles, thinking that maybe talking with Peter again was a good thing. So Mary Jane then lays down on her bed and begins to write in her journal. And as she does, a hand reaches out, grabbing and covering her mouth. A few moments later, Mary Jane's mother comes in telling her that she got something in the mail and then notices the window open. Mary Jane nowhere in sight. Later over at the Baxter building, the Fantastic Four begin to go about their day when there's a sudden alarm blaring, shouting, security breach. Sue and Reed look out the window to see Peter getting closer, and as Reed shouts for him not to get any closer to the building, flames shoot out, burning him. A little while later, Peter wakes up inside of the Baxter building, and Reed tells him that he cannot touch this building. They have the highest security known to man. Peter rubs his head, telling him, well, I didn't have my cell phone, so either way, I need your help. Like, really, really, really need your help. I need to know that I can trust you. I need to know who this scorpion guy is. Reed says that they can run a blood test and Peter says that they can do that and not tell anyone, right? Like, not tell Nick Fury? And Reed smiles, telling him, Oh, that I can definitely do. Later in Reed's lab, he goes over the data that states that Scorpion is Peter Parker, but only a 94.2% match. Peter asks, what's the 94.2 about? And Reed tells him it's odd, either it's a match or it's not, but yeah, this is Peter Parker, Caucasian, around 16 years old. Peter shouts, wait, pulling off his mask. I'm Peter Parker, and if I'm Peter Parker, then who's that in the tube? Over at Shield 
Shield headquarters, Nick Fury sits at his desk as he receives a call from Reed Richards. Nick says that he has not changed his mind about the Skrull Initiative. And Reed says that he's not calling about that. He's calling to find out the government's take on human cloning. Nick says that, as they've seen on TV, it's off limits, too morally ambiguous. And Reed then asks, right, so there is no cloning, right? And Nick tells him, nope. And I'm not doing it either, if that's what you're asking. As the call ends, Peter tells Reed he's lying. And Reed tells him, actually, for once, Nick Fury isn't lying. The virtual sensor's reading body temperature and pulse rate fluctuations didn't even budge, so he's actually telling the truth. Peter asks, who would do this? I'm kind of freaking out here right now. And Reed says that they need to run some more tests, but they will need a blood sample from the real Peter Parker. As Reed starts to draw blood, he asks Peter how he got his powers, and Peter says, well, he was bitten by a spider. Reed tells him that's cute, but really how? And Peter says again, I was bitten by a spider. It was a big spider. Later, Peter heads back home, and as he opens the door to his house, Aunt May runs out asking if Mary Jane's with him. Peter says, no, what's going on? Aunt May shouts that Mary Jane is missing, and Peter quickly spins back around, stating that he's gonna go look for her. As it begins to get dark outside, Peter heads to the only place where he can think that Mary Jane could have gone, the abandoned warehouse. Peter climbs up the wall, stating, please, please, please be here. He hops this out of the window, asking if Mary Jane is there, and then a voice tells him, sorry, tiger, this is going to be awkward. Peter looks back and sees a woman in a Spider-Man suit hanging from the wall. After a moment of silence, Peter asks, who are you, and where is Mary Jane? The woman says that she doesn't know. She doesn't get to be a part of that part of the story. Peter jumps over at the woman, who effortlessly dodges, and jumps in, tossing Peter into a wooden post. The woman says, look, I'm not gonna fight you. That isn't going to happen. Plus, you're kind of off your game right now anyway. So for Mary Jane, I don't know. A pipe is thrown, and as the woman leans back to avoid the hit, she shouts, Fine! And she shoots a web out of her fingertips. The webbing shoots over, throwing Peter back against a wall, causing it to fall on top of him. And the woman says that she shouldn't have come here. It's all her fault. As she turns to leave, she tells Peter that she'll get them back for him. She'll do it for all of them. A short while later, Peter wakes back up asking what happened, and he scrambles to get back to the warehouse rooftop. He calls out for Mary Jane, hoping to get some kind of a response, and then he looks at the old house and sees someone standing there. The girl walks into the house, and Peter chases after her. Then he sees Gwen. Gwen Stacy who died when the Carnage symbiote was set free. She stands there in a hospital gown looking at the empty house and asks, when did you move? Elsewhere though, Mary Jane wakes up in a giant tube asking where is she? She begins to beat on the glass asking if anyone's there and then Peter's voice tells her to just calm down. Peter's shadow then says, it's going to be okay. I know how to protect you now. Mary Jane screams to let her out and as she does, no one else inside of the old Oscorp facility can hear her. Peter goes on saying that this is where it all happened, remember? This is where Spider-Man was born. He realizes now that he broke up with her because he was so worried that something would happen to her. Then he thought about a wonderful idea. Why not make them equals? That way they could be peers and she could defend herself. He steps out from the shadows with half of his face melted away, telling her that he's going to make her just like him. Back in Peter's old house, the two sit down and Gwen says that she remembers waking up at a hospital, but she doesn't remember where. Images start to flash in Gwen's head. Images of doctors dying and police shooting at her. She then stares at Peter and says that she doesn't remember. Peter tells her that she was dead and now she can't remember how she got here and Gwen stops him asking. She was dead? She then looks back down saying that she doesn't know how she was supposed to react to that. She grabs and hugs Peter and then a light shines down on them and Aunt May asks what is she sees Gwen and then suddenly realizes that she's looking at Gwen and she runs back home. Gwen says that she really was dead then. And Peter tells her, yeah, you were. Shortly after that, Peter and Gwen run after Aunt May as she tries to call the police, and Peter begs for her to put the phone down. After a brief moment of shock, Aunt May sits, and Peter tells her, look, there's no easy way to say this, but I need to tell you, I'm Spider-Man. I always have been, and Gwen was killed, or so we thought, by a monster who was looking for me. Aunt May takes a moment to process this, and then she folds her arms, telling Peter to prove it. Prove that he's Spider-Man. Peter jumps to the ceiling, telling her, see? And Aunt May tells him to stop it. She then says, so everything with Norman, all of that trouble, and Harry, and now this? Even though I saw Gwen's dead body with my own eyes? Peter tells her that he doesn't know how, but clearly there's a scientific explanation. He just doesn't know what it is. Aunt May tells him to stop. She understands. Now, just get out. Take whatever that is and get out. Peter tries to tell her to wait, but Aunt May shouts that he is not her son. She gave up her adult life for him, and all he has done is lie to her. Take those ghosts and get out of the house. A voice from down below then asks Aunt May, when did she get so feisty? Everyone turns back to see Richard Parker, and he says that she should take it easy on him. He was only a kid trying to make the most out of an impossible situation. Aunt May scoffs, stating, wonderful timing. Now you can take your son and 
get out. Peter asks, is that really you? Dad, are you alive? And then he looks at Aunt May and she still doesn't respond. Meanwhile, over at the Baxter building, Nick Fury looks at Scorpion and asks, so this is Peter Parker. Reed tells him no. After some tests, his best guess is that someone cloned him and then tampered with the cloning in an attempt to enhance him. And then asks if someone was doing super soldier experiments with cloning. Nick doesn't say anything. And then he radios back to SHIELD headquarters to get the spider slayers ready. He's going to need the full battalion and a cleaning crew. Things are about to get messy. Back at Peter's house, his father hugs him, and Aunt May shouts that she's glad that they're back together, but now they can all get out. She's had enough of the Parker drama for the rest of her life. Peter shouts, wait, she knew that his dad was alive and she didn't tell him? Aunt May snaps back that he's Spider-Man and didn't tell her. She was just trying to protect him from all of this, this exact thing. And without paying much attention to Peter and Aunt May, Richard turns to Gwen and asks how she's feeling. She must be hungry. As Richard opens the fridge, Aunt May asks, what is he doing? She wants them all to leave. Richard pulls out a pizza and says, look, cold pizza is perfect for this kind of a thing. Back at the Oscorp facility, Mary Jane sits in her tube, now strapped to a chair, and Peter tells her that this place used to be state of the art, but don't worry. Soon, she's going to be just like him. She'll be able to protect herself. As Peter starts setting up the machine, he's suddenly kicked in the face. And then a six-armed Spider-Man tells Peter to get away from her. Back over at Peter's house, his father explains the events of what happened the day of the plane crash crash that supposedly took his life. Just before boarding the plane, he had second thoughts on further work on the suit since the company that they were working for wanted to weaponize it. His mother, Mary, decided that it would be their best chance to finally get back out of the financial slump that they were in, but ultimately, he refused to go along with it. Peter listens and then asks, what about Gwen? Why is Gwen alive? Why are you here? And Richard says, yes, you really were a smart boy. Back at Oscorp, the six-armed Spider-Man fights the cloned Peter back, stating that he knew that he would try something like this. He's not going to let him touch Mary Jane. He then kicks the clone back, telling him that this isn't why they were created. The cloned Peter grabs a steel beam and throws it, shouting, SHUT UP! And then he tackles the six-armed Spider-Man to the ground. He starts to beat on him, punching him over and over, and after the six-armed Spider-Man stops moving, the cloned Peter Parker looks back at Mary Jane, stating, It's okay, sweetie. It's all gonna be okay now. Meanwhile, over at Peter's house, his father continues his story, stating that he's not going to like this part, but metaphorically he was dead. Or at least in every legal sense. It was then that a man named Henry Gierich from the CIA found him. Henry knew that he was supposed to be dead, but he had a unique offer for him to allow him to continue his work. Henry said that there was a man by the name of Nick Fury who had weaseled his way through the world government ladder and was now working on a super soldier serum. He wanted to make a team of super soldiers like Captain America in order to police the world, and frankly, the CIA didn't trust him. A little while later, Henry brought in footage of the Venom suit when it broke loose, and in that video, his father saw his son, Peter, and Henry told him that Peter had become Spider-Man and Nick Fury had already gotten to him. It was one day when May was leaving work that he approached her, but she refused to let him anywhere near Peter. But also, Henry wouldn't let him talk to his son, regardless of his fear of what was going on with Nick Fury, because he was scared that it would compromise the whole operation. Peter stands up from his table shouting that none of this explains why Gwen is still here. His father goes on stating that he was never supposed to know that she existed. All of the advancement in stem cell research combined with Connor's advanced, but before we can go any further, a light shines in the house and a voice calls out that they are surrounded. Outside, Nick Fury shouts, over a microphone that there are several dozen robots, and he says that they are here to take them all into custody. As they can see, he's not screwing around. Gwen looks outside and says that they're going to take them away, and then her body begins to twist. Suddenly, her gown is torn off, and standing before them is the red creature that Peter once fought before. Gwen screams, no, and she jumps out the window, but before Peter can chase after her, he sees Aunt May grabbing her chest. Peter asks what's wrong, and she struggles to tell them that it's her heart. But while all of this is happening, back at the Oscorp facility, Mary Jane slowly opens her eyes and Peter tells her congratulations. This is the all new her. Outside of Peter's house, Gwen Stacy, now looking like the Carnage Monster, jumps straight into a group of robots and rips through, tearing everything apart. Nick shouts for them to fire and the robots begin to shoot beams, hitting the house. And inside, Peter grabs Aunt May and Richard Parker, Peter Parker's father who joined us. If you really don't know what's going on, you really should check out the last episode. Tells his son that he will take care of Aunt May. Peter needs to get out there and stop whatever is going on. On. Peter hesitates for a moment and then Richard tells him, you need to listen to your father. Peter turns, jumping out of the house, vaulting off of the robot, shouting for Nick Fury. Peter makes his way over to him, grabs his gun, telling him that he needs to stop. His aunt is in the house and Nick shouts for him to get off! You're under arrest! But before anything else can happen, Peter is hit by one of the robot's beams and then Nick points his gun at Peter, telling him, I understand, but you need to stay down. Peter lunges back up, grabbing at Nick
Nick's throat, but then another robot fires hitting him. And Nick tells him, I'm really sorry, but you need to stay down. The next hit will paralyze you for good. He holds up his gun and then is blasted with fire and a voice tells him, dude, leave that guy alone. Everyone looks up to see the Fantastic Four in Reed Richards asking what exactly is going on here. Nick tells Reed to take his team and go home. And Reed stomps him asking, why are you doing this? Peter's done nothing wrong. Nick shouts that this is a military operation and he's giving them a direct order to go home. Ben Grimm looks at Gwen and he says, no offense, but she is one ugly. But before Ben can finish his sentence, Gwen grabs him and flings him across the street into a building. Reed shouts to Nick that they just can't take over a neighborhood because they found a clone. And Peter interrupts them screaming that his aunt is still inside. She had a stroke or something and my dad is in there too. Sue Storm pushes through the group telling Nick that there's an older woman inside that needs their help. What is the matter with him? And while Sue creates a force field and goes inside of the house, Reed stretches around slowly pulling Gwen down stating, this is just fascinating. Inside, Sue checks on Aunt May, and she asks Richard what he has done to help. Richard stumbles over his words, telling her, nothing, nothing. So Sue says, you're a doctor, but either way, we're gonna need to get her out of here. Once Sue brings May outside, she tells Peter that she's going to take her to the hospital, along with his dad. Peter tells her thanks, and Sue flies away. Johnny then asks if he would like him to take him as well. Peter turns back, telling him no, and then he charges through the robots, calling out to Nick Fury. Nick tells his men to do it, full of power. And suddenly, there's a bright blue light that blasts through covering the entire area. And then in a flash, it's over. Everyone stares at Gwen, now back in her human form, and she collapses. Peter falls to his knees and Nick walks over to him, pointing his gun, telling him, I wasn't lying before. You don't get to be Spider-Man anymore. And Peter looks at him, tell me what you did. And Nick sighs, telling him that he didn't do anything. It was his clones. And he's truly sorry about this. Back at the Oscorp facility, Mary Jane asks, what did you do? The cloned Peter says that she knows what Oz was, right? He injected her with it. The stuff that made Otto Octavius into Dr. Octopus, Norman Osborn into Green Goblin, and with it he recreated her. Mary Jane shouts that he put something inside of her, and as she steps forward, she falls over in pain. Cloned Peter asks if she's okay, and then a giant red arm shoots up, and a hulking red beast stands up and screams! Back at the house, Nick Fury puts cuffs on Peter Parker, and Reed Richards says that he can't do this. Peter just looks at him and tells him to just let it go. It's all over now. Suddenly, the Spider Woman from before jumps in, kicking Nick Fury away, and she grabs Peter Parker and leaves off. Johnny Storm tries to follow, but as they get into the city, he loses sight of them. Down on the alleyway, the woman puts her fingers to her lips until Johnny flies off. Once the coast is clear, she breaks the cuffs holding Peter back, and tells Peter to follow her. The two jump onto the Jersey Turnpike, and when they land onto a passing truck, Peter asks, Who are you? The woman looks at him, stating, Spider Woman? And Peter asks again. So the woman pulls her mask down to show that she looks like him. Peter asks if she's him, and the woman tells him, kinda, sort of, I'm a clone of you. Right now, we're heading over to find the other clones, and I'll tell you everything that I know. It all started about a month ago when I was born. There was a man named Ben Riley. He was saying how there had been so many other clones, except in her case, they decided they wanted to try making a female. They said that she would be working as a special agent for the CIA, and that her name was going to be Jessica Drew. Ben kept going on about how the CIA and FBI made a deal, and allowed him to keep working on his work with the Parker sample that he took when things went wrong. But just before she passed back out, she remembers hearing Ben say something about making her like the next Captain America, except that there would be an army of 200 Spider-Men. As Jessica sits back, she asks Peter if he's okay. Peter calmly tells her no. In fact, he should be like in a coma. Jessica goes on to explain that one day during testing, one of the other clones broke out of their cell and began to tear the place down. It was after it escaped that all of the doors to the other cells opened and everyone broke free. Peter asks if one of those clones took Mary Jane and Jessica says that she thinks so, but she's hoping that she's wrong. But right now this is their stop and they jump off of the truck. Peter follows behind and then he sees that they're now at the old Oscorp facility. They see what Mary Jane has now become and she's fighting the Peter clone. Jessica webs up the six-armed Spider-Man pulling him to safety and then she she takes off his mask, telling him to rise and shine. And as the six-armed Spider-Man looks at the real Peter, Peter tells him, we're gonna do our oh my gods later. The six-armed Peter then looks back at Mary Jane and says, that idiot did it. He injected her with Oz. Mary Jane continues to thrash about and just before slamming a piece of metal onto the clone Peter Parker, Peter runs up telling Mary Jane to stop. This is the real him. She screams as she starts to revert. And the cloned evil Peter says, look, she can protect herself now. Peter punches the clone shouting that there's no 
no Oz here. This place was empty. So where did you get it from? And the voice says, from our father. Peter looks back and he sees Otto Octavius walking in along with Nick and Reed. Over at the hospital, Sue and Richard follow the doctors as they rush Aunt May to the ER. And as she's taken away, Richard asks if she's going to be okay. Sue notices that it's a bit strange that Richard, being a doctor, doesn't know what the outcome would be. And she says that she would like to take Richard's blood to check on a few things. Back at the Oscorp facility, Peter stares at Otto Octavius thinking that he's going to kill him. He can do this. He can kill him and he won't go to jail. He's a kid. But as Peter tries to step forward, Jessica holds him back. Otto tells Peter that it's good to see him again. The clones are right there, so if you'd be so kind as to wrap them all up for me. Reed looks at the clones and says that he made three clones and one of those was a female? With one of the clones, they denied a clone its Y chromosome in phase two. As you can see, she was a success. Jessica looks at Otto asking if he was the one who created her and he smiles. Yes, it was me. She grits her teeth telling him that she's going to kill him. But before she can move, Nick pulls out his gun telling her don't. There's been enough of that tonight. Johnny lands by Peter asking what the heck is going on. And Peter picks up Mary Jane shouting that they need to help her. She's been infected with Oz. Johnny shouts that they can fix that, right? And Nick tells him no. He needs the Fantastic Four to pack up and leave. As Johnny and Nick argue, Peter Parker pushes them aside stating, please help Mary Jane. Ben takes her and Reed says that he can do everything that he can. And the clone Peter shouts, no, she's okay. I fixed her. The clone Peter then jumps up and the soldiers open fire on him. Jessica begins to punch the soldiers and Nick fires his gun shouting that he's had enough of this. Otto Octavius tells Nick that he appreciates the good work here, but this is currently their problem, so they'll be taking their subjects back now. Nick says that he ain't taking crap. There's a lot that he's going to be answering for, and above all of that, he's under arrest for this little house of horrors that he created. Peter pushes through asking, how did you do it? How are you not dead or in jail? And Otto laughs, stating that he made a deal with the federal government to help design a super soldier. It would seem that there are many people in the United States government that truly hate Nick Fury, and they didn't want him to be the only person with what they would call a Captain America button. So now, thanks to the good people over at the FBI, he can continue his work as Dr. Octavius before everything went wrong. Otto then goes on stating that, I have your blood sample from your friend Kurt Connor's assistant, which allowed me to continue my work, and Jessica there is proof that it's working. He then leans into Peter and he tells him, it just so happens that my work completely perverts and destroys every single part of you and your life. Every single part. But before leaving, Otto mentions that as for his father, well, your father really did die in that plane crash. Peter tries to hold himself back and he tells Nick Fury that he will make him a deal. Tell his guys to give him 10 minutes and he will surrender and they'll all win. Otto laughs stating that that's cute, but Nick isn't the one in charge here. We're gonna round up the Parkers and take them all back and then we can use whatever force is needed. I can make more. Nick pauses for a moment and then he tells his team, you heard the man, set up a perimeter around the building and everyone move out. Otto asks, what are you doing? And Nick tells him, he's right, I'm not in charge here. So. Go on, be in charge. As Nick shuts the door to leave, the six-armed Spider-Man pushes everyone aside and jumps on Otto, stating, Hi, Daddy! As he slams Otto down, the real Peter jumps in and just as quickly is knocked away. The metal in the room begins to twist and Otto shouts that he tried so hard to keep this part of his life secret. And that's when the metal pipe shoots through the air, impaling the six-armed Spider-Man and Otto continues stating that it was the arms that made me. It was metal and I can control metal. Outside, Nick Fury pulls out his gun, shouting for everyone to halt. And Henry walks up, stating, That's nice. I'm with the FBI, so no offense to you, but you should just stand down. Henry then asks, Where's Otto? And Nick asks, Who? The guy with the bowl cut in the show that should be in jail at this very moment? Henry shouts for him to stop that, and Nick goes on stating that he wouldn't have made a deal with Otto to make Super Soldier clone experiments behind his back. And now it blew up in your face, and you're going to get fired, aren't you? Back inside, Otto creates more mechanical arms out of the scrap metal, shouting that he will not mess around with them. Jessica needs to surrender or I will kill her and clone another. Peter jumps at Otto and Otto knocks him away asking, who's next? One of the arms shoots back hitting Jessica and as she picks herself back up, she tries webbing up Otto Octavius. As the webbing hits the arms, Otto laughs and then he launches one slamming Jessica into the computers. Otto then turns back to Peter shouting, you need to embrace your defeat. But this time as the arm is thrown, Peter punches through it shattering it. Otto then asks, what? No witty comment? That's how I know you're scared. Jessica shouts, no, that's not it. It's just how we know when he's being serious. And she swings in, kicking Otto to the ground. As Otto Octavius gets back up, all of the metal on the ground begins to swirl around, sucking everything up. And Otto shouts, why is it that you always have to involve yourself in my life's work? Just die already! As the metal flies around, Peter and Jessica jump along the arms and together, they punch Otto Octavius right in the head. The metal in the room starts to fall and Peter huffs, stating, 
that felt good. And Jessica says, yeah, but it's kind of lame that it took both of us to do it. Jessica checks on the other two clones and says that they're both dead. Peter says that this is all so weird. They need to go. She jumps up stating that he can't be serious and surrender. Peter tells her that he has to. If he runs, they're going to chase him. And right now, Mary Jane and Aunt May's health is more important. Jessica leaps away telling him that she isn't going to stick around here and argue with herself. Outside, Nick and Henry continue to bicker as Peter shuffles out holding Otto's body. Nick asks, where's the girl? Peter says that she, um, left? There are two more clones inside though, both dead. And Henry says that that's good. Peter looks at Henry and shouts, good? Tell me because I would really like to know if there's any part of you that understands how insane evil you really are. Henry turns back to Peter and before he can yell, Johnny flies down telling Peter that he has to come with him. He grabs a hold of Peter's arms and he flies him over to the Baxter building and inside of the lab, Dr. Franklin Storm looks over Mary Jane and a reed tells Peter that they isolated the Oz compound but Mary Jane begins to toss and yell and turn and then her eyes open as she sees Peter. She jumps out of bed running at him and asks, you're the real one, right? Mary Jane then looks around and sees Johnny and asks, what's going on? Peter says that it's a long story. Otto cloned him and and Gwen Stacy, and all of the clones escaped. Aunt May had a heart attack, and one of the clones kidnapped her. Mary Jane thinks about it and shouts, Oh my god, a clone? But Johnny whispers to her that this is where she hugs him. She latches onto Peter, and Peter says that he's sorry. And she says that it wasn't his fault, right? So why apologize? Peter then says that he loves her. She was right, and he was wrong. He almost lost. Peter looks at everyone, asking if she's going to be okay. And Reed says yes. They managed to remove the Oz formula, but they would still very much like to watch over Mary Jane for a little bit. And be it as it may, it may take some time, but but they can cure him as well. Wouldn't have to be Spider-Man anymore if he didn't want to. Now to catch you up on what we've skipped over, Peter Parker is back with Mary Jane. And Kitty Pride was kicked out of the X-Men and now goes to the school that Peter Parker and Mary Jane are at. Nick Fury is also gone and Carol Danvers is now the leader of S.H.I.E.L.D. Also, Harry became a goblin himself. Now aboard the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, acting director Carol Danvers walks down to a cell asking, What exactly does he want? And the soldier with her tells her that he wants to talk to Nick Fury. Carol says that Nick isn't here. Can't one of them just put on an eye patch or something and pretend that they are Nick? And the soldier tells her that he's pretty sure that they'll see through that. And Carol says, fine, open it up. Inside the holding cell, Norman Osborn asks, who are you? And Carol says that she is Captain Carol Danvers. What can she do for him? Norman tells her that he wants to talk to Nick Fury. And Carol says that he's not here. She is. So what does he want? Norman pauses for a moment and then he says, I'm ready to make my deal. Fury offered me a deal with some privileges in return for my scientific cooperation. Carol asks exactly what are these privileges that you speak of. And Norman says, I want to see my son. I'm willing to play ball and make a deal, so... Carol tells him, yeah, I'm gonna have to pass on that one. Norman scoffs, telling her, just get me Fury. And Carol tells him that you may have missed a part of the conversation where I said that he wasn't here. And Norman shouts, I'm ready to make my deal. This is a complete waste of time just sitting here. And Carol tells him, well, you should have thought of that before you turned yourself into a goblin and started killing people. As Carol turns to leave, Norman shouts at her again. And Carol looks at him and taunts him saying, woo, and slams the door shut. Back in the control room, she begins to go over the current captured villains, each one checked off except for Harry Osborn. A S.H.I.E.L.D. agent says that they keep him elsewhere, and she sits back stating that all of this is insane. They're keeping all of these maniacs in their basement. It's like they're sitting on a nuclear bomb. One of the operators then says that they have a problem. Osborn's cell went dark. She asks, like what, someone turned off the lights dark? And the operator says, no, like all monitor feeds, his vitals, everything. And she says that maybe it's just a, but before she can even finish her sentence, an explosion goes off in the basement. Moments before the explosion, Norman was sitting in his cell brooding, thinking about how the only difference between him and Nick Fury is that he knows that he's a monster and Nick doesn't. It's fine though, they can take away his money, throw him in jail, drug him, whatever. They can do whatever they want because he wants them to know that everything they have done to him isn't enough to keep him caged and now it's his turn to destroy him as norman sits his body begins to smoke and soon it catches fire the fire spreads and then there's an explosion going off blowing a massive hole into the side of the shield headquarters norman steps out of his destroyed cell and the blast caused most of the other cells to open and free the criminals including gwen stacy's clone as norman gets ready to leave he hears otto octavius telling him you're looking rather well Otto takes one of his metal arms, slamming it into Norman, telling him, Just so you know, I'm the one who gave you up to the feds. I sold you out the first chance that I got. I even gave them the formula, and they still couldn't figure it out. Norman reaches up, crushing one of the metal arms, and Otto asks, Why is that? 
What was it that they created? With only thinking to himself that Otto is in his way, Norman throws a fireball and jumps at him. Otto then asks, why are you still attacking? Can't you take a moment to marvel at all of what has happened? As Otto knocks Norman back, he tells him, never mind, you can't just keep being you. However, as Otto goes back to taunting Norman, he suddenly electrocuted and falls to the ground. Electro asks Norman if he can hear him. Also, you're welcome for the save. However, I'm auditioning for some work. I'm gonna need something that pays while I'm on the outside. Norman tells him to find him in a few days. There will be some work. Electro rockets off into the sky, telling him, awesome. I'll see you then. Also, that time that we almost took over the White House, good times. As Norman leaps out of the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, attack helicopters move in to try and take him down, and they manage to shoot Norman back into the water. The pilots report that they have confirmed hits, but once the helicopters get overhead, Norman jumps back out of the water, throwing more fireballs at them. The S.H.I.E.L.D.s take most of the blast, but Norman jumps over to a helicopter, ripping out one of the men. Then after taking over the controls, he crashes the helicopter into another and rips through the last of them. As he lands, he says that he's going to crucify Fury. I'm gonna crucify him on national television for this. A little while later, at Norman's lawyer Joseph's apartment, he gets ready to go out and he sees Norman standing in the mirror fixing his tie. Joseph asks what is he going on about and Norman tells him that he needs money so that he can put it away for a rainy day. Also contact a publicist, I'm going to need a booking ASAP. Later, as the news reports on the escape from the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters are televised, the report mentions that they have an exclusive interview with their reporter, Patsy Walker. The camera changes and Patsy says that as of late, the fate of Norman Osborn is a complete mystery until tonight. With her right now is Norman Osborn discussing the recent events that have stopped the course of his life and how he found himself incarcerated without trial by the same government that he dedicated his life's work to. Norman tells the viewers that he was wrongfully arrested for a crime that they never once told him about. And Nick Fury, he was the one who injected him with the untested chemicals that turned him into a monster. Out in the streets, Peter and Mary Jane go on their date while Peter cares for the school project parent Hood baby. And they notice one of the electronic stores playing the news, and on it is Norman's broadcast to the world. Without saying a word, Mary Jane drops her ice cream cone and she begins to run, and Peter catches up with her, and she shouts that he's going to come and kill her. He threw her off of a bridge. He knows who they are. Peter grabs her, telling her, yes, he knows, but he doesn't want to kill us. He wants to kill me. Peter and Mary Jane rush home, but before they can even get into Peter's house, Mary Jane's mother begins to scream at her that she needs to get into the car. They're leaving all right now. Mary Jane says that for once she's right, and Peter tells her to just go. He'll handle it. As Mary Jane drives off, Peter walks into his home to see Aunt May with an older gentleman. The man reaches out, telling Peter hello. His name is Dr. Miles Warren, a friend of his aunt's. Peter says, uh, hi, can I talk to my aunt for just a moment in private? It's kind of really important. And Aunt May pulls Peter aside, saying that this is close to being rude. And without even responding to that, Peter says that Norman escaped and he's on TV telling the world that he's the victim. Aunt May asks if he knows who he is, and Peter says, yeah, that's why she needs to leave and get as far away as possible. Go anywhere but here, like a hotel or something. And Aunt May asks, what is she supposed to tell Miles? But before Peter can answer, Miles says that he's terribly sorry, but one of his old patients is having an episode. So can they get together another time? She tells him, of course, that's fine. And Miles says, good. Hopefully everything with Peter there works out, I'll be in touch. Once Aunt May leaves, Peter suits up and heads to the only place that he can think of to start looking for clues, Norman's apartment. As he gets in, Peter thinks that surely Norman wouldn't be stupid enough to have returned here. And that's when Peter notices some recently eaten food lying around. Down the hall, a man walks out of the bathroom and Peter stares for a moment and says, Hey, you're not Osborne! Electro drops his rose and electrifies himself. And Peter shouts, Far out! It's that naked electric guy! Electro shouts, It's Electro! As bolts of electricity begin to shoot out into the air, Peter dodges, saying that he really doesn't want to know what part of his body that's shooting out of. As Peter jumps through Electro's attack, he says that he's just here to check on Norman. So why is he even here? Electro rides out of the apartment shouting, EAT ME! And Peter says, why are you running? Peter quickly jumps out after him, and as he catches up, Electro asks, will you just insert censored word off? Peter shouts, hey, 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 potty mouth. As the two begin to fight, Carol and the other S.H.I.E.L.D. soldiers wearing Hulkbuster armor jet down and open fire on Electro. He begins firing bolts of electricity towards the soldiers, but while distracted, Peter whacks Electro with a tire. He then takes the wiring from an electrical pole and he starts wrapping up Electro, asking if this is the part where he, like, I don't know, gives up? Carol shouts for the soldiers to open fire and they begin to rain down shots on Electro, and as he falls, Peter says that that could have gone better. She then points her gun at Peter, telling him that he has until the count of three to get on his knees. He shouts, no, I want to talk to Nick Fury. And she yells for them to take him down. As the soldiers begin to shoot, one hits Peter in the shoulder. And a little while later, Peter begins to wake back up, finding himself in a shield cell. 
Peter calls out, hello! And Carol says that it's a pleasure to meet him without the mask. He shouts, why can't I just go one day without someone knowing who I really am? Carol then starts to shoot webbing from his web shooter and tells him that he should have kept his mask on then. Peter yells out, hey, the fluid is expensive and who are you? She continues to shoot web stating that she is the new Nick Fury. And Peter says, that's good for you. Can I go now? And she tells him, no, she's playing a game here. One that she didn't invent, but one that she has to play. Meanwhile, back at Joseph's apartment, Norman watches the news as Peter is arrested and he shouts, that's funny, I escape and they arrest Spider-Man. They even took that electrical idiot off my back. Joseph tells Norman that really, he can't be keeping him here. He needs to go turn himself in. And Norman says, that's fine. They won't be putting me back in prison. Plus, I still need that money. Joseph says that he isn't helping him and Norman leans in asking, do you mean that you don't have my money? As Norman grabs him, Joseph tells him that he's making this difficult and as Norman's eyes light up, he says, what's going to be difficult here is identifying your body. A short while later, back at the S.H.I.E.L.D. cell, Carol receives a call from Agent Wu saying that he just got on scene where a high-rise apartment is burning. It belonged to a lawyer named Joseph Sinat, who happened to be Norman Osborne's lawyer. Right now, they have the war room scanning for traces of Norman's powers, so he'll contact them once they receive word. As Carol hangs up, she tells Peter, all right, the game's over. We need to, but before they can finish, Kitty jumps in, phasing through Carol, grabbing Peter's web shooters and mask, stating that these don't belong to them. Peter shouts, Kitty! And she says, what's up? And then phases the two of them through the ground. Outside on the docks, Peter webs up the guards and tells Kitty that she really needs to stop hitting everyone. But before they can leave, Carol and the other soldiers come out and they tell her that she would call Xavier, but she's not welcome there anymore, is she? Kitty shouts, you can't just hold people. You arrested him for no reason. He isn't the bad guy here. And Carol sighs. <sighs> we didn't arrest him. We were placing him in protective custody. There's a maniac on the loose, and I'm just trying to use him as bait, which didn't work. Another soldier walks over to Carol, telling her that they gotta hit a Norman, and Carol tells the teams to move out, and hands Peter and Kitty guns. Peter asks, what is this for? And Carol says that they're on the team now, because who here has experience fighting a goblin? Not S.H.I.E.L.D. Kitty then says that they're minors, and they just gave them guns. And Carol tells her that they're not guns, they are neuro-neutralizers. They point and shoot, and Norman stops gobbling, in theory. Over at Norman's accountant's apartment, he asks where is his money, because he knows what he paid him, and this is kind of too expensive for his pay grade. The accountant says that he got a new job, and Norman slams his fist down asking, do I really need to hurt your family to get it out of you? The accountant tries to say that he doesn't have it, and Norman stops him, changing into the gobble and telling him, that would be a yes then. Before Norman can do anything, shots are fired from the window separating the two of them, and Peter swings in, punching Norman, asking if it's really him in there. As Norman is blasted again, Peter tells him he still looks like the goblin, he's not going down, and Carol says, well, he should be down. Peter goes back to beating on Norman, but as Norman grabs Peter, he throws him out of the building. Everyone opens fire again on Norman, and then he too ends up falling out of the building. Peter tries to shoot webbing out to catch himself, but he realizes that he's out since Carol wasted most of it. Kitty jumps out of the building, aiming straight for Peter, but just then, Norman Norman goes crashing into the streets. Peter opens up his eyes, asking, What's that smell? Am I dead? And Kitty tells him, No, that would be them. They're in the sewer underneath the street. The two phase back up, and as Carol lands, Peter asks, So, where's Norman? She tells him, That's a good question. Where is he? One of the soldiers says that he fell and bounced, and the others then say that they don't know. Peter looks around, and then he jumps down, shouting to Carol, You had him! First you arrest me, dangle me in front of Norman, and I still helped you. Now after all of this, you lose him? And this is because you used up all of my web fluid. I would have been able to avoid this. All of this! Right now, me and Katie are going home. We have school in four hours. And if you see Norman, give me a call. After getting away, Peter heads home, and he looks around, thinking about how things have gotten quiet. A little too quiet. And as he goes to get something to eat, he feels a spidey sense going off. When he walks into his living room, he sees Norman sitting there with a sheet wrapped around him. And Peter tells him to get out of there. Norman says, so long as he doesn't use his powers, he can't be tracked. And Peter then asks, what does he want? Norman tells him, I want my life back. I want my money, my son, and I would gladly destroy Nick Fury and anyone else that I can to do it. Right now, you're the only proof left on the planet to show everyone that I am, in fact, a genius. Proof that I belong in this world. Peter shouts that it was an accident. And Norman says, so was penicillin. He goes on saying that that is the point. He's buried Nick Fury in the press, so now if Spider-Man would step forward and tell the world that he was created by Norman Osborn, all would be forgiven. Peter shouts. You're a murderer! And as the two argue, there's a knock at the door. He looks over and sees a note being slid under it, and as he reads it, it says, turn on CNN. Peter grabs the remote to turn on the TV, and on it is Harry Osborne at S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, telling everyone that his father is a sick, sick man. He's a liar, and all of the things that he's saying is not true. He killed his mommy. Norman's eyes widen and then light up, and on the screen, Carol looks back at the camera and smiles. Moments pass and Peter starts to wake up rubbing his head. What happened? I remember a Harry on the news and then Norman hitting me. Oh, 
That's what happened. Over at the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, Harry says that he can't believe that he was on CNN. And Carol tells him actually he wasn't. That feed was just sent to a particular TV they knew his father would be watching. What she needs for him to do now is get away before his father shows up. And no sooner than she says that, than the soldiers begin to report that they have visuals on Norman Osborn. Carol grabs a gun telling everyone that once he's in range, fire at will. And Norman leaps through the blast and one manages to hit him and send him into the ocean. The soldiers then ask if they got him, but that's when the platform begins to shift. Everyone looks at Norman and he says that he would like to have a word with his son. Everyone begins to open fire and then Harry begins to lose control and he changes into a goblin. As the two goblins clash, Norman shouts, this is the things I get, I'm very disappointed in you. But before Norman can continue beating down on Harry, Peter swings in cracking Norman off of him and he begins to choke him. Peter says, come on, time to go night night. And then he feels himself starting to burn. He jumps off trying to put himself out since he got lit on fire by the green goblin. And then he asks, how could you do that? Harry runs in, punching his father down, shouting for him to stop. And as they go back to fighting, the soldiers begin to open fire, blasting Norman away. Peter goes back to check on Harry, and as the soldiers gather around the fire that was Norman, they see him walk out. Norman begins to throw fiery blasts back at the soldiers, and Peter quickly webs up his head to try and blind him so he doesn't know where he's throwing them. As Norman pulls on the web to bring him close, another blast shoots by, throwing people off of him. Harry jumps out, tackling Norman to the ground, telling him to stop, and Norman flips over him, punching him into the ground. As he punches Norman, he shouts, this is how you honor me, after I've given you everything! And as Norman punches him, Harry's arm begins to change back into human form. Norman stops and looks down to see his son bloody and lifeless. Norman slowly starts to change back into his human form and he says, Please, kill me. Carol tells him gladly and she fires. Peter pulls himself back up to the platform and as Norman's body falls to the ground, he runs over picking up Harry. Carol tells Peter that she's truly sorry, and he runs up grabbing her, telling her to just stay away from him! You are not Fury, and I don't know you, so from here on out, you better stay the hell away from me. The next day in class, the teacher arrives, saying that she really hopes no one lost their project baby. But before she can start the class, Peter tells everyone that he has something he would like to say. This morning, their friend Harry Osborn died. He knows lately everyone started to forget about him since things went under some kind of bizarre circumstances, but that's fine. He would like to know if they can talk about him for one moment. Harry was a friend to everyone here. They've all known him since kindergarten. And not long ago, he himself, Peter Parker, couldn't walk down the hall without someone doing something stupid to him. But there was one person who stood up for him, and that was Harry. It may not have seemed like it, but to him, Harry was a hero who stood up for people who couldn't defend themselves. And that's what being a hero is, right? Today, they lost one. As the birds chirp in the park, Eddie Brock sits on a bench, staring off at the scenery. An older woman walks by and stops to sit. And Eddie turns to her, telling her that his name is Eddie Brock. It's a nice day, he's hungry. Before she can answer, he tells her that he's sorry. He's been sitting here all day trying to figure out how his life became what it is. He was a college student doing homework and going to parties, but now he has nowhere to go. Back when he was a kid, his father invented a medical miracle, a cure for cancer, and it ended up being a parasite and it attacked him. Suddenly, he changed into this thing, a super-powered thing. And that's when him and Spider-Man started throwing down. For the record, he knows who Spider-Man is. They used to be pals, but not anymore. His name is Peter Parker. Eddie goes on saying how he ran into Peter. They fought, and then there was a flash of light. And when he woke up, he was somewhere else hungry. And he ate the people that passed by in the park. In fact, he had actually gone out into the city to feed, and that's when he saw him again. It was Spider-Man fighting some giant metal rhino guy. And the thing is, when he saw Spider-Man, he felt great. Was the suit wanting him to go? There was a time when Spider-Man did wear this suit, even though it wasn't for a very long period. Maybe the suit's connected to him. Did it want to kiss him or kill him? He couldn't tell. Then later that night, he was attacked by some mercenary groups calling themselves the Wild Pack. Their lasers fired into him, and he fought back, stopping most of them. But then, there was one more. A woman with silver hair calling herself Sable. She began to open fire on him, and they fought for a bit, but in the end, he was able to escape. That night, he just knew that he had that feeling again. That feeling, like he was close to Spider-Man. Maybe days and weeks passed, and he couldn't really tell, but one day, he felt it again. Spider-Man was close. He and his class started taking a field trip to the museum, and he just had to get closer. So he broke in wearing the suit, and sure enough, Spider-Man was there. But since he couldn't really control himself, they began to fight, destroying everything around him. Spider-Man, being the hero that he was, tried to keep things to a minimum, but as the fight went on, they ended up back out in the street. He was so close to eating Spider-Man! And that's when that Sable woman appeared and started shooting at him and Spider-Man. But back in the current time, the woman sitting on the bench says, Wait, 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 wait. You're the monster from the museum? Eddie looks at her, and Venom comes out and eats them! Eddie reverts back, stating, Yeah, that was me. Now where was I? 
That's right. After Sable shot me, I turned into my normal self again. Spider-Man tried to stop us, but he was already having some issues of his own. Sable then took me away and left Spider-Man in the streets. Some time passed and I woke up and I was in a cell. It was there that I met the man, Bolivar Trask. He was the man that my father worked for when Venom was created and he wanted the suit back. He tried to explain that the suit actually belonged to his father, but Bolivar said that that was before his father died. He actually sold it to him, and it actually belonged to him. It belonged to Trask, and it was worth billions! So after finally getting control of him, Bolivar and his doctors put him into a test tube to try and split him from the suit. But before they could, some man showed up. Some man in a beetle costume. Beetle broke through the wall, tearing apart everything and knocking everyone out with some kind of gas. Once he was done, he opened up the test tube, freeing him, and then he held out a small container. Beetle didn't say anything, and when he attacked him, Beetle cut off a piece of him and put that piece into the container. After getting a part of him, Beetle just flew off. However, that didn't sit well with him, so he followed Beetle. He jumped on top of him while he was trying to get away, and the two of them ended up crashing into the streets. They fought there, and that's when Spider-Man showed up, splitting them back up. And that's when it happened. After being knocked down to the ground, the suit reached out to Spider-Man, and then he tried to get the suit not to leave. But the suit chose Spider-Man over him. Once the suit completely covered up Spider-Man, him and the Beetle guy started to fight. Spider-Man knocked him away, but it also looked like Spider-Man was trying to fight against something. Something like the hunger. Before long, Sable and her wild pack showed up again. Spider-Man tried to fight them, throwing cars and anything that he could grab. Sable's force in the air fired down into Spider-Man, knocking him into a nearby building. But that's when they thought that they had him. So Spider-Man jumped back out onto the helicopter, dragging it into the street. Sable shouted to her men to fall back and retreat because the big boys were here. At first, he didn't understand. And that's when he saw Nick Fury and the Ultimates. Captain America jumped in and started to beat into Spider-Man. But that's when Spider-Man started to eat him! Before he could, though, it looked like he was struggling to hold back. And then he threw Captain America instead. As Thor jumped in to attack, he remembered himself yelling, That's what you get, Parker! And Nick asked if he just said, Parker. Nick said sorry for whatever reason. And then he told Thor to hit him with the good stuff. Thor flew into the sky and suddenly a giant bolt of lightning struck down into Spider-Man. All he could do was watch and cry. They were hurting Venom. It was his suit! All he wanted was for them to give it back. The next day after everything, he went to Spider-Man's school. And since he knows that he's a high schooler and all, he found Spider-Man with his little girlfriend outside. He told him that he wanted it back. But it turns out Spider-Man didn't have it. That shield group or whatever it was took it back after the huge fight. Spider-Man told him to just forget about it and he told him that he needs it back or he's going to publicly announce who he is. He'll go to the place where he works and tell everyone about his little secret identity that Peter Parker is actually Spider-Man. But back in the current day, Eddie Brock is still sitting on the park bench watching the scenery when an older man sits in the bench next to him. The man takes off his hat stating, it's a nice day, isn't it? And Eddie tells him that his name is Eddie. And it is a nice day, and right now, he's hungry. Anyway, let me get back to my story. After not hearing from Spider-Man for some time, I decided to stop by his house one night. When I rang the doorbell, his aunt answered and I tried to tell her that Spider-Man was there. I knew who he was! And after I told his aunt who he was, she started to unlock the door for me. And then suddenly she pulled a gun on me! I tried to calm her down, but she was really trying to threaten me, so I grabbed the gun from her! And just as I thought, Spider-Man appeared and punched me! Spider-Man was getting ready to beat me further, but then he looked back and decided to take this elsewhere. Once we landed on a rooftop, Spider-Man kept shouting, asking, why are you even doing this? And I told him, it's because you've got everything! Powers, the suit, and the suit chose you! While we argued, though, there was a girl that showed up. It looked like the girl that was inside of Spider-Man's house, and that girl's name was Gwen. Spider-Man said that he would show me what it's like to have that thing inside of me. And as Spider-Man went on, Gwen started to change into something, and that's when I knew that's what I needed. Gwen attacked me, and then I felt it. I felt the suit! Part of it was inside of him all along! All the suit needed was more. After touching Gwen, the suit started to grow, absorbing the other suit. Spider-Man tried to separate them, but then I knocked Spider-Man away. Gwen shouted like she wanted to protect Spider-Man, and then she jumped on top of him. They started fighting, punching each other back and forth, and just as Gwen thought that she had won, I let my suit creep up behind her. Once enough of it was behind her, the suit covered Gwen, and it started to devour her suit. After I absorbed all of it, I grew larger than ever before. I felt more powerful than ever before. Spider-Man tried to attack, but that's when I knocked him down into the alleyway from before. 
Spider-Man followed me and I told him that there was no more fighting. I had what I wanted! Spider-Man tried to stop me, but after slipping away into the sewer, I managed to escape. Back in the present time, the man puts on his hat, stating that if he's got this right, you fought Spider-Man and now you're some sort of what exactly? Eddie looks at the man and Venom comes out to eat him. And just as Eddie lunges, the man holds out his fist, sucking him up! After capturing all of Eddie, the man looks around and then metal plates start to form over the man's fist. Seconds later, Beetle rockets off into the sky reporting that he's pleased to inform on the Lord that he has the recipient of the package. He is on his way back to the home country. The Lord's bless Latvia. Once again, we've jumped ahead in the timeline. What you've missed is that Peter Parker was allowed to keep his powers as long as he underwent training with Steve Rogers. And Johnny Storm and Bobby Drake are now living with Aunt May. Now our story begins over in the S.H.I.E.L.D. containment facility as director Carol Danvers asks Norman Osborn if he understood everything that she just said. And Norman begins to open up his eyes, stating that, I thought I was dead. And Carol tells him, yeah, about that, that's the first thing on our list of things that we need to figure out about Norman Osborn. Norman looks up gritting his teeth, and Carol points her gun at him that she would love nothing more than for him to try and break free. Norman watches, and he closes his eyes. A short while later in the holding cells, Dr. Leonard Sampson tells Norman that he's here to ask him some questions regarding his brush with death. Sampson then begins to ask some questions, and Norman stops him, telling him, If you want anything from me, you can tell the blonde that it's going to cost her. I want privileges and considerations. Carol radios down from the room, telling Norman that he can go to hell. They already have his blood and his DNA. He can just rot down there for all she cares. Norman's eyes begin to glow when he says, You have no idea what's inside of me. He begins to stand up and his body begins to change and Carol shouts for everyone to get to their stations. They have a code red alert and they need a full lockdown. Norman changes into the goblin and begins to rip apart his cell, telling everyone that they have no idea how close to God I've become. Before the soldiers can begin firing, the room begins to fill with fire, burning everyone alive and tearing down the walls. Norman then calls out for everyone to come to him and through the destroyed cells, Electro, Craven, Sandman, Vulture, and Otto Octavius all come out. Sandman says that if they're going to make a break for it, they should probably do it now. And with that, Norman jumps out of the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters onto the flight pad. He looks at the helicopter asking if anyone can fly this, and Electro tells him, Yeah, I was actually in the Air Force at one point. Meanwhile, over at the cemetery, Spider-Man swings down to Captain America asking, Why are we meeting here of all places? And Steve tells him that he needs to learn about life and death. And for what he's seen, Spider-Man doesn't fight like other lives depend on it. You're nothing more than a teenager, and frankly, you act as such. Carol Danvers came to the Ultimates asking what we should do about Spider-Man. Thor and Iron Man gave the thumbs up, but I feel that you should be benched, soldier. And since I was outvoted, I'm here to teach and train you. As Steve goes on, his communicator goes off, and Carol says that they have a priority situation. There's been a breakout. However, that isn't what she's calling for. Fury's Black Ops team has gone rogue in the city. Steve runs over to his motorcycle, telling Spider-Man that they're gonna have to do this another time. It's a level one emergency, and you are not to follow, soldier. As Steve speeds off, Spider-Man webs off following him, telling him that it's not like he can stop him from following. Back with Norman and the others, they all break into an apartment to lay low while Vulture turns on the TV. The news shows the Ultimates fighting on a bridge, and Norman says that this is good. His eyes widen as he watches, stating, This is God's work. What I'm showing you all here is that we're going to kill Peter Parker. And over at that bridge, Spider-Man looks on as the explosions begin to rip the bridge apart when his phone rings. He picks it up telling Mary Jane that this isn't really a good time, and Mary Jane shouts that it's Norman. He's alive and he's escaped. You have to get Gwen and Aunt May as far away as you can. Back at the apartment, everyone discusses what they should do next when Craven suggests that they just get out of town. Norman looks back and tells everyone, Everyone, no. We stay here. What we need to do is here in New York. Otto says, look, I appreciate everything that you've done for me in the past, but I've got to say, I'm not about this killing Peter Parker thing anymore. All I want to do now is go back to work again. Be a scientist. We should leave Spider-Man alone and just take pride in what we've created. Norman changes into the goblin, punching Otto out the window, asking, "We!" As Otto begins to fall, he starts to gather the surrounding metal to catch himself, and when he lands, he screams for Norman! He jumps back to the window, but before he can hit Otto, Otto uses one of his arms and he cracks Norman across the face. Otto shouts, just because I don't want to fight doesn't mean that I've forgotten how. Meanwhile, back at the Parker home, they're watching TV when Peter comes running and telling Aunt May and Gwen that they have to get out of here. Aunt May asks what's going on, and Peter shouts, it's Norman, the goblin! He's alive and he's broken out of jail, and he's brought everyone that I've ever beaten up along with him. Peter Parker pulls pulls out his mask and he says, they know who I am and they know where I live. As the two begin to gather the things, Aunt May tells Peter that he needs to come with them. And he grabs her hand telling her, I can't. 
I have to do this. Now just go! Back in the streets of New York, Norman throws fireballs, knocking Otto to the ground, and he jumps towards him. The metal arms try to hold him back, and Otto shouts, You need to stop this! And Norman screams, After all I've done for you, this is what you do! He punches into one of the metal arms, and soon he pushes through to Otto himself. Punch after punch, he begins to beat down on Otto's head until finally, the metal arms fall apart. A short while later, Peter swings down and sees Otto's smoldering upper body, stating that he did it. Norman Osborn actually killed Otto Octavius. Some of the civilians run up telling Spider-Man that he should have seen it. It was like the Hulk or something was going crazy. And Spider-Man shouts, which way did he go? And everyone starts to point. So Spider-Man quickly swings up towards the apartment. As he gets in, he looks around stating that of course they're not here. Why would they be here? And just then he sees the fight back over at the bridge and decides to head back. However, as soon as he swings into it, he notices the Punisher getting into position with a sniper rifle. He looks back down and he sees Steve standing over Nick Fury and the gun is pointed right at him. Frank Castle takes aim and Spider-Man tries to web him but he misses. As Spider-Man swings low the gun goes off and then he tackles Steve and the bullet goes straight through Spider-Man's side. After passing out, Spider-Man wakes up to see the bridge destroyed and blood pouring out of himself. He thinks that he should probably go to the hospital but if he does, people are going to find out who Spider-Man is. So he webs up the wounds stating that it should at least last him until he can get to. But before he can finish that he sees Norman and the others shooting by. Meanwhile back at the Parker home Johnny Storm and Bobby Drake return and Bobby shouts that it's hard not telling the girl that he's trying to hook up with that he doesn't have powers. She was complaining that his hands were cold. Johnny calls out asking if anyone's home and then he finds a note on the phone stating get out of the house immediately and call as soon as you get to a safe place. Why is your phone on? Bobby asks, why isn't my phone on? And Johnny tells him that he kind of melts it every time that he flames up, so... As the two open the door to leave, Norman and the rest are standing right there. Craven says Spider-Man sent us here and these boys are not who they are looking for. Norman tells Johnny Storm to bring Peter out Side. No! Johnny says that he has a better idea. How about he just gets the hell out of here before he has to paint him a new set of eyebrows? As he flames up, he charges towards Norman, and Norman responds by changing into the goblet. As the two clash, an explosion goes off, and Norman screams out in pain. Sandman reaches out to Johnny, and Johnny asks, What are you gonna do? Make my underpants itchy? The sand washes over Johnny, putting him out. And Bobby skates in, blasting a Sandman with his ice. Electro shoots the ice slide, knocking Bobby away, and Johnny gets back up to rejoin the fight. But through Bobby's pillar of ice, Sandman crushes down on Johnny once more. Bobby rides back in, throwing ice shards, and Electro tells him, Really? Ice and water? Really? Electro electrifies the ice, causing it to explode, throwing Bobby into the nearby house. Electro then says that he should probably get a move on. Surely the neighbors have already called the cops. And Craven sniffs the air, telling them all to wait. Everyone looks down the road to see Peter standing in the street. Vulture pops his wings and he jets towards him. And he shouts, asking, You know what you did to my life? And Peter webs up his face, swinging him into a house. Still struggling through the pain of the bullet passing through him, he huffs, telling them, <laughs> Who's next? He looks around and he sees Norman, Johnny, and Bobby all knocked out. And he thinks that he just gotta stall them until the Ultimates can get here. He calls out to them telling him, Here's what's gonna happen. And a second shield and some other superheroes are gonna show up. And I'm talking all of them. So if you surrender, I can... Craven says, It's a bluff. Look at the boy. He's a mess. And Sandman yells, He's right. Him, Electro, and Craven all charge forward. Peter kicks over a fire hydrant and he aims the water at the three of them. As the water goes towards Electro, he bursts into a mini explosion knocking him and the others to the ground. But before Electro can change back, Peter quickly webs him up and flings him over, punching him out. He then falls to his knees, stating, that's all I had left in me. And then he looks up, stating, ha. Ah. Hi? The neighbors gather around Spider-Man, some with their phones taking pictures. And Spider-Man asks if someone could, you know, call 911? I'm not doing so good here. His spider sense begins to go off and a boy from the crowd shouts, Behind you! Sandman pulls himself together and begins to crush down on Spider-Man, trapping him inside of the sand. As Sandman tries to hold on, a web shoots out and Spider-Man pulls himself out as his spider sense is going off again. He says that he already knows he's under attack and the vulture swoops in, knocking Spider-Man to the ground. He hits the ground, bouncing, and he starts to get back up when he sees the vulture throw down two grenades. He shouts for everyone to run, and he tries to whip up the grenades to contain the explosion. As the blast goes off, it throws him into a car, and he bounces off into the lawn. Over on the freeway, Aunt May gets a call from their neighbor, Doris, asking where is she. She tells her that she's out driving, and Doris tells her that she doesn't know how to say this, but she thinks that Peter is Spider-Man. Aunt May asks what's going on, and Doris says that these men are here, and she doesn't know how to say this, but it looks like they're killing him. Without a moment of hesitation, Aunt May slams on the brakes, and she spins the car around, heading back towards the house. Back in the house, the three villains continue to beat down on Peter Parker, now with the entire world aware that he is Spider-Man, until Sandman gets ready to kill him. But 
before he can, a bolt of electricity shoots through him, causing him to fall apart. Electro shouts that there is only so much crap that I can take from a 13-year-old kid. So this one I'm gonna finish. He begins to charge up when suddenly a gun is fired, and the gun continues to go off, shooting several more times into Electro's back until he finally explodes. Peter looks around asking what happened, and then he sees Aunt May holding a smoking gun. She starts to look around asking, what? What did I just do? And Peter takes the gun away, telling her it's okay. I got it now. He slowly begins to fall back to his knees, and Aunt May screams for someone to call an ambulance! Gwen goes to check on Johnny and Bobby, stating that they are breathing, so she thinks that they're going to be okay. She thinks! And Peter begins to tell Aunt May that he's sorry. He knows this isn't the life that she wanted. She smiles, telling him that he's a crazy boy. And Peter smiles back, saying, Yeah, at least I'm kinda cute. Then a shadow looms over them, and Norman lights up. Just as Norman slams his fist down, Peter grabs Aunt May and Gwen, telling them that you need to go right now. As they land, Peter grabs Gwen, telling her that he doesn't care how she does it. Just take Aunt May and get her out of here. Go as far as they can. Aunt May looks at her coat and she sees blood, and she tells Peter to wait. As Norman jumps over the house, as Peter pushes Gwen, asking, Didn't you hear what I just said? Get out of here! Before Norman can land, he jumps into the air, punching Norman back into the ground. He catches himself on a lamppost, stating, Ah, can you just do me a favor now and stay right there? I'll be right back. He leaps away and Norman screams for him to come back. And Peter tells him, yeah, 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 hold that thought. He lands next to Johnny and he shakes him awake, telling him, I'm in a really bad situation and I can really use your help, man. Johnny pushes Peter out of the way, telling him, I got this. Flame on! He rockets back into the air, grabbing Norman and he shouts, come on, burn! And as Johnny begins to gather all of his strength, he creates an explosion into Norman. However, when everyone looks, they see Norman absorbing the blast, draining Johnny's fire. His body begins to bounce on the ground and he says, I'm sorry. I'm two, two. And Norman begins to float over Peter, turning white and purple from Johnny's heat. And he starts to throw down fireballs. The moment that Norman stops, Peter grabs a mailbox and he begins to beat Norman with it. He jumps onto Norman asking him, what's next? Are you going to kill me? Then what? It won't bring back the son that you killed. Using what strength he has left, he lifts and throws Norman into a fire hydrant, extinguishing him. He then falls to his knees. And when he looks back up, he sees Norman get back up and walk towards him. Norman tells him, no, it won't bring Harry back, but at least Spider-Man will be dead. Peter hangs his head, telling him, well, there's that. Norman's eyes begin to glow, and then a bright light begins to shine on them, and a speeding truck races through. Peter sees the person behind the wheel as Mary Jane, and she runs the truck straight into Norman, crashing it into him. Suddenly, the windshield is punched out, and before Mary Jane can panic, Peter jumps in, pulling her out of the mess. He shouts, that was insane! Was that truck stolen? And Mary Jane tells him, you're welcome for that. The two kiss, and then Peter yells, now that that's over, get the hell out of here! And he throws her into the distance. Before landing, though, he webs up a net to catch her, and that's when Norman crawls out from underneath the truck, stating that today is your day of rocketing! I'm doing delivering God's message, and God wants this to happen. Peter picks up the truck, and he slams it on Norman, screaming, SHUT UP! He tries to pick it back up again, and Norman tells him, I am going to destroy you and your family, just as you did mine. Peter brings the truck down again, crushing Norman! And he steps back and explodes in a fiery blast, throwing Peter to the ground. Johnny quickly runs over to Peter's body, and he looks back to see Norman's hand, his human hand, burning in the fire. Johnny says that it looks like he got him. Peter tells him, good, that's about all I had in me. Mary Jane runs over shouting that they need an ambulance, someone call 911! And Aunt May starts pushing through the crowd with Gwen stating that Peter told them not to be here! But as she gets through, she sees Peter laying lifelessly on the ground and Mary Jane screaming. Tears are falling from her eyes and Mary Jane says that he got really hurt. Aunt May runs over to Peter asking, what did you do? And he coughs and weakly says, it's okay, I did it. Aunt May shouts, telling him to hang on. The ambulance is... And he stops her, and he grabs her coat, asking, Didn't you see? It's okay. I did it. He begins to cry, telling her that he couldn't save him. He couldn't save Uncle Ben, no matter what he did. But for her, he saved her. He did it. He saved her life. Before he could finish, his hand gives out, and he closes his eyes. Aunt May's eyes go wide, and Johnny leans down to hear his heart. But before he comes back up, he doesn't say anything. Aunt May shouts, no, oh God, no, not him too. Please, not him too. And Mary Jane picks up Peter's body crying. Gwen pulls Aunt May away as she screams for him to come back. And while everyone mourns the loss of their hero, Norman listens to everyone's cries and he smiles. His evil, twisted smile because he took Spider-Man's life 
As Peter's vision fades, he begins to feel a warm light wash over him. He opens his eyes, and he sees himself walking with Uncle Ben. Uncle Ben pulls him close, telling him, You did good. You did real good. And there you have it, the entire Ultimate Spider-Man run. We did the entirety of Peter Parker's run. Now, we've considered going back and maybe doing some Miles Morales or doing some current Miles Morales. I don't know, but what did you guys think of the entirety of the Ultimate Spider-Man run? For the most part, we had all of it in there. There was a couple little storylines that we took out, but... I enjoyed doing it. I thought it was one of the best series we've had here on Comic Storian, and I hope you guys enjoyed the uh, the entire story of this. I personally hope that the death had a bit more impact, having seen the whole thing back to back to back. Let me know in the comments down below what you guys think, and I don't have anything crazy to do at the end of this full story. I know I normally do something crazy, but I just went out and caught a whole bunch of Eevees. It was Eevee Shiny Day over at Community Day on Pokemon, but it was like 100 degrees over here, so I was walking around 100 degree weather for like five hours for two days straight directly in the sun. I I'm really, really hoping I didn't sunburn my tattoos because that'd be really bad. You don't want tattoos and getting them really, really tanned and bronzed. You just don't do that. It could really mess up the ink. Anyway, guys, I'm rambling. I think I'm rambling. My throat hurts. I'm tired. I'm going to go bathe in the sun. No, that's that's bad. Benny, bad. Sun is bad. You're, you're, you're a basement dweller.